Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should live as social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society, bless this Legislative Council now assembled to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the wellbeing and good order of society in Western Australia, that all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role for which they have been chosen, and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory, the honour of Her Majesty and the continued benefit of the people of this state. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. This house acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajuk people, Wajuk Noongar people, and pays its respects to their elders both past and present. Good morning, members, and good morning to Alan Jarra Primary School, who join us in the public gallery today. You are welcome to the Legislative Council. Uh, petitions. Are there any petitions? Are there any statements by ministers and parliamentary secretaries? The Minister for Agriculture and Food. Thank you, President. This week's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report is yet another graphic reminder that we need to move quickly on climate change mitigation. Our agricultural industries are particularly exposed on climate change, both in managing uh, the resulting hotter and drier conditions and the need to reduce and account for our agricultural carbon footprint. Our government is determined to arm our farmers with the tools they need to adapt their production systems to remain productive and resilient and to unleash agriculture's potential to sequester carbon. The 4 per 1,000 initiative launched at the COP21 Paris Climate Summit in 2015 aims to boost carbon storage in agricultural soils by 0.4 per cent each year, which has the potential to offset 20 to 35 per cent of global anthropo uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We want WA agriculture to be part of that opportunity. In June, we hosted a major farmers forum to guide investment uh, from our $15 million agricultural climate resilience fund, a key McGowan election commitment. Yesterday at the uh, Minganyu Expo, we unveiled the first outcome of that forum, a series of soil systems masterclasses to help farming business capture carbon, carbon opportunities and to become more resilient, profitable and sustainable. The soil masterclasses will feature farmers and agronomists with expertise in soil biology and carbon farming, combining science and practical farming systems that underpin sustainable systems that build and maintain soil carbon. The program will give farmers hands-on experience and understanding of a range of soil health topics from landscape rehydration and the benefits of fodder, shrubs, legumes and perennial grass, grasses to soil bi microbiome and the importance of livestock in biological systems. The first masterclass will be held in Northampton on the 26th of August in partnership with the Northern Agricultural Catchments Council and tailored to the Northern Agricultural Region. Masterclasses will take place in other locations throughout the South West Land Division in coming months. These sessions will also help our farmers take advantage of opportunities under our Land Restoration and Carbon Farming Futures Program. Are there any further statements by ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Papers for tabling? Are there any notices of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? 
Are there any motions without notice? We move to private members' business. Uh, programs at risk for at risk youth. I give the call to the Honourable Daniel Caddy. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, I move that the Legislative Council commends the McGowan Government on its commitment to programs for at risk youth, including the ongoing funding and support for PCYC programs, and acknowledges the fantastic work done by PCYC staff and volunteers around the state. Members, the Honourable Dan Caddy, Caddy has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Dan Caddy. Thank you, President. Modern society, the world we all live in today, is more than ever built on the work of those in the community sector, both paid and volunteers. Indeed, whole industries today um, exist that, that would not, that, that could not exist without the countless hours put in by these workers and, uh, and volunteers. And this can be said for many, many sectors, but it's especially, especially true for the myriad organisations that are set up to provide services to those in our society identified as at-risk youth. There are indeed few areas of our society to which funding from government can have a more valuable and a more valued impact on our youth. And the subset of that group most desperately needing funding is those identified as at-risk youth. There are also few areas of our society to which funding can have such a level of immediate and at the same time long-term impact, both on the individuals and on society as a whole. So I bring this motion to the House today to recognise the funding that is provided by this government to service providers in this area and to explain just what this achieves. As outlined in the motion, I will speak to um, the, the PCYC about the history, the past of the organisation, where it's come to and, and, and the, uh, the benefits it provides to uh, West, Western Australian society. And, uh, and time permitting, I'll also, uh, I'll also talk a little to another fantastic organisation based, based in the North Metropolitan Region in Leaderville called Pickies, the Perth Inner City Youth um, Service, and the fantastic work being done there by Andrew Hall and his team. Members, those of you who, like me, are keen observers of what happens in the other place, <coughs> We'll notice that the Minister for Police acknowledged not long ago the 80th anniversary of the PCYC organisation, now known as Police and Community Youth Centres. The first PCYC in Western Australia was established in 1941. And for 80, 80 years now, PCYC has been offering programs for youth in this state. It was in, originally born out of a um, a partnership between Rotary and the West Australian Police Force, and it was, uh, it was titled the Perth Boys Club. <clears throat> and even as it was known then as the Perth Boys Club, and even 80 years ago, the goals and what it aimed to achieve were very similar to, to, uh, to what the modern PCYC sees as its goals. The original club, set up uh, during the Second World War, it was, a time, it was a time when many boys um, or many fathers were off at war. Um, many, uh, many women were, were working, some for the, for the first time um, during the war effort, and, and also running their families, of course. And uh, the purpose of the club was to give these, these boys some structure into their lives, some guidance, um, potentially male, male role models where those role models may not have been at home. Despite the name, I am reliably informed that the Perth Boys Club was the name, that girls were also, also welcomed. Yeah. Much, well, much of it was centred around sport. Um, the Honourable Alana McTiernan, the, the girls, there was a gymnastics program for the girls. Much of what the boys did was centred around, around boxing. Their focus was around boxing. It's a little bit like a Liberal Party love in at Rotnest. Centred around boxing and a bit of a bit of a punch up. 
later, later this developed into more complex programs, programs specifically to, designed to ensure young people not only remained active but remained supported, got the support they needed. And uh, programs were designed to keep, keep these young people on a, on a positive trajectory um, in, into adulthood. At some stage along the journey, the Perth Boys Club changed its name to the Police and Citizens Youth Club, as was the nomenclature when I was a young man. And now we have the Police and Community Youth Centres. So I'd like to start a little with the, the facts and figures and outline, if you will, where, where the PCYC operates within WA and what is provided and, most importantly, what is achieved. These centres operate right across the state, right across Western Australia, and they provide now a variety of recreational activities, support services, training and, and even educational opportunities to uh, local youths. And I'll talk a little bit more about the educational opportunities later. That's something that's really taken off in the last 25 years. And while the setup is similar across the PCYCs, what's really important is the local input into, into PCYC. So the, the programs offered are often tailored uh, very much to, to the youth in, in the area, tailored to, to their needs, tailored sometimes to their wants. Um, and, and that's a critical component of why PCYCs are so important. And also, I would suggest why they are so successful. They are at a grassroots level. They are on the ground in the local suburbs. And the, people's, the people organising them and, uh, and the police officers involved in, in, in some of it, um, they volunteer their time as well. And, uh, and, and it's because of this local involvement that they are so successful. And regional members will be pleased to know of the 16, um, of the 16 permanent PCYCs, um, indeed 10 of them can be found in regional areas. Um, and uh, from as far south as Albany right up to, to Kununurra. And members may think that 16, 16 centres across the state, um, given, given the, size of, uh, the size of Western Australia, indeed one of the largest jurisdictions in the world, uh, is, not, is not a lot, and, and that is true. Um, and how fantastic it would be if we could have a PCYC in every regional centre, but that's simply not possible. And this is where the blue light youth activity units are critically important. Um, this is where PCYCs in, in regional areas work in cooperation with the West Australian Police Force and, uh, and they create these blue light, uh, blue light youth activity units. Um, older members of the chamber may remember the old blue light disco days. I know the Honourable Martin Pritchard was a big fan. Um, <laughs> as was the Honourable Brad, Pret Brad Pettit, he was just telling me. Um, the, yeah, very groovy. The, uh, the 35... <laughs> There, there are order, th <laughs> order, order, order. Oh, you, you should see his moves, uh, Minister. O order. There are currently uh, 35 of these blue light youth activity units all around the state, um, from as far away as Balgo, um, Esperance, um, South Headland, Wyndham, all over the state. So, members, that is a brief tour, sort of uh, geographically and structurally, if if you would like, of of uh, the police and community youth centres. And, uh, and also the Blue Light Youth Activity Centres. Um, as I've mentioned, there are many, many programs they run. There are two individual programs I would really uh, uh, like to reference today. Um, one is, is a program called Safe Space. Um, Safe Space is run in about uh, half of the, uh, of the PCYC centres. And Safe Space is fantastic. It, it allows um, youth, and, and, and children um, somewhere to go, as the name suggests, a safe space before and after, um, before and after school. Um, it's, it's critically important, especially in, in, some, in some regional areas um, for, for our youth and, and youth that are identified in those areas as, um, as at risk. And it's not just a, it's not just a safe space. They offer um, diversionary programs um, uh, and, and provide that, that, that structure and that support that, that, um, that these uh, young people need. Um, and some of them go a bit further. I know the PCYC in Albany offers a police rangers program as well. And I think, uh, from my understanding, that is also done during the, the safe space time. Um, the other critically important um, thing they offer is, is formal formal education and training. I, I touched on this briefly before. 
Um, for about 25 years now, in the mid-90s it, it started, um, they, they offered a number, uh, or the PCYC started to offer a number of certificates that, um, that these, uh, these, these young people in the community um, could, could work towards and, and could attain um, through the PCYC program. And uh, forgive me for reading for a minute, but I just want to make sure I get them right. Certificate one and two in automotive vo uh, vocational preparation, certificate one in, in leadership, certificate one in general education for adults, and certificate two in engineering pathways. Um, I don't have the numbers to hand um, as to how many people have, have graduated these uh, programs, but uh, given now they are in their 27th year, I can, uh, 26 or 27th year, I can only, um, only assume this is a very successful program from everything I've heard, it certainly is. Um, <clears throat> Participation, um, it's a difficult one. We measure it, we measure it with statistics. And if, if you have a look in the, in the latest annual report, um, the 2019-2020 annual report, two, two, things, um, two things jump out at me. The, the, the budget for this year for PCYCs around the state was about $13 million, of which, uh, of which more than half of that came from the state government. Throughout the year, the attendance the attendance to uh, PCYCs around the state <coughs> was nearly a, a quarter of a million, um, a quarter, quarter of a million attendances, and and uh, and you don't need to to uh, you don't need to crunch the numbers too much on that to realise for for that for that budget that that number of attendances, the, the number of young people that are being um, positively influenced and uh, and uh, given. Given a, whether it's whether it's a safe space program, given a safe space, given an educational opportunity, or simply given structure and and mentoring in their life, it, it is a fantastic return uh, for the for the money that is spent. And the uh, and this is where I really go to the heart of my motion, which is recognising the uh, recognising the commitment from this government. Um, um, to the to the PCYC moving forward, and I just I read a little bit from the the press release from the PCYC, um, where they stated, without without this support, it is unlikely that PCYC could have continued to provide the necessary diversionary programs, alternative education, training opportunities, and activities to support the most at risk and disadvantaged young people across WA. This new commitment represents an increase an increase in funding from previous years and will enable PCYC to deliver vital programs and activities across the state. It also demonstrates the government's confidence in the work undertaken by one of WA's iconic not-for-profit organisations. So the funding is critical for the ongoing viability of the PCYC and on top of that $18 million I do know that Another 175,000 was put aside specifically for items in, in the southwest, in, in, namely in Bunbury and Collie. Um, another important um, stream of income for PCYC, and I, I mention this um, because it's something that's close to my heart, is the, is the fundraising they do across the community. And I have been, and this, uh, this won't surprise members given I'm speaking on this today, I have been a, a supporter of uh, PCYC for many years. Um, and then more recently, in, uh, in March of 2018, I became a Big Change uh, raffle member. And this membership's fantastic. It allows me, uh, being the forgetful person I am, to donate automatically through, through my credit card to this most worthy of, of institutions. And the, the, sorry, and the, uh, the funding that the, uh, the PCYC gets from, from community um, and I think if I go back to the annual report, 2019-2020, about 15 per cent, maybe just under, of their funding comes from the community, is also testament to the fact that the community understands that this is a, 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 critical, a critical area. Um, and I know uh, time is getting tight, so the other, I just wanted to shout out as well to, um, to local governments who support um, the PCYCs. Um, members in this place would have heard me speak before criticising local government, but on this issue I have nothing but praise for the local governments because every single local government in the state that has a building that PCYC operates out of gives them that building on a peppercorn lease. This is, this is critically important and I congratulate the local governments on this. Some, 
some donate directly, but every single dollar that these centres get, or that these centres save from not paying commercial rates, are dollars that go directly to our youths, directly to improving uh, the lives of the young people in the local areas. And I guess I, I just want to finish really quickly um, with something, a quote from my local PCYC. In summary, PCYC exists so that children and young people have a safe place to go. The activities, diversionary programs and alternative education and training opportunities keep children and all people active and engaged so they can reach their potential and stay on a positive life path. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. You're not standing, honourable member. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's customary to, to wait until the finish, president's finished speaking. Um, the honourable A or Makua Chuat. Thank you, president. Um, thank you, honourable Dan Kerry, for bringing up such an important um, topic in our community. Um, this motion is really great, and and as we are aware that in our community, our 20% population um, is our children. They are young people, and they're from ages 12 to 25 years of age. Our youth are our future, like I said. And it is for us as community and the government to make sure that we, we look at the issues that are happening within the community and we support our, our, um, our youth that are going through, through such issues. Um, we, we know of many um, young people cry, um, issues within the community, and there are four that I have highlighted that are really important in our community, and one of them is youth crime, mental health, employment, and homelessness. These issues, they have gotten worse um, during the COVID time um, because a lot of the young people, as we are aware, especially in the employment sector, they don't have um, permanent jobs. And through um, the COVID time, a lot of them, they have faced a lot of issues. And I'm already aware that um, th this portfolio doesn't only fall under one ministerial um, portfolio. So um, it is for us as government to make sure that we support our ministers involved um, in this vision of making better for our young fisher in the community. I would also like to acknowledge the McGowan government um, and Honourable um, Dave Kelly on the great initiative on such an important um, youth portfolio that we need to look at as government. I, have, um, I was really lucky to have a chance to go to the briefing of Honourable uh, Minister Kelly um, on the 9th of, of this month, and it was really amazing that I was lucky to look at any great um, initiative that was put up by the minister, which focuses on the Beyond Youth 2020 um, Youth Action Plan. That action plan has really um, touched my heart, and I'm glad that it was launched um, on January this year. The idea of the action plan is for the McGowan government um, to assist our young people from age 10 to 25. And they, they have made a lot of consultation within that um, action plan. And consultation was basically for the government to concentrate on the diversity of the young people, our 20% young people in the community, and to make sure that um, we ensured um, we support them through the challenges that they face um, during the COVID time. And um, it was brought up that we, we have to make sure that there are seven things that we were going to be making as our important um, focus in our community. And, th and these important things that were highlighted, um, they prioritize seven areas. And, and these seven areas, I will read them out. Um, is, number one is to make sure that um, the voices of our young people in the community have, are heard. Um, the second one is to make sure that we assist our young people to the full potential in the community. Um, the second one is to make sure that our young people secure jobs in the community, as we know that our young people are currently struggling. The climate change was one of them as well. The other one was mental health and the well-being. And the other one, the most important one that is really going on at the moment is this, to, for them to secure housing and to prevent the homelessness within our community. 
and also to help them to have access to services that they cannot access as young people. So um, there was another important thing that I was really happy on that action plan um, briefing with, with the Minister Kelly was that um, there was a mention of 360,000 um, and that 360,000 was for the, um, the government to support the Youth Affair Council um, to, um, to have a program that can help our, our youth. So um, I'm really um, proud of the, the government that really acknowledges that there, there, there are issues within our community, and if there are issues within the community, there's a plan for us to make it better for, for our youth. Thank you, President. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Donna Farragher. To make a few comments uh, in response to the motion moved by the Honourable Dan Caddy. Look, I'll just say at the outset that um, I think that perhaps uh, part of the motion's uh, wording is perhaps not necessarily required, but albeit unsurprising when it comes from um, a member of the Labor Party. Um, I think that it perhaps would have been better uh, to have moved a motion that um, entirely revolves around commending PCYCs. Um, which I strongly support, as well as other programs and services that are delivered right across uh, this state uh, in support of young people, particularly those uh, at risk, rather than the uh, self-congratulatory uh, message uh, and tone of this motion. But, um, and I say that uh, because, with all due respect, um, there are, and I, and I think the Honourable Dan Caddy would agree with this, uh, that, in fact, Many youth organisations, like PCYCs and many others, and I will reflect on a couple of them um, today if I have the opportunity, have actually received bipartisan support uh, but for many years um, by governments of both persuasions. Uh, and I say that um, perhaps with a little bit of authority, given I am a former Minister for Youth, and it was a portfolio that I was very proud uh, to be a Minister of. So, um, hopefully, in terms of my comments today, uh, and perhaps with the indulgence of the mover of the motion, I perhaps will not only reflect on PCYCs, but indeed um, a range of organisations that uh, do provide um, outstanding support uh, to young people across this state. Now, I absolutely agree with all of the comments made um, by the Honourable Dan Caddy with respect to uh, the importance and value of PCYCs. And I uh, recognise that they have been part of our community, I think, for 80 years, uh, which is an outstanding achievement. And it is over that period of time that they have supported thousands and thousands of young Western Australians. Young Western Australians who uh, perhaps may fall under that category of at risk. Um, but also young Western Australians, irrespective of their circumstance. And as the Honourable Dan Caddy uh, did indicate, PCYCs do provide a range of programs um, and initiatives, and each are different. And it is fantastic that we have PCYCs both in metropolitan uh, Perth, but also in regional parts of Western Australia. And certainly the PCYCs that I have visited over my time in this place uh, in regional uh, WA I think that they very much have a, they become a hub within that community and they draw uh, young people uh, in. Um, and at the core, despite the different and various programs uh, and individual programs that they might, they might have, depending on uh, their location, at their core is a clear focus on supporting uh, young people uh, to, to achieve uh, their very best. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the important role uh, that youth workers, volunteers and <coughs> WA police um, for their ongoing support uh, for uh, PCYCs and the valuable uh, work that they undertake um, every day in support of young people. In addition to PCYCs, and perhaps, as I say, with the indulgence of the House, I might broaden it out um, a little because it's always a good opportunity to uh, acknowledge um, youth organisations in this House. There are, of course, many youth organisations that might perhaps focus more particularly in a local government area, and then there are others like PCYCs that are broader in scope. 
Um, in terms of, I suppose, the, the more specific ones, obviously, uh, within all of our electorates, we will have fantastic youth centres. And just last week, I was at the, uh, the wonderful Swan City Youth Service. Um, with Ray and his team out there. And that service has been providing really valuable services to young people in uh, Midland and the surrounding um, eastern suburbs uh, to young people for a number of years. And they provide a variety of programs in a safe uh, space uh, for young people to come, whether it's, it's their music programs, their um, cooking and driving and fitness programs. They have a um, parents and bubs uh, program young Aboriginal men's group, and I think uh, I heard the Honourable Dan Caddy refer to, I think, some PCYCs that deliver um, some training programs, um, and certainly in terms of the um, Swan City Youth Service, uh, they partner with uh, North Metro TAFE to engage uh, young people who are otherwise disengaged uh, from mainstream schooling uh, to complete um, their Certificate of General Education for adults, which is a fantastic thing. Um, I also want to recognise that there are a number of other youth organisations that have been part of our community for a number of years, whether it is the YMCA and, of course, um, this parliament uh, yearly plays host uh, to the YMCA Youth Parliament, uh, as well they have, of course, many other um, programs as well. But also there's uh, you know, the Girl Guides uh, and Scouts uh, WA, and I, I think if we were to do a straw poll in this house, um, There'd be a few people who'd put their hand up to say that they'd been a girl guide or a scout in their uh, more younger years. Um, uh, indeed, my, uh, I'm very pleased that my daughter has continued in my tradition and is a, is a girl guide. Um, Albeit, I will say her uniform is a bit more user-friendly than the one that I used to have to wear. Uh, but each of those programs do provide wonderful opportunities um, for young people to uh, learn uh, valuable life skills. Um, to make new friends, uh, to increase uh, their self-esteem and confidence, and again, with the support, in those cases, mainly with volunteers. I also want to acknowledge, and it is a particular program that I am very, very fond of and spoken of uh, in many, uh, on many occasions in this House, and that relates to the Cadets WA program. Um, that program has now been in place in this state for many years. Uh, it actually was established by a former youth minister in Mike Board, and I was very um, pleased in when I came in uh, as the Minister for Youth, it came to my attention that the program had actually not received a funding increase for 14 years. Um, and the reality is, is that well, um, programs like the Cadets WA, PCYCs, and I do want to acknowledge the support that has been given by the government to the PCYCs, that's a good thing, um, and a range of other uh, the girl guides or whatever it may be, they do require funding um, and they do require that support. And, and where that can be provided and increased, that is something that I think that everyone in this House would certainly support. But I think the value of the, the Cadets WA program is also the fact that when, often when you think of cadets, um, perhaps it is that more traditional uh, cadets, you know, your Air Force and Navy and Army cadets. But I think the really good thing about the cadets program is that it's able to engage young people across a range of areas. Not everyone wants to join um, the Army cadets, but they might want to join the Bush Rangers, or they might want to uh, um, join the, the Surf Life Saving. And when I was minister, I was also very keen, and I, and I think that this would be a good thing um, for government um, to consider, uh, is to increase, I suppose, the, the breadth of the Cadets WA program. When, when I was minister, and I, uh, perhaps it was fortuitous because I was also the environment minister at the time, I was very keen to see that the cadet program actually um, extended into the primary school years. Um, and that was in the context of delivering a River Rangers cadet program, because I, I felt that it was important that we should be actually engaging young people in really positive um, activities before they even get into high school. Um, so in saying that, I just want to acknowledge um, all of those organisations that are involved um, in the youth space. And I want to particularly acknowledge, particularly acknowledge, and it is reflected in the motion, and I'm pleased to see it's there, uh, with respect to uh, the support uh, for youth workers um, and volunteers and everyone involved uh, in delivering programs and initiatives um, uh, within whether it is the PCYCs um, or other areas. Um, I would say uh, that youth workers uh, in particular are often um, very much unsung heroes. Uh, they are um, 
the, the people that are there uh, who can be a sounding board. Um, they are a safe person for, peop for young people, particularly those in need, particularly those who may well be at risk, um, to be able to talk to um, in a non-judgmental way. And for some, it will probably be the first time that they've had an opportunity um, to uh, speak and to feel relaxed enough to talk to someone about their worries or their concerns um, or what they may be going through in their life at, their t at the time. Um, and they play a crucial role in um, providing opportunities and giving young people confidence, giving them confidence that they actually can uh, have a good life and a positive life, um, and that um, with those supports and structures around them that are provided through the PCYC and other organisations, that they can uh, live a very fruitful life. So I too uh, want to commend um, the youth workers, um, volunteers and everyone involved uh, in this very important area. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Hon. Brian Walker. Thank you, President. Uh, I rise as a member of the crossbench to thank the Hon. Dan Caddy for this motion and to certainly support it, but also to add a few words of, of my own. Uh, members might recall my uh, discussion yesterday, my contribution looking at health and noticing that uh, it is much more effective to deal with problems before they arise, deal with the cause before they cause problems, as being much more effective uh, and much more mm, Costworthy. Now, I have some particular experience in this as I used to be the medical officer for the boxing club of a police club in Hong Kong. I'll take this example to yourselves because um, youth across the world are pretty much the same. It's a troubled time in the d changing from the, uh, the, the, the child into the adult, that adolescent period is always a time of, of, of concern for parents and children alike. Now I speak also as someone who has been in uh, the Australian context an army cadet and a surf lifesaver. In fact, some of my best memories were in fact at the Surf Lifesaving Club of City Beach, where I took my first swim on returning to this wonderful country. But this boxing club, you might be surprised to know that uh, in the Chinese Hong Kong context, there's a fairly strong drive of disaffected youth towards the criminality of the triads, leading them into gang warfare and all kinds of horrible things. Now, it must be said, Hong Kong is a particularly safe place to work and walk. Ladies can walk at night alone, unsupported in the streets, without the fear of being attacked. It's a far safer country than most other places in the world. However, there are some quite serious concerns about criminality. And you might be surprised to know that the youth who were getting involved in crime, when the police picked them up, uh, were given the choice of going before the magistrate or joining one of the clubs that they offered. The, the girls, for example, had a, a club for teaching them quite energetic dance routines. But the young men were invited to join the boxing club. Now, I ask you, a young criminal being taught how to fight in the ring does that make any sense? And here we see what can happen in the Australian context when police officers who care about the community might look at things which might help. Thinking outside the box, highly recommended, commend the PCYC for all the good that they do and all the creation that they can bring to this topic. But in that particular context, the boxing club is taught by police officers. So there are the young potential thugs being taught how to stand up with boxing gloves and fight according to the Queen's very rules. You might think, well, we're now teaching them how to beat people up on the streets. Ah, but what they then did, and you might find this interesting, they then got together all of the police officers in the police officers club and set up a proper boxing ring with internationally accredited umpires, referees. And these youngsters got up to fight proper three round fights in front of an applauding public of police officers. The amount of respect they gained, it takes courage to stand up there and fight, especially if you're losing, and stand there with courage and accept the result of the fight, whether winning or losing, and to then be applauded by the people who arrested you. Gave them so much face, so much confidence in themselves, the results of that, you may be interested to know, of all the young men who had come through that system, 
not one single one had re reverted into crime. And in fact, they had wonderful results. Young people going in to say, I remember one particular young man, uh, a fire officer in the fire brigade, putting his life at risk for the community he was threatening before. This is an example of how we can treat our youth, encouraging them at a time when they are very easily discouraged. And so it is not just the responsibility of the McGowan government, thank you for that, but for every government, that to, we need to care for the youth. They are our future. And to bring them into a state whereby they can respect themselves and respect others. I particularly like the concept of introducing them to environmental issues and climate change issues. How might we then be able to encourage them to reverse the damages that have been caused by previous generations? How might we encourage them to pick up rubbish when they're passing by, cleaning the beaches, engaging in uh, helping with the regeneration of land? Because this is their country, a country they can respect and admire, and the people in this country of whichever shade or belief. So I think this is a vitally, fundamentally important aspect of government, protecting our youth, giving them every opportunity to, to thrive and to flourish at the time which is difficult in their lives. And so, thanking the Honourable Dan Caddy for bringing this motion, I commend it. President, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the motion moved by the Honourable Dan Caddy in support of our at-risk youth programs and PCY programs, and furthermore, the support done by PCYC staff and our volunteers. I just want to note initially that today is International Youth Day, a day where we celebrate the importance of young people all across our community. The McGowan government is committed to providing opportunities for WA youth to participate and to be heard, including the Ministerial Youth Advisory Council, which was established by our government in 2017. As mentioned in my inaugural address, prior to entering state parliament, I worked for the Department of Child Protection in, uh, for a few years. And in that role, I worked daily with at-risk youth. I have a long history of involvement with the Tom Price Youth Support Association as a volunteer for over 12 years, who deliver services to the at-risk youth in our inland towns of Tom Price and Parabadu. The TPYSA is a community not-for-profit organisation that delivers services from two locations, being Tom Price and Parabadu Youth Centres. The TPYSA operates on the coalface of, co of community services locally, is client-focused and holistic in its service delivery, and actively seeks to increase opportunities for young people in the broader community. They operate a range of programs, including case management, drug and alcohol counselling, juvenile justice, the very popular youth drop-in service, um, as well as uh, promoting healthy lifestyles, harm minimisation skills. I want to acknowledge and thank the many volunteers who assist Marion Hearn and her team at the Tom Price Youth Support Association from running the many events to cooking snags on the barbecue on a Friday night. This year, the McGowan government provided $366,453 to the Tom Price Youth Support Association for those case management and recreation activities. It is through my personal experiences that I've seen firsthand the challenges faced by our young people in our community, and I've also seen the positive impact that investments made by this government have made on our young people. I know that the McGowan government is committed to supporting at-risk youth across WA. This government knows that early intervention with at-risk people helps turn lives around and reduces the rate of offending in our community. Um, I just want to, as um, the Honourable McCall, uh, your McCall Chiot mentioned in her speech, there is a range of areas which our youth are at risk, and let's, including the challenges following COVID-19. I just want to quickly talk about the COVID-19 uh, youth recovery grants. Young people in WA have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Social isolation, fewer opportunities to engage in community and uh, and job losses associated with the public health response was tough on everyone, including our young people. The Beyond 2020 Youth Action Plan, which was drawn up following years of consultation, outlines how our state government 
is supporting Western Australians and the communities that they live in as the state recovers. Um, as has been identified, young people make up 20 per cent of our population, with 21 per cent of those living in regional WA. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders make up for 6 per cent, while an estimated 11 per cent identifies LGBTIQA, and 2 per cent of our young people have a disability. Um, uh, following the release of the action plan, the Minister for Youth um, announced a 20 2021 Youth Recovery Grants Program. The aim of these grants were to support young people following the pandemic, in particular projects that support, inform and build the capacity of young people in gaining and retaining employment opportunities and also mental health. 31 grants were awarded for projects supporting young people during the recovery phase. The grants totaled more than $202,000. Some of the grants that were um, awarded in the mining and pastoral region where I represent. Uh, there was a grant of $7,930 to the Royal Life Saving Society of WA Incorporated to engage local Aboriginal youth to obtain their bronze medallion, which will assist them in gaining employment as lifeguards at the local pools across the Kimberley. There was $5,000 provided to the Constable Care Foundation to work with upper primary and high school students in intensive filmmaking programs in the Derby area. Um, there was $10,000 provided to the West Kimberley Youth Development Program to assist in the development of human and social capital of Aboriginal young people in the Derby area who are currently struggling to enter the workforce. And finally, a $5,000 for the Teach, Learn, Grow Rural Tutoring Program to provide free one-on-one -on -one tutoring to rural and remote schools in the southwest, midwest, Great Southern and Wheatbelt areas. Um, noting the time, um, I will wrap up because I believe there's a few more speakers. Um, I just want to um, commend the Honourable Dan Caddy for moving this motion today and commend the McGowan government on its commitment to programs such as those I've outlined for at-risk youth in our community. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Kyle McGinn. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Dan Caddy for bringing the motion to the House today. Very timely and very good motion for us to be discussing in this chamber. Um, I want to touch on a quick point from the Honourable Brian Walker and uh, in regards to boxing. And uh, PCYC's uh, done a fabulous job on bringing discipline and respect into that space. Um, I think everyone uh, that's lived in a regional area <clears throat> would understand going to boxing training at a PCYC and seeing the older uh, people training and the respect that the younger people have by being able to discipline themselves into that sport. Um, I, I would say, though, that I think the, the world is changing and basketball seems to be the new boxing. Um, <laughs> especially not for me, though, I'll, I'll be honest. I can't hit a three-pointer to save my life. Uh, um, because of your height? Uh, yeah, def definitely the height issue, Sam. Um, <laughs> Honourable Sam Rowe. Uh, look, uh, what I, I do want to touch on <laughs> is uh, I'm a huge supporter of the PCYCs. I think they are um, absolute amazing organisations that have been well supported by this government. Um, and some of the things that I've seen since 2017 coming into this place I, I think need to be touched on. First one is the Carnarvon PCYC. Um, when I first went out to visit the Carnarvon PCYC, we were looking at delivering an election commitment on upgrading the PCYC. And when I got there, it was like a, the building had been there for over 50 years. Um, and you walk inside and all the fans had been bent up. Um, there was one of the old school skating rinks. But one of the real big disadvantages for Carnarvon was that the PCYC was out of town. It was right at the entry to Carnarvon, which would have been a good half an hour to 40 minute walk for the kids from in, in, in Carnarvon to head out there. Um, and that was causing havoc. The police in, in, uh, in their time at night time after 6pm would be driving around town, picking up the kids and taking them out to the organisation. Um, but when you got there, there would be over 100 kids at the PCYC, um, absolutely running amok, but having a ball in a very safe space. And that's the key here. The PCYCs create a safe space for at-risk youth and the, the people that work at them, the volunteers and particularly the youth police officers put in such an amazing job 
um, go above and beyond. The Carnarvon youth police officers and volunteers at the PCYC should be commended for what they've achieved. Without the PCYC, we would have seen displaced youth far further across the Carnarvon area. But what we've uh, managed to achieve as the McGowan government is over a million dollars has been spent on a new facility for a new PCYC at the old school facility in, in Carnarvon, which is right in the centre of Carnarvon. And this facility has a proper basketball court. Um, the basketball court at the old PCYC, the roof was too low. So when you throw the basketball uh, too high, it would hit the roof and ruin the game. Um, but the new PCYC has a fabulous basketball court. There's a football field just outside it. There's a kitchen. There's a new gym that's being put in there. There's some amazing resources that will be available for the kids of Carnarvon. I know this has been heavily supported by the local council, heavily supported by the police, heavily supported by PCYC and specially heavily supported by the McGowan government. I cannot wait in September to see this uh, officially opened and the kids of Carnarvon will have a more convenient space to go to um, and I know that this will go a long way into creating something that they'll be able to sink their teeth into night after night and uh, keep them uh, entertained. I, I do want to give a shout out to the Kalgoorlie PCYC as well. Um, they have done an amazing job uh, since 2017 when I came in and started working with the organisation. Uh, again, the youth police officers that were involved were going above and beyond. They were constantly out on the street with the kids. They knew the kids by first name. Uh, one of these great ideas from one of the young coppers was to get hold of a DJ set. Um, similar to your blue, blue light disco situation, however, they do it out in the parks and they would do it at the skate park. So what happened was kids would end up being DJs and they'd be blasting music out, which would attract more kids. Um, and that was probably one of the best investments I've made from an electorate uh, perspective, was to donate that across to the PCYC. Um, and then when that youth copper moved out to Warburton, I got a letter saying, oh, how about uh, Warburton gets one as well? <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, it wasn't cheap, but it, it was amazing for the kids. And uh, I have to say, any member of parliament should not feel uh, uh, shy at all in supporting their PCYC. Getting in there, going and seeing the kids. They feed kids that are, that are hungry. They provide um, very, very healthy meals. And uh, I can't say enough about this organisation. Thank you so much, the Honourable Dan Caddy, for bringing the motion. Thank you. Members, the the question is the motion be agreed. The Minister for Regional Development. And, uh, thank you, uh, President, and, uh, and thanks uh, to the Honourable Dan Caddy for uh, raising this issue, and thanks for all of the, to all of the members uh, across the chamber that have uh, have spoken on this. And uh, and I think it is very clear that uh, uh, that um, all members in this house feel deeply um, uh, concerned to ensure that we do. Uh, engage at at-risk at youth, that we have uh, these uh, a, a whole raft of, of creative, innovative programs to try to deal um, with this, the ever-changing uh, problems um, that we are seeing um, for, uh, for young people and uh, working hard to prepare them in a whole variety of ways uh, to ensure uh, that they are able to become um, uh, independent, contributing uh, and happy members of, uh, of society. And we've all seen um, many, many examples where uh, we, uh, uh, where young people are coming uh, into adulthood um, in a state where they, you know, frankly, are struggling uh, to take their place in society. Uh, and I, I take the point of the Honourable Donna Farragher, um, um, who was concerned that we perhaps weren't recognising that this was a, an issue recognised across government. I, I am very sure that that wasn't the intention of the Honourable Dan Caddy. Uh, but of course, we do um, uh, want to promote um, the work uh, and the focus that we, as a government, have been. Um, have been giving to, given to this, and I think one of the important lessons that uh, that we do need to learn is that we've constantly got to be out there in our communities, understanding really what is going on, and being prepared to back those people um, that have uh, innovation. I know the Honourable um, Brian Walker talked of um, 
uh, creative responses. And this goes right back to, I think, offering very good quality, uh, I think not just antenatal care, but postnatal care. I think uh, we have many uh, young, um, um, young mothers uh, coming into um, parenthood who themselves have not uh, learnt from uh, their parents uh, good parenting skills, uh, have not really um, uh, learnt even the basics of child development, and I think we must start right at that uh, at that very early phase of a of a child's life to support uh, the family around the child to um, address what has often been um, uh, intergenerational breakdown of. Uh, of the understanding of what it is to be a parent and to guide a, a child uh, into, um, into adulthood. And I, I really thank all the members um, that have contributed to this debate. Um, I've mentioned the Honourable Donna Farragher, Dan Caddy, the Honourable Brian Walker, and uh, the Honourable uh, Ayo Mayus uh, Chut. I'll get to pronounce your name correctly, uh, but you know, thank you for your uh, great contribution about the, you know, the communities that you work for in the uh, North Metro, uh, and it is important that uh, we have uh, uh, members out there that are able to bring these um, these fresh perspectives into this and to be that bridge out into um, into those communities uh, to. Um, the Honourable uh, uh, Peter Foster and to the Honourable Carl McGinn, thank you for your insights uh, as to uh, how this functions in mine, the mining and pastoral regions, and uh, acknowledge um, the work uh, that you uh, that you have done in your past career, Honourable Peter Foster, in this um, in this area. So it's really great for us to be able to focus on this issue. We, we uh, have got a strong package, uh, a $58.6 million uh, package uh, to focus on um, support of uh, youth, uh, at-risk youth. Um, and, uh, and of course, part of that is the $18 million to support the PCYC. But I think as uh, the Honourable Donna Farragher, we all know there's many organisations. PCYC is absolutely fantastic, but there's many other agencies and organisations uh, that are doing incredibly good work. Can I just make a quick reference to a project that's very dear to my heart and uh, I'm sure to uh, um, uh, Minister, um, the Honourable Sue Ellery, uh, and that is the Skimberley Schools Program, which is really very much dedicated in, to ensuring um, that when kids, uh, uh, Aboriginal kids in particular, are going into school, that we make sure that we've got a pedagogy that will deliver them um, uh, the ability to read and write, and they can become, uh, we often see in schools, um, uh, children failing uh, to uh, failing to learn, uh, and believing that somehow or other they are at fault and that they can't learn, and the whole cycle of hating school um, uh, begins. But the work that's been done in the Kimberley Schools program, I think, has been um, very, very successful in trying to give uh, these students some um, more success. So. Uh, that they have uh, more motivation, uh, more belief in themselves and more motivation to uh, attend school. So I, uh, again, I think uh, we're very focused on this. There's many ministers that, whether it's the Minister for Education, the Minister for Youth, uh, the Minister for Police, uh, the Minister for Communities, we all have an absolute and I think profound desire uh, to uh, give these kids at risk a better opportunity to become, as I say, full and happy and contributing members of, uh, of our community. And the question is the motion be agreed. No further speakers. I'll give the opportunity to the Honourable Dan Caddy to reply. Thank, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I'm incredibly heartened uh, by what I've heard in the chamber today, by the contributions of uh, 
of the members that have got to their feet. Um, it seems like we are all in furious agreement at the uh, great work and the fantastic work done by the done by the uh, PCYCs around the state. Um, and I just want to thank each member individually and pick up on a couple of things. Um, the Honourable Ayor Maku Shut um, and her contra oh, yeah, no. and, and her contribution. Um, her pa talking passionately about youth crime and homelessness, and also um, her discussions um, or her contribution about the Beyond 2020 WA uh, Youth Action Plan and what that means for the for young people in uh, in Western Australia. Um, the uh, the Honourable Donna Farragher, who gave a fantastic uh, contribution talk, she did talk and she did bring up, uh, and the Honourable Anna McTiernan mentioned it briefly, um, the bipartisan nature of this funding, and I, I do acknowledge that, um, absolutely, and it has been ongoing um, for some time. She's entirely correct. Um, members may have noticed I, uh, I ran a little short on time as I was getting to uh, contributions from other tiers of government, and I briefly touched on... Uh, touched on the support of local governments, both directly in some cases and also through, uh, through peppercorn leases provided to the, um, to the PCYC, and that's extremely important. And, uh, and I also acknowledge um, the Honourable Donna Farragher's work um, with Cadets WA program. I was a cadet myself in, in, in the mid-80s, and it is a very important and now, as, as she mentioned, expanded program, and it's fantastic. Um, the Honourable Brian Walker and his experiences overseas. We are um, we're privileged in this chamber each time the Honourable Brian Walker stands to hear about something happening in, or that has happened in some other part of the world, far-flung places in the world. And uh, and uh, I welcome, I absolutely welcome his his contribution both on working with at-risk um, at-risk youth in. Uh, in Asia, and and also uh, his time as a as a surf as a surf lifesaver. Um, the the Honourable Peter Foster spoke about his experiences as a as a, an employee, as a, as a worker at um, at DCP. Um, the the uh, this is not really specific to the motion, but geez, the workers at, at DCP deserve the, the thanks of everyone. That is an incredibly Im important role, and um, so I would acknowledge um, all of uh, all of the Honourable Peter Foster's um, former colleagues and all of those who are currently in that in that role. It is extremely extremely important. Um, the the Honourable uh, Kyle McGinn. I noted his support um, for PCYCs and especially the PCYCs within the area that he represents, um, uh, the PCYC at Kalgoorlie, but especially his, um, his uh, telling of um, the events around the creation of the new PCYC in Carnarvon, a, a, a PCYC now that has a, a brand new facility um, in the centre of town, and this is, this is indeed a good thing. And, uh, and I thank the Honourable Alana McTiernan for her response and, uh, and uh, her summation of, of everything that had been said. And, uh, and once again, it is great to see that all members in this chamber, all members who have spoken, but no doubt all members, including those who uh, didn't have the opportunity, are in furious agreement about uh, the fantastic role that the, uh, that the PC, PCYCs across the state and, uh, and the blue light activity units um, Play in the lives of of, uh, of the young people, uh, and uh, and more specifically uh, the at risk uh, those identified as at risk youth in in Western Australia. Thank you, members. The time for private members' business has lapsed. We now move to orders of the day. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy President. I move without notice that orders of the day numbers 1 to 18 be taken after order of the day number 22. Members, the Leader of the House has moved that orders of the day numbers 1 to 18 be taken after order of the day number 22. The question is that that motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, that now takes us to order of the day 24, Public Health Amendment. Safe Access Zones Bill 2021, and it's a continuation of the third reading remarks of the Honourable Nick Garan. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to uh, speak at the third reading of the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill uh, of 2021. Uh, I have some uh, brief remarks as we conclude this uh, 
debate, Mr Deputy President, which has been uh, difficult throughout the course of uh, this week on uh, what is a, uh, a sensitive topic. I want to commence, <coughs> Mr Deputy President, uh, by thanking my party, uh, the Liberal Party of Western Australia and the State Parliamentary Liberal Party uh, for uh, granting its members a conscience vote in respect to this piece of legislation. Um, it is something that, uh, a, as a Liberal Party member, we cherish and hold dear, and uh, I, thank, I thank our party for granting us that, that opportunity. Uh, I also want to, at this time, Mr Deputy President, um, thank the Minister who had the, uh, the carriage of this bill, who's away currently on urgent parliamentary business, the Honourable Stephen Dawson. <clears throat> This is not a bill which he has uh, primary responsibility for. He was uh, in his capacity as Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. And uh, Mr Deputy President, <coughs> I think it's... Uh, uh, I, I just want to put on the record that I'm grateful that the uh, Minister uh, responded to the questions uh, authentically, um, with, uh, with every good will and intent. And as a result of that, the committee of the whole house process that we embarked on, particularly yesterday, was incredibly worthwhile and incredibly beneficial for some reasons which I'll explain the, at the moment. And I think it was an example, Mr Deputy President, of a situation where uh, responses can be made in committee of the whole house, which are uh, transparent, authentic and for the benefit of the people of Western Australia, for the benefit of the people of Western Australia who have to live with the laws that this chamber ultimately approves. I also want to um, express my thanks, Mr Deputy President, to the members of this chamber for the respect that's been shown to all members throughout the course of this debate, both during the second reading and also in the Committee of the Whole House process. I, I respect and acknowledge that there are members of this chamber who have uh, very strong views about this particular topic, uh, equally as, as strong as the views that I hold. And uh, whilst I acknowledge and respect their right to hold those views and to express them, uh, I'm grateful for the respect that's been shown by the chamber throughout the course of this week, as I've indeed done the same. Now, Mr Deputy President, in terms of an observation I'd like to make quickly at this time in terms of improvements that could be made for the further progression of these type of bills in the future, I would simply make this observation as a result of the work that was done by the Committee of the Whole House. Where there is an opportunity or where there is cross-agency implications, cross-agency implications, it would be most beneficial to the House and to the members if advisers could be made available across government. Now, I hasten to add at this time, Mr uh, Deputy President, uh, that uh, it was obvious to me uh, during the Committee of the Whole House uh, that the Minister had at his disposal some um, excellent advisers uh, who assisted him in providing those transparent and authentic answers from the perspective of the Department of Health where the process could have been improved would have been if we had had at our disposal some advisers from WA Police. There's two reasons for that, Mr Deputy President. One is because the existing regulatory regime in Western Australia, uh, which is said by some to be uh, inadequate, is actually run by WA Police. And being able to interrogate the existing re regulatory regime and test the thesis as to whether it is actually a problem or not um, would have been beneficial. Uh, again, I hasten to add that the Minister did the best that he could with the information that he had at his disposal, and there were certain circumstances where the Department of Health had consulted with WA Police and were able to provide some information, including information when there had been adjournments in the House. The second reason, Mr Acting President, uh, Mr Deputy President, that uh, it would have been beneficial to have WA police advisers uh, present is because we learnt during the Committee of the Whole House process that it will, be, it will be them, that is WA police, who will have the responsibility for investigating and prosecuting these new offences. 
Uh, and what, so once again, it would have been uh, advantageous and beneficial to the House to be able to have had those advisers present uh, so that we could have had um, complete answers to all of those matters. <clears throat> so I offer that by way of a, a, um, a, a suggestion for an improvement for the future, recognising at the outset, Mr uh, Deputy President, uh, that uh, the advice that was provided yesterday in Committee of the Whole House was, on the whole, incredibly beneficial. Now, the reason I say that, Mr Acting President, Mr Deputy President, is because um, what we uh, have been able to glean from the Committee of the Whole House process is that there will be six categories of behaviour, six categories of behaviour that will be considered unlawful once this bill passes. The first of those categories is if a person engages in uh, what I would describe, this is not what the bill says, this is what I would describe, is if somebody behaves in a reprehensible fashion, reprehensible in the sense that they beset, harass, intimidate, interfere with, threaten, hinder, obstruct, impede a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided. That's reprehensible behaviour. Uh, it's indeed it represent reprehensible behaviour irrespective of the circumstances that a person finds themselves in. The fact that it's uh, near or outside an abortion clinic is uh, uh, actually not the point here. The point is that we shouldn't be having one Western Australian harassing, intimidating, obstructing another Western Australian full stop. Uh, so that category of behaviour will be made unlawful by this law. I might add, Mr Acting President, that we already know that that type of behaviour is already not acceptable in Western Australia and that there are other existing, existing laws uh, that address these things. So with respect to the first category of behaviour, it can be argued that this bill will do nothing other than provide another type of offence that may be able to be investigated and prosecuted. The second category of behaviour I'll come back to in a moment, Mr Deputy President. The third category of behaviour is uh, somebody acting without reasonable excuse who then in interferes with or impedes a footpath, road or vehicle in relation to abortion. Now, again, I would simply put that in the same category as the first matter. And we already, have, we already have existing laws, including local government laws, that deal with the interference and impeding of footpaths and the like. Nevertheless, uh, this will make this extra explicit. The fourth category of behaviour is somebody acting without reasonable excuse who makes a recording by any means of any of another person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided without the other person's consent. Now, Mr Acting President, I can't understand why a Western Australian would want to record another Western Australian in those circumstances. <coughs> Interestingly, during the Committee of the Whole House process, we gleaned from the Minister that the government is unaware of this having actually occurred in Western Australia. I was comforted to hear that. Uh, the minister did explain that there is information available that this has happened in other jurisdictions. Uh, my hope is that the respectful approach by Western Australians to date to not record each other uh, out the front of an abortion clinic will continue. And I see no reason why uh, people should be behaving in that, in that fashion. So that fourth category of behaviour will be made unlawful uh, albeit I suspect that it will never need to be prosecuted because there has been no circumstances in which that's occurred so far. The fifth category of behaviour, Mr Acting, Mr Deputy President, is a, a category of behaviour which is unknown to any person in this room. That is because it refers to engaging in any other behaviour prescribed by the regulations. So in other words, at some later stage, a government of any particular persuasion might then draft new forms of behaviour that is prohibited. We don't know what that is. The government doesn't know what that is. The government have said in the committee of the whole house process they do not intend to regulate and that it is simply there for future proofing purposes. Uh, that is uh, 
not appropriate, in my view, that we are then passing the bill in circumstances where we don't know, the government don't know, and the government don't even intend to use this particular fifth category. The sixth category, Mr. Uh, Acting Mr. Deputy President, is the publication or distribution of a recording. So this flows on from the fourth category, which referred to the recording of a person. And then this goes a step further in terms of the publication and the distribution of that recording. Well, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, Mr Acting President, I'm incredibly confident that this offence will never need to be prosecuted. Because if the government have told us in the Committee of the Whole House that they are unaware of any instance where a Western Australian has actually recorded somebody at first instance, then it follows that there clearly has not been any publication or distribution of the recording. So with regard to uh, those six categories, Mr Deputy President, the one category I'm yet to address is the second category, and I'll come to that in a moment. But to sum up with respect to the other ones, it's my view that category one is reprehensible behaviour, reprehensible behaviour that somebody might intimidate or, or harass. It's my view that there is already existing laws in Western Australia that, that deal with these things. The third category is, again, the interference and impeding of people. There are existing laws which address that particular matter. The fourth category is the recording of people. This is a matter that doesn't happen in Western Australia as per the admission of government themselves. The sixth category is the publication and distribution of the recording, which follows also has not been happening in Western Australia. So it leaves, at least from my perspective, Mr Deputy President, two categories which are problems. The fifth category, which I've mentioned already, which I don't support because no person in the House is aware what that behaviour is, including the government. But I now move to the second category, and this is the one that causes the most consternation because it is so, so unclear. What this particular category deals with, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, is communication by any means, by any means, in relation to abortion or in a manner that is able to be seen or heard by a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided and reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. Now, the reason that that particular category is uh, problematic is because what we found out in the Committee of the Whole House, Mr Deputy President, is that no one, no one yet knows how reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety is going to be determined by the courts. We do know that it's not a subjective test. We do know that the government said that it will be an objective test, but we don't know what that, that means. That said, in the committee of the whole house yesterday, um, I'm grateful that the minister was able to take us through a number of scenarios, a number of examples of behaviour that would be captured and other behaviour that would not be captured. And that provides a lot of uh, comfort particularly to some of the well-meaning people of uh, good faith who do attend at the clinics with a desire to help and support uh, those who might be having second thoughts. Now, I reiterate, um, Mr Deputy President, that the Committee of the Whole House process yesterday was incredibly beneficial, including a recognition by the government through the minister that WA Police do not intend to take a heavy-handed approach with respect to the enforcement of these laws. Now, with regard to behaviour that is reprehensible, the type of matters that I've described earlier, I'd encourage WA Police to take a heavy-handed approach if indeed they see that type of reprehensible behaviour occurring. But with regard to uh, uh, other behaviour that it remains unclear whether it will be captured by the law or not, uh, I would encourage the government to take the approach that they've indicated the WA Police will be taking, which will be more um, educative. And they will also still make available the use of uh, move on orders. Um, and it will indeed be interesting to see Mr. 
deputy presidents to what extent it will be in the public interest to what extent it will be in the public interest for the WA police to invest in an investigation and a prosecution in the courts of an offence an untested offence particularly under section 202p 2b instead of using a move on order uh, it will be indeed interesting to see to what extent uh, WA Police determined that it is in the public interest to do so. And I am um, encouraged to hear that WA Police have currently, uh, they currently have a working group that is working through the guidelines that will determine uh, the way in which these particular offences will be investigated and potentially prosecuted. So I really want to conclude now, Mr Deputy President, by saying this. And I reiterate this, um, particularly for those, um, whether inside the chamber or outside the chamber, who feel very strongly and passionately about this bill. I cannot emphasise it enough that my view is that every Western Australian, every Western Australian, should be able to go about their lawful business unimpeded by another Western Australian. I cannot emphasise that enough. My penultimate um, word on this, Mr Deputy President, uh, is to uh, thank, thank those people who for many, in, in some cases for many years, um, have cared. Uh, those individuals who are motivated to have a conversation to any Western Australian woman who finds themselves in a situation with an unplanned pregnancy and they care and they say, I want to journey with you. I'm prepared to walk this journey with you if you want me to. If what you are actually wanting right now is somebody to walk with you at this time, then I will do that. And I want to thank those people for having the heart, for having the care and having the compassion to be prepared to do that for years, and I hope they continue to do that. And so it really brings me to my last um, word, Mr Deputy President, and that is to call out to any Western Australian, any Western Australian, uh, any Western Australian woman who is in a situation with an unplanned pregnancy, and if they would like support, if they're not feeling supported, and they want somebody to journey with them, to have the confidence to know that there are other Western Australians who are prepared to walk with them. And in particular, I want to um, uh, commend the work of Pregnancy Problem House in Western Australia, Pregnancy Assistance Office and Pregnancy Matters. I know, I know having spoken to those people, Mr Deputy President, that they will be willing to walk with any Western Australian of any um, political persuasion, and they will do so in a non-judgmental way, and they will do so in a way that is caring and compassionate. And so I would encourage other Western Australians who, who don't feel supported to reach out to those three organisations. They will journey with them, and they will do so because they are motivated by this motto, that is, to love them both. Members, the question is the bill be read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021, third reading. Members, that now takes us to order of the day 23, Railway BBI Rail Oz Proprietary Limited Agreement. Agreement Amendment Bill 2021, and as I understand it, we are in committee.
Members, we're in committee of the whole dealing with the Railway BBI Rail Oz Proprietary Limited Agreement Amendment Bill 2021. The question is that Clause 1 be stand as printed. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, I'm going to try and do as much as I can in the Clause 1 component. There's not too many clauses to play with. Uh, can I start by asking, so both in the second reading speech uh, and a number of other documents, uh, the reason given to of the, for this bill is to extend the deadline for the submission by BBI Rail as proportionally limited as the company under the BBI State Agreement Act of initial proposals for the railway project. Now, um, what, we, what we haven't done in, the, in, in this process is actually define what initial proposals actually are, because I mean, this is a project that's been under discussion now for many years. I mean, there was an original uh, bill in 2017, which was four years ago, uh, to, give, to give legislative support to a project which was proposed under the previous government, which was even further back. Um, and there's a number of things that this company have already presented in relation to bits of documentation. So what precisely ticks this off to say that uh, the initial proposal has been presented? Because I would have thought, when we know it's a rail line and a port, we know roughly what it's going to cost. We even know how many people it's going to employ. So what, what on earth, is, can we have a list of the initial proposals that need to be ticked off? Minister? I, I understand, um, the, I think, the point that the member is, uh, is making. Uh, he's saying that there's obviously been discussions uh, about this project going, um, going back uh, probably certainly um, six or seven years, um, and so why are we talking about initial proposals? But the concept of the initial proposal, as I understand it, has uh, a, a particular um, uh, context. Uh, that you know, it's not the initial proposals where you've had discussions about we want to build a, a rail. It's the uh, the proposals that um, are set out in clause 11 of the um, clause 11 of the of the state uh, of the state agreement, um, and so it's quite. Um, uh, they are plans. Uh, that, uh, uh, in, sorry, they are uh, proposals um, that would be required to be able to make a reasonable assessment, and they need proposals that would include the location, area, layout, design, materials, and time program for the commencement of and completion of the construction. Um, and looking at the rail corridor, the fencing, the crossing places, any additional infrastructure that has to be constructed within the railway corridor, uh, what temporary accommodation and ancillary uh, facilities for the rail construction, uh, the water supply, energy supplies, telecommunications, access roads within the railway corridor, lateral access uh, roads, um, use of uh, local labour uh, and other work. So there's a very comprehensive, and you're right, I mean, in, 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 in a layman's sense, initial proposals would have been, you know, the very early discussions about uh, we, uh, we want to do this and roughly we want to build it from A to B. Um, this obviously, these initial proposals are what's being required here, are uh, 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 much more detailed. Um, uh, propositions uh, in relation to uh, the whole corridor and all of the different things that might be required uh, to ensure that that uh, rail can be constructed and maintained. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister. So I suspected that might be the case. And I, you know, I don't, in the second reading speech, um, there's a list of milestones that the company has reached, and I mean it's quite a significant uh, list there. Investigative works, uh, approve, it's, it's received approval for submissions. It's received um, uh, a range, and in fact, in your in your second reading reply speech, you went through a range of approvals that had already been achieved as well. Um, the environmental approvals have been received. 
um, for both the port and rail projects, an overland uh, conveyor, etc., and the mine itself. So it's received environmental approval. Uh, it's got agreement with native title holders. So um, I guess two points or two questions. The first is: Were all those um, were, were the environmental approvals given without the detailed uh, project uh, plans that we now are calling um, this this you know probably slightly inappropriate term of initial proposals but so those other things were given without necessarily having those details you know we've got an environmental plan without having the detailed planning and I will look through those words uh, and perhaps minister as a second part of this question to, to enhance proceedings, um, is it, is, and it may not be possible today, but perhaps it might be possible for you at some point to table um, the list of things that would be required uh, under this thing called initial proposals. If you, and I know you've given us verbally a list, but uh, perhaps at some point in the House you might be uh, able to provide the full list of what's need to be required for this project to proceed. Okay, Minister. Uh, uh, look. Um the, uh, the reference to initial proposals in the second reading speech is a colloquial um, uh, reference. Um, what is required under the legislation will be the detailed proposals. Now, they cannot, technically, they cannot be given until the project has passed fit because you're part of the, the whole conglomerate that you need to be able to do is to say that you're project ready, that you have got finance. Now, that doesn't stop um, all of that detailed work that we were discussing when I listed that range of, uh, of materials that were required. I mean, obviously that work is being done, but they can't get to the status of being formally submitted to satisfy that section of the, um, of the legislation until they are accompanied by FIT. But obviously that work has been done now to sufficient detail that it, could, that it was able to found uh, and to form the basis of an environmental approval. So the environmental approval will be given on the basis of that work. Um, now, obviously, if somehow or other um, between that time and the time that this becomes a detailed proposal and a detailed proposal approved, that that changes, then they would obviously need to go back and get a, um, an environmental approval. But it is an iterative process, but they, and they have done this work but they can't submit it until they've got to the point where they are actually project ready. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. So I, 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 this is where I'm trying to get to, and I, I thank you for your answer. So, so in effect, the, the, uh, the final investment decision is, is a critical component to, um, to effectively fulfilling the requirements for the enactment of this amendment bill to the original State Agreement Act. Now, and I, th I understand, uh, I will read your answer again, but I understand that's what you're telling us. And I, th I think that I understand the, the, the rationale behind it, and I think that it makes sense. And I think that that's particularly important because we're dealing with a, uh, a proposal that hasn't been able to uh, proceed to that final investment decision at a time when the iron ore price has been higher than it has ever been before and, and the opportunities have been immense. And that, that's why it's important for us to recognise. And, and I, look, I, I restate what I said in my second reading speech. The opposition supports the bill uh, and supports the government in trying to get this project up and going. We just want to get some stuff on the table uh, along the way to make sure that we're, we're all working in the, in the same direction. And ultimately, I guess, um, because as my, as my good friend uh, the Honourable Robin Chapel would often say he was not a fan of uh, he was not a fan of uh, state agreement acts, and he thought that companies got away and governments got away with blue murder with it. And I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that they work uh, adequately. So, what I've heard the minister say, uh, Deputy, uh, sorry, Chair, um, is that the the, finance, the final investment decision is a critical part uh, of 
uh, the decision going forward and whether they complete that process. Um, a question, Minister, just in relation to and I'll guys just jump back to your second reading speech again. Continue with from where I was before. The current deadline for those initial proposals is the 30th September 2020 to the 31st of March 2022. Now, 30th of September 2020 was obviously um, nearly a year ago. Uh, so, can you just outline what has been the process then? If, if the initial deadline was the 30th of September 2020, um, what's been the process then to get us to this? Apart from obviously putting this act together, there must have been approaches to the company, and the definition of the company will come to in a minute. But um, surely the government's engaged in a process. Um, when, it, when it became obvious that the initial deadline for this development under a state approval had not been met. Minister. Um, uh, yeah, just to, um, uh, to reaffirm what I was saying on fit, and, and even though uh, the language used in the, um, in the agreement uh, is not fit, the language uh, that is used, it says that some of the um, items that need to be furnished to, um, to the minister uh, include the financial capability of the company uh, to undertake the operations to which the said proposal will refer, and then the readiness of the company to embark upon and proceed to carry out the operations referred to in the said proposal. So that, in, uh, in the terms of commercial reality, uh, that translates into uh, the final investment decision by the company, that they have made that decision, they have got their financial capability and they are ready, uh, ready to mark. Now, it is true that um, uh, what ba basically one of the fundamental problems that has been causing the delay uh, has been uh, COVID. And, uh, um, the project, the financing negotiations that were were based were involving overseas parties, um, particularly China-based, and due to you know, constraints on travel and the ability to be able to bring um, this to conclusion. And certainly, the work started um, in 2020. It, it uh, became obvious. Uh, that we would need uh, this extension of time, um, but you know the member will be aware that we had uh, last year an enormous amount of uh, of COVID legislation. The priority had to be given uh, to the time in Parliament to that um, that COVID legislation. We also um, had um, Parliament um, uh, prorogued for a a state election. Might, the member might recall. Um, so this uh, this bill was um, brought um, brought forward um, as soon as we um, uh, went through. Uh, as soon as uh, Parliament uh, um, was uh, was reconvened, uh, and I don't think it's unusual. You know, ideally you would have the extension before. Um, the last term expired, but I, you know, we understood fully that this was a, a project that enjoyed bipartisan support and wasn't under any, um, any immediate threat. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So, can we just confirm? Thank you for that, Minister. Um, obviously, negotiations were still continuing during that period of time after the, the, the lapse of the last project. I presume there was no um, penalties applied. Um, obviously, we all want to get this project up and going. I presume it just continued forward. Minister. The project uh, didn't lapse. The, there was a, a variation to the agreement. The variation was actually made on the uh, 10th of September last year, um, but it has taken some time to bring that uh, forward and have that um, entrenched in legislation. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so that extension was um, written within. That's the one that was written within the Act to allow an automatic extension. Minister, um, we uh, we have the ability to vary the agreement and then come uh, and seek to have that ratified. So the agreement still uh, takes effect as an agreement. 
um, it requires ratification to have uh, the endorsement of power and, and for certain um, provisions that come with the ratification to apply. So, you know, the, um, the precedence given to these provisions um, perhaps to set aside provisions of other pieces of legislation. So it's not unusual. Uh, and in fact, that's the normal way that these things are done. An agreement is made or a variation to an agreement is made and then ratification is, uh, is sought. In the meantime, the thing still has contractual force. Uh, what this gives it is legislative force. Leader of the Deposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, Minister, given that the, the final investment decision is such an integral component to um, the, the, the proceeding of this pro project, uh, can you tell me whether there's been any uh, review of the costings to the point that, I mean, in 2017, I noted that it was, um, you know, uh, uh, a five to six billion dollar project. Uh, in the current reading speech, it's a, it's an order of five point six billion dollar project. Given the, the, the delays, has, has the original costings been updated? What, what's the most recent uh, update that we have of the costs of this project? Minister. Well, the, uh, the, there's, we don't have any advice that the, uh, the cost has increased. Obviously, that's uh, something that the, uh, the company is, uh, is working on. Um, and um, they will be obviously updating all of their numbers um, going into their um, final investment decision. Okay. Chair of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So, Minister, can we find out when the latest update of costings was received by government? It's not really good. Yeah. Minister. Um, that um, this uh, was um, provided before the uh, uh, ratification of the uh, sorry before the entering into the uh, variation of the uh, of the agreement, but it's not something that uh, that we are constantly getting updates on because that's you know the actual cost of the project is not something there has to be agreement on. That is a commercial issue for the company. Uh, we satisfy ourselves about, uh, around the components of what's being built. How much they pay for it is pretty much their business. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister. Just uh, note the second reading speech you talked about the variation agreement contemplating future uh, general legislation and enhanced local pro participation procurement. Um, apologies if you've already covered this, but uh, do you have any? Um, just a, a general outline in terms of the issues affecting that and, and, um, and any time frames we might be looking at. Minister. Um, yes, uh, we have uh, under consideration, obviously, and I think we've been very public about this. Uh, the potential, whilst we have legislated um, very strongly in relation to government procurement in terms of, uh, of local jobs and um, provided uh, all sorts of uh, uh, incentives and uh, facilitation of uh, WA companies being able to participate fully in uh, the billions of dollars of uh, procurement uh, we engage in each year. Um, uh, the the uh, matter of extending that into the private sector is uh, still under consideration and policy still being developed around that. But we just wanted to flag that if we and to make that clear um, that if um, uh, when that occurs uh, we have the capability of ensuring uh, that this company. Um, uh, understands it needs to satisfy those arrangements. Chair. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, Chair. So, and that's very commendable. I think you know, uh, good thing to do. The 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 question, I suppose, um, uh, that that variation agreement, the contemplation of that, is that a, a provision that might, um, uh, or is that something that's necessary 
to give effect to, to anything that you might be doing contemplating in the future vis-à-vis uh, -vis the other agreement acts that are in place currently? Or equivalent. Minister. Yeah, so um, uh, as you know, we, uh, we did take the view going into the 2017 election that you couldn't um, unilaterally um, vary state agreements. That seemed to be supported by the community. Um, uh, but, uh, and so in respect to uh, existing state agreements, um, we have uh, obviously, any, generally speaking, um, we would not be able to include these provisions or we would choose not to uh, impose those provisions on existing uh, agreements and existing arrangements. But because of this one has been negotiated at the time when that legislation was being contemplated, we wanted to flag uh, that should you know that should we have that legislation prepared at the time that they will be coming operational, uh, then we have the capacity to uh, to bring that in. But I have to say I, I do think that after the 2017 uh, election, there was um, we have seen uh, an increased understanding of many of our resources companies on the need to really. Um, ramp up the local procurement and to make um, the um, benefits to the, uh, to the communities in the mining regions much more tangible. And, and so we certainly saw um, in the first couple of years of, uh, of our government, I think uh, far more assiduous efforts being made by BHP and Rio uh, and, uh, and others to uh, engage uh, and to do more local, uh, local procurement and do more procurement in the, um, in the Pilbara in particular. So I think that's, um, you know, that has been a positive development. That doesn't mean that we don't necessarily need to go down this path, but we do note that there has been, I think, a more engagement um, and, and perhaps the knowledge that that was uh, a policy of a, of a government that has just been, was just elected, may have um, helped form part of the motivation. Look, um, Neil Thompson. Oh, sorry, My uh, Chairman. Um, the, thank you, uh, and, and thank you for that. And, and I, I do understand that the challenges um, as, as, as policy discourse moves on, and, and you know, so commendable to make sure these provisions are there to include um, include some future uh, changes that might might in, in, increase. So I think that's that that uh, I lend my support to that. Uh, the other matter, I guess, is one of the issues that have. Um, we see, as you know, when we drive the roads up there in, 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 the, in the Pilbara, we see that a lot of these small um, miners are operating uh, with uh, road trains. And, and I know you've been a great supporter of uh, use of rail and development of rail infrastructure over your long career. Um, but I do um, just wanted to touch on the issue of the, around the uh, rail access regime uh, and, and, and the review of the um, Western Australian rail access regime uh, in 2020 in particular. Uh, in, in so far as this, this agreement is concerned and, and whether there's been any consideration of some of the recommendations that came out of that process uh, in, in relation to, um, and, and, and if you could assist me, in relation to the, the, the particular uh, effect that that regime would have on this particular agreement act and um, our amendment and, and whether that, uh, there's any comment in relation to, uh, the question I suppose is, we assume this agreement will be subject to the, the uh, rail access regime of, and, and the code, access code of, of, of WA.
Minister. Yes. Um, so, in the um, in the agreement, in section 16 of the agreement, um, it um, provides a, a dual path. Uh, so, the default position is that the rail access legislation and the code, as it varies from time to time, will apply. So, uh, the agreement um, contemplates that as the Act or the Code uh, changes, then it's the change that applies. So it's not locked in time that it's only the Access co uh, Code or regime that applies at the time of the agreement. It will change with it. But, however, there is uh, another um, provision um, that, uh, that does enable them to take an alternative pathway and that is uh, they can apply uh, to the... Which commission is it? Three. Yeah, no, but what commission is Okay, so they can apply to the ACCC uh, under uh, the Australian Consumer Law uh, for a haulage services um, project. So that would enable them to offer. So there's two ways this can be done. It can be that you are able to run your own uh, tracks entirely, a full um, uh, third party access regime where you can put your own. Uh, trains um, over over the line, and the other is a, a hook and pull um, operation where you can uh, offer uh, third party uh, services. You can offer to uh, take their uh, their tr their ore on your on your on your rail, um, and you using uh, your. Uh, your own usually locomotives in and sometimes wagons as well, so known generally as I understand as hook and pull. Um, uh, so that is um, uh, now that's obviously a decision that needs to uh, be taken um, by the, um, uh, the Competition Commission. They look at that uh, and presumably uh, they will have a centre of, uh, of mind. Uh, whether or not that is actually a positive. So in sometimes the ability to be able to offer that service does actually facilitate smaller, more stranded assets that otherwise could uh, get up. Um, as we've seen in the past, um, in some instances, uh, the ability to uh, mandate and have that level of control um, uh, can be used um, uh, used in an anti-competitive way. But um, here, because the entity um, that will be making the decision as to whether or not they can move out of the general rail access regime into this provision of haulage services will indeed uh, be the Consumer and Competition Commission. Um, you would hope that you could have uh, a fair amount of confidence that the uh, the issues of, of, of competition and fairness are actually taken into account uh, in the making of that decision. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, Chair. And, 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 and once again, thank you for that response. I think that's um, very helpful. Uh, the, a bit like the question I posed in relation to the, um, to the uh, local procurement on this issue of rail access, so I'm very comforted to, to be told that this is. Um, will apply as per the rail access regime and code that's currently in, in, uh, in force in WA. So, for, uh, for example, there might be an amendment to that. We, we had this review in 2020 uh, when there was uh, we were, we were five recommendations, I believe, that had been made in relation to or, or issues, and not recommendations, but certainly issues that were of shortcomings that were identified in that code. Um, and, and they included things like um, uh, the, the timelines on access arrangements being too long, the ambiguity of the code, um, presenting opportunities to game the negotiation. We know some of the challenges. I don't have to go into that in detail. Uh, you know full well some of the challenges with some of the 
over the years with some of the rail uh, operations and, and getting uh, other third parties onto those where it might be in a broader interest. And I, I think, members, generally, those, yeah. uh, those, that review of the rail code mm. was probably focused more on the, uh, uh, the, the tracks in the, um, in the south, because mm. much of the staff in the in the north in your region is governed by um, by state agreement. agreement so that's i suppose my my point i suppose and, and i'm understanding you know with this any avenue and you you've reassured me that this could be uh, this could be implied applied in, in in this case and, and it's not going to be curtailed by the agreement um, and so so what you're saying the question i suppose is those other agreements are generally not Subject to the code, but um, uh, Minister, uh, they're not, and this is an issue that uh, obviously I spent, um, you know, many years uh, uh, looking at, um, uh, and there always was written into those uh, those original, you know, the the uh, those very first state agreements, which have been the progenitors of uh, their successes, there always was written into this, this third party access. But you've got to think about the times. You've got to think about the times when uh, there was absolute desperation to get these, um, get these projects up. Wasn't always a full awareness of the, what they used to be described in rail as the thousand and one ways of smart bastardry that you could, if that's a parliamentary term, but that's a phrase within the industry, uh, that you could use to uh, um, actually thwart uh, the noble intentions of the legislators. Um, uh, so, uh, so this thing evolved, and so we, you know, when we came into doing state agreements uh, in the uh, in the 2000s, there was a bit more understanding and awareness of what some of the uh, the disadvantages had been of some of those uh, those earlier regimes or what was seen to be um, provisions that would provide that protection um, at the time they weren't strong enough but you know we've we've come a, a long way we've evolved a long way in terms of uh, anti-competition law you know over the last um, over the last 50 years um, as I say, I always take myself back to that time in the late 50s and 60s when, you know, after years of trying to get Bob Menzies to listen to someone other than uh, a BHP is, and uh, looking after the Eastern States industries, finally we were allowed to admit that what we taught the Japanese before the war was not true and that we did actually have lots of iron ore and we could afford to uh, export it. Anyhow, when we... So I think some of those provisions were not all that robust uh, and uh, it turned out to be very hard for third parties to get on, but we've managed to work our way around it. We've had a third force in iron ore develop um, and then obviously some, um, some subsequent players as well. Uh, Honourable Member, just before you uh, speak, just we've got some students who have entered uh, the public gallery. Welcome to the Legislative uh, Council, and uh, hope you're enjoying your tour and have have, uh, have a great day. Thank you. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Yeah, look, and thank you. Look, and and um, the, the long history of the development of the North, I know it's been uh, been a, a very interesting one, and certainly uh, you know resulted in this incredibly efficient uh, system that we have. But I suppose the, the issue and, 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 um, is really around that transport task, both in terms of the, the, the main players, the big, the big players that operate and the, and the rail, uh, but looking at making sure we can you know, move as much as we can away from uh, the road if we can. Uh, the, 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 I suppose my final question, I suppose, is around this issue of the port itself and, and, and the, whether those access uh, arrangements which you've outlined uh, are going to enable there won't be any restriction at the end of the end of that hose um, in terms of the um, uh, the opportunities I suppose for those third parties to operate into uh, this new port which has been developed. Minister. Yes, um, and perhaps just if I can add uh, to that that 
There is a commercial incentive for the company to actually look at working with third parties because uh, they, um, they, ha they have an obligation uh, um, to uh, transport 25 million tonnes on road and uh, sorry on rail and uh, at the port, but they have um, a capability for twice that, um, and the 25 uh, million tonne. Uh, provision has been made on the basis of their estimate of of what their what they would be require requiring to um, exhaust their um, their asset. Um, so there is a commercial incentive. So there is the you know the protections, these two lad protections, the code or if not the code, a determination by the um, ACCC. Um, and then, um, obviously, this commercial incentive for them to uh, get uh, extra uh, extra tonnage um, on their um, on their rail. Question is, clause one standards printed. The honourable uh, uh, the uh, leader of the opposition. Thank you, deputy chair. Could have used either of them. Um, okay, minister. So we've we've accepted that uh, the final investment decision is a part of the process to go forward with this process. Can I just then try and um, tease out a little precisely who is going to be making that decision and precisely who uh, will be operating this venture as best we can? Uh, so can I just check? I'll start with this. Can you tell us, uh, on the assumption that this project proceeds, iron ore is being mined and um, put, on, put on a 165 kilometre rail line and getting to the, the port built at Balla Balla. Uh, who will who will own? Uh, I'll start with who who will who will own the rail line. What will be the legal entity that will own the rail line, and what will be the legal entity that owns the port? Let's start with that. So, um, this, uh, this agreement uh, uh, relates to the rail only. Right? Yep. So, I was mentioning the ports in terms of capacity, but this agreement is about the rail. Um, and the, the entity who is the primary part, the contractual partner, is BBI Rail Oz Proprietary Limited. So, uh, an, an Australian company could, and I will ask the advisors to give us some idea of who the shareholders might be, if they can. Um, but it is BBI Rail Australia Proprietary Limited. Now, there are three parties um, who I understand are also entities associated with the holder of the tenements um, that have, uh, that are, um, uh, that are guarantors on this agreement. So they're also signatories of the agreement, but I'm advised that they're signatories to the agreement um, uh, by way of being guarantors to the agreement. And that is Todd Petroleum Mining Company Limited, a New Zealand company, Todd Offshore Limited, another New Zealand company, and Todd Minerals Limited, another New Zealand company, all associated with Mr. Michael. I think it's Michael, isn't it? Todd? That so um, the company, the BBI Rail, um, BBI Rail is um, uh, the Todd. No, which it, we've got TIO. This, this company, this company is a subsidiary of this group, which is also a subsidiary of Todd. But, um, but this company, which holds the railway line, which will hold the railway license in the railway is a subsidiary of the Ballabell Infrastructure Group, which is an Australian entity, which is then owned 94% by the Todd Infrastructure yeah. Group. 
<coughs> okay, so the the owners behind BBI uh, BBI Rail um, through uh, and it's BBI Rail is owned by the Balabala Infrastructure Group Limited, which yeah. is a company that's incorporated in Australia. Now, TIO, which I presume is Todd Investment Offshore, it's, a, a, it's a, listed here as TIO, and I'm presuming I'm being accurately that that's exactly what the name is. Yeah. Uh, so their designation of that company is it's obviously a Todd related company. Uh, TIO NZ Limited. Now that owns 93.55% of the Balabala Infrastructure Group, which in turn is the full proprietor of BBI Rail, uh, Oz Proprietor Limited. Uh, now the so they own 93.55%. The remaining 6.45% of the shares are owned by Nicholas and Angela Curtis, who are Australian uh, citizens. And uh, the TIO New Zealand Limited is a private New Zealand company um, uh, of long standing and is wholly controlled by the Todd family. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Minister. And I'm sorry to drag you through the, 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 the difficult uh, and sometimes complex corporate structures that exist over these things. Um, I just think it's important to know because ultimately uh, a corporate structure is going to have to find the, find the funding uh, to deliver a project. And I think it's just important to know. So there are obviously so the, the, the other issue that we face, of course, is that the rail line can't exist in isolation, even though the Act. Um, deals with the rail line itself, and it did so in 2017. And I just I note in 2017 some comments that said, um, you know, that the, the overall project was 88% at that stage holding by the Todd Corporation, uh, so it still maintained its 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 level view. 12% uh, by NICO, and I'm not sure what NICO is, um, and it was aimed to be a 50-50 joint venture between the Todd NICO. Uh, combination and um, obviously looking for Chinese investment. I presume that is that was that was referring to the entirety of the project and not specifically the rail line. But the problem we have of course is the rail line can't exist in isolation. So if you can't if you can't build a port and you can't build the mines, the it's a rail line to nowhere. So in terms of achieving uh, final investment decision, there's there's not much point in uh, not not knowing what the rest of the project uh, requires and, and how that all goes together. Uh, so, in terms, it has the government. So, let, let's start with the questions and tease this out. Um, has the government, as well as being in discussion with the proponents of the rail line, been in discussion with the proponents of the greater project? Because it's all one project. Um, I understand. Um, and how is that? How is that interaction and and, and um, uh, communication occurred is and now I understand the entire project. I think it's been given a title like Pilbara Iron Ore Project (PIOP). Um, I'm not sure if that's the case, but if if there is an overall company structure that sits over the entire project with the rail line as a subsidiary, can you let us know if that's the case or whether they'll be running as three, two, or three completely isolated? Um, legal entities, not not a single umbrella entity. Uh, Minister. Yes, look, it was uh, an unusual arrangement, and uh, you, as you're probably aware, that that original agreement was entered into. Um, uh, prior to us coming to government, so it is a—it's a bit of a strange beast where you are actually allowing a company, you're giving the company the right uh, to build that rail line, even though they are not the entity uh, or have not got uh, a binding contract to provide the ore. 
Um, so, you know, there was, uh, um, at the time, I understand, um, some conflict around, you know, whether or not uh, that really was the way a state agreement uh, should uh, go. But, I mean, we came into government, uh, we were presented with this situation where uh, this agreement had, in fact, been entered into, unusual though its complexion would be, um, and we decided that probably at that time uh, to, you know, to go forward with it um, because, uh, you, might, you might recall, we were in a bit of a, uh, a recessionary environment when we, um, when we came into, uh, into government and we were keen to get projects up and this was the project on the table. So it is an unusual situation. Um, and uh, you members would, of course, be aware that there's been a lot of argy-bargy that has gone on. Uh, much of it played out in the press um, between the various uh, entities that um, hold the... Uh, between those that hold the tenement and those that hold the right to, uh, uh, to, build, the, uh, to build the rail. But, um, now, we understand that... Uh, I understand that, you know, was it was March 2020, um, Flinders Mine shareholders did agree um, uh, through an extraordinary general meeting to become a foundation, um, a foundation customer um, for the, uh, the Pilbara rail, um, rail project. Now, of course, it is complicated by the fact that um, Flinders Mines, that... Um, That's the. Uh, so, uh, uh, for, <laughs> so you have got a situation where the owner of the tenement is also an entity that is uh, the majority shareholder of which are. Uh, uh, entities associated with Todd Corporation Limited, and so that has been uh, some of the issue that has played out in the press, is whether or not there's been uh, oppression of uh, minority uh, uh, minority shareholders um, in this process. But at the end of the day, um, that if uh, they can't, and I'm sure that the fact that the entity that there was uh, a majority ownership in the tenement that was identical to the majority ownership in the rail project uh, may have been a major factor in um, the decision to give, make, give the rail project um, separately. So um, we understand that um, negotiations are, are still on, on foot and I'm advised here that as in December 2020, Flinders and BBIG commenced discussions um, uh, about a potential transition that could result in Flinders retaining 100% of the Pilbara uh, iron ore project, as well as 100% of uh, BBIG's port and rail uh, infrastructure assets. And these uh, discussions are ongoing, but have not have not yet been finalised. Our leader of the opposition. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, yeah, this this is a very complicated, uh, tangled web, Minister, and um, I'm the first to acknowledge that it's. I suspect it's not as try as I might to blame the government and the minister for where 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 the corporate structure of this project finds itself. I've I, I don't think I would be able to do so and don't plan to waste a lot of time trying. Um, this, this does precede uh, the current government, so uh, as much as I'd like to cast blame around. But the Minister has highlighted some of the, the issues around the corporate structure of this project. So, um, and I do, so, and I, I'm not expert on, I haven't read all of the articles uh, in relation to the minority shareholders and their view about the progress of this of this project, uh, with the exception that I, I would make the comment that I think my my, my brief uh, level of research into this would suggest that the minority shareholders 
greatest argument is not against it proceeding, but that it's not proceeding at a rate which they would want. So I, I suspect, I suspect that the majority shareholders' issue is is not that it, it's it's um, an issue with the proceeding, but that it actually should proceed. So uh, I'm going to work on the assumption that all players in the in the in the process here, be they majority or minority shareholders, uh, are actually interested in the project being developed. So. Um, uh, I think that's the way we should proceed. But so can I? Can I then? Um, can I ask the minister then? Because I think it is important to know uh, the influences that we face. Um, can I just confirm that the overall project has been given some form of designation as um, uh, the uh, the PIOP, the Pilbara Iron Ore Project, that has sort of gone to PIOP. Uh, is PIOP specifically referring to the mine? Yes. Does it have anything to do with the rail? No, that, um, that's, the, um, that's the iron ore. Yep. So, 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 so they deal, so they'll the be Flinders important. The mine, Pilbara Iron Ore Project, is the foundation source of the iron ore yeah. Yeah. for the rail project. Yeah, so they, they, they have no legal entity status over the rail line for the bill that we're discussing today. No, okay. no, but you've got the majority, you know, the ultimate majority holder of the interest in Flinders, so yeah. you've got the Todds yeah. basically holding about 56% of, uh, of the ore tenements, yeah. which is Peop, yeah. and then about 93% of the rail project. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so even though, and this is this is the joy of, of corporate law, which which is uh, the, the 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 graveyard. It's the graveyard of the legal profession, I'm sure, because it's no, so it's so, so complicated, so complicated. Yeah, that's where all the bit they make money out of it. It's it's a bit like um, chair. Uh, I remember in the veterinary trade, it's dermatology because your patients never get better and the and the and the symptoms never go away. So that's how they make your big dollars. I'm sure it is in the human sphere as well, and I'm sure that the big, the big dollars, the big dollars are actually in, in corporate law. It's an astounding process. So we have, I mean, the issue here we face is that I think everybody in the chamber agrees that we want we want this project to proceed, um, and the issue is obviously would appear to be because you've got the environmental approvals effectively. The issue is about financing, and we'll come to that in a bit. But then you've got, and theoretically. Theoretically, Chair, um, the, the, the rail line is a completely separate legal entity to the, to the tenements which would provide the iron ore to the port, which, will, which would be the export point up at Balabala. But in reality, they're not separate because um, a, a range of, of holding corporations, obviously, um, the, the now I think was referred to as um, uh, Todd, is it the, the Todd Industry Group? Or so, um, and this is where we need that definition of, 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 of TIO, I suppose, because. Um, I think that actually is its name. Yeah, the Todd. The TIO. Yeah. New Zealand Limited, I'm told yeah. that is actually, it's, that is the name. So is that, is that the, does that company, uh, uh, is, uh, the other three companies, the Todd Petroleum Mining, Todd Offshore Limited and Todd Minerals Limited, are they subsidiary companies to TIO? Does TIO effectively fully own those other companies yes. as best we know? Yes. Okay. So, um, so obviously then, uh, TIO... Well, hold on now. Let's no. just get this right. TIO... Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. So, yeah, sorry. It owns... Um, 93.5% of BBIG. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is so the legal can... entity that will manage the rail line. That's right. So, but so in terms of then the, the, the document that we're approving the government oh, to, right, to okay. sign. So these others. These yeah. others, are they so subsidiary to TIO? Oh, 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 we'll find that one out TIO. first. Okay, so my advice is at this point uh, is that all of those th those three companies uh, that are acting as guarantors 
are subsidiaries of TIO NZ. Now, I can't hand on heart say that they're necessarily 100 per cent own subsidiaries, uh, but they are subsidiaries. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. OK, so... Um, and, and it might sound like I'm trying to trick the minister up, but I'm actually trying to get down to who, who owns what and who's, you know, who said what to whom. Um, so effectively, uh, <laughs> the tenements are majority owned by um, TIO, which is effectively um, uh, Todd Industries. And I, I think you, I think you said, Minister, you've met with with uh, the head of Todd Industries because uh, you certainly did so in your. Um, uh, your 2017 speech, um, when you were still handling this bill, you must be sick of it by now. Um, you met you opened, well on the 28th of November 2017, the week before you said you'd met with Mr. Michael Todd, um, the company executive. So obviously um, that company is integral then to the uh, to the proceedings. And to to this, this whole thing being developed, there's, um, it, it may be off the bill, and you may not be in a position to answer it. But you, can you tell me whether TIO is a substantial shareholder in whatever legal entity, and if you could tell me what that is, that will own and operate the port? Um, Minister. So, as far as I can see, so the companies, so we're, we're dealing here with BBI Rail. I understand there's another entity called BBI Port. And now, both of those uh, then go back, both of those are parts of the Bala Bala Infrastructure Group. So we've got the Bala Bala Infrastructure Group, of which there is a subsidiary that is the rail and the subsidiary that is the port. I hope I've got this right. And then, of course, in turn, we have um, BBIG, so the group that contains the port and the rail. Um, that of that BBIG group, 93.5, um, owned by TIO, and then the others by Nicholas and Angela Curtis. Thank you, Minister. And I'm sorry to drag you through this, but I think it's probably good that we know precisely what we're dealing with. Well, OK. Uh, won't comment on that. Um, so, effectively then, so, so where we've got to, and I think it's been a very good, uh, although um, intricate, uh, process, is that uh, you've, got, you've got effectively uh, TIO New Zealand Limited, who um, is the, the vast majority shareholder of both the port and the rail project, and the majority shareholder, although not to the same extent, of the tenements which are held by uh, that group and a number of others, a group that sort of, I think, started as partly as Flinders Mines uh, and has now um, uh, become a joint venture to some degree. Um, and I, uh, I uh, so uh, it's now operating, I understand, in the mines uh, as something called PIOP Mine Co NL. And I'm not sure what NL stands for. I thought New Zealand would be NZ, so um, uh, I'm not really known. It doesn't really matter. It's, um, uh, so I, because I, I did note on the uh, 5th of October 2020 uh, a note from the EPA where Flinders Mine Limited was removed as the entity responsible for the operation of the, 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 the uh, environmental approval of the mine, and PIOP Mine Co NL 
is the legal entity that is now responsible for the proposal, that, and that's the mining proposal. So I think we've got to the point that we understand that uh, something of a joint venture, PIOP, PIOP Mine Co NL, and I think pretty certain PIOP stands for Pilbara Iron Ore Project, yes. Mine Co NL is, is now the legal entity that will operate the mine, uh, substantially owned by TIO, uh, which is the, the Todd Family Corporation from New Zealand. Uh, and TIO also has 93.5% um, shareholders of both of BGIG, uh, the Balabala Industry Group, and then that's the, with subsidiaries, one for the port and one for the rail line. So, so we've got that. I think we've got that sorted out, Chair, uh, and I'm very pleased with that. Uh, so we understand precisely who owns what, and it becomes obvious at that point, which brings me probably to the the whole the whole point of this bit of the discussion, uh, that TIO are obviously then. The, the most important negotiators for finance for the port, the rail and the mines themselves. Now, uh, I understand, and it was, it was mentioned even back as far as 2017, um, that uh, TIO was seeking to find that financing out of China, which is not unusual. Uh, uh, and they had negotiations in particular with uh, China State Construction Engineering Corporation, which uh, I assume, I understand to be uh, a Chinese government entity. Uh, and again, that's not unusual in, in the economics of China. So um, that's obviously the place then. So we, we, come to the, we come to the crux, Chair, and that is that obviously my understanding would be that TIO, TIO will need to negotiate significant investment out of China, presumably through the China State Construction and Engineering Corporation, if, if not other Chinese investment. Uh, and again, Minister, you may not, it's, it's a commercial entity, so you may well not have an answer to this. Um, well, well, whether it is or not doesn't really matter, to be honest. We could, you know. Uh, that you know, I think it is, but it doesn't matter. That's not the question. The, the, the question is then that because final investment decision is such a critical component of this, and those negotiations are happening with the um, uh, Chinese corporations, my, my question is: is that in order to get this project up, is the government assisting um, the company at all in terms of relationships? With China, I mean, I, I think in the 2017 debate, you said that you had met with some uh, the executives of the Chinese company. Um, have, have you met with? Has anyone? Have you met with them since? Has any government member met with them since to attempt to facilitate this this investment decision? Because when we get down to the 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 the, pot, the bottom of this slightly involved set of tunnels, we've just gone down. The critical question now is, is this, is this company, TIO, based in New Zealand, going to be able to access five or six billion dollars worth of um, capital that it will need to set up this entire project? Because there's no point in doing any one of the three pieces without doing all those three pieces together. There's no point in doing mines without rail and port, rail without mines and port, or port without the other two. So uh, is the government engaged at all in attempting to facilitate this? And if it is, can you tell us what that engagement might be? Minister. Um, traditionally, government uh, does provide support, and this has been done uh, for decades in West Australia, is indeed entering into these state agreements. So it's entering into the state agreements that becomes uh, an important vehicle uh, for these companies uh, to be able to uh, get uh, the multi-billion dollars of, uh, of investment, uh, usually offshore, that is necessary to make these projects work. Like the um, and you know, Andrew Forrest talks uh, very clearly about that. Had uh, had we not entered into a state agreement uh, with them, he would never have been able to organise 
uh, to get the finance. You need to have something around which obtaining finance of this scale uh, can coalesce. So, you know, our, we have uh, made, and obviously, we, um, JETSI, our friends in JETSI, they get lots of carpet baggers. We sometimes have disagreements about who's a carpet bagger and who's not. Um, uh, but uh, they uh, make an assessment, they look at the, uh, the financial credibility, the skills. Um, and uh, of, uh, of the proponents and, uh, and the coherence generally of a project and make a determination as to whether or not this is worth supporting, and these are judgment calls that are made, uh, whether or not this is worth supporting because this gives us the prospect of, of, um, of development. Um, and, and the way that the whole agreement is structured is that, and, and certainly early on in the process, as I have said, um, that I had, uh, I had met with some of the investors, people looking for assurance that you know, our government uh, was uh, supporting, uh, supporting this project. But fundamentally, this is the job of these people. They've got to get, they've got to go out there and raise the money. That's what they do. We don't go out, and we didn't go out there and raise money for Andrew Forrest or for anyone else or for uh, Vickers Rampal. They've got to go out and raise that, um, they've got to go out and raise that money themselves. What the state does, what the state does is give some assurance that this is not a mirage, that this is, uh, should the finance be forthcoming, that this is actually a real project uh, that is um, that is actually supported uh, uh, by the um, by the by the government, and it has some. So you know, because that's always a thing. You're going in there. You're pitching for. Uh, five billion dollars, um, you need to show that um, the amount of due diligence that goes on um, for, a, uh, for a banking entity or a private equity entity to make that decision. They want a fair amount of security that this thing is actually likely to happen. So that is why this agreement is structured in the way that it is. Um, that um, it uh, sets out what all the terms of the arrangement uh, uh, is, um, what all the what the arrangement is, um, but that you don't actually it doesn't come to life until you've got your finance. And we've set that out. We've read those parts of the act. Are this is the um, this is the part of the. Um, uh, yeah, the, this, this is um, uh, if you get the finance and if you are able to get all those other approvals, this is what the project's going to look like, and the government supports it in principle. We're not; it's not our job uh, to go out there and uh, actively raise the um, actively raise the finance. A leader of the opposition. No, I'm just suggesting the government should, and I'm certainly not suggesting the government should invest uh, taxpayers' dollars in it either. So um, I, I think that's quite uh, inappropriate. But, however, uh, just before I get on to a couple of final points, uh, can I just check uh, the railway is under an agreement act. Are there any agreement acts that cover the mine and the port? Minister? So the, um, the the tenements and the mine itself. So this this has been an evolution. You know the original state agreements were lock, stock, and barrel, uh, and then with uh, uh, they contracted a bit with uh, uh, I think um, FMG contracted further with Roy Hill, and this is pretty much in the same um, style. Sorry, same vein as Roy Hill, where. 
Uh, the tenements come under the regime of the Mines, uh, Mines, Act, Mines Act. Uh, the port is uh, negotiated with the uh, Port Authority, uh, and it's only the rail that is the subject of the state agreement. But there's, so there's not certain state agreements for any of the other two? No. Okay, come on. Leader of the Opposition. Chair. Um, okay, so I think we're nearly done. Um, I just raised this that was brought to my attention just uh, recently. You probably won't be aware of it and apologise for the last minute uh, component of it. Hopefully your advisers are. Uh, on, the, um, on the 9th of June this year, a um, couple of months ago, uh, Flinders Mining Limited uh, posted a statement to the uh, ASX uh, where it advised that it expected there would be a shortfall from project expenditure for the first year ending 2nd of September 21 under the terms of their farming agreement that requires BBIG to procure a minimum annual spend on the feasibility study of $15 million. Um, BBIG has agreed to contribute $2 million of that predicted shortfall uh, to the overall project, which is PI, well, to the mine component, which is PIOP, Mine Co NL, as we discussed before, as a shortfall advance. Uh, now, I understand that I don't know whether there's been agreement to that uh, from. Uh, PIOP Mine Co NL, or whether the uh, Flinders Mine, Flinders Mines Limited, um, have agreed to that. But given they're all effectively owned majority shareholders by the same company, I'm assuming that that's um, agreed. Although the minority shareholders might not necessarily think so. Um, I'm you may not be in a position, and I'm happy if not. I'm happy to give you a copy of the actual statement to the ASX. Um, I'm assuming then, but because what that indicates to me is not some smoking gun or some great disaster at the hands of the government, but perhaps simply that the project has struggled to proceed because of the issues around obtaining finance. Um, if you're in a position to indicate whether anybody within um, government has had a look at this and decided that, in effect, that the $15 million because the project isn't proceeding beyond where it's got to in terms of its approvals, uh, it would make sense that they wouldn't need to spend $15 million doing further approvals. They would be waiting for that financial tick off. If you're in a position to make a comment on that and tell us whether that's the case, that would be useful. Minister. Minister look, it's not our, uh, our role to micromanage these projects. We don't have dozens of other people queuing up and saying, oh gosh, we want to build a railway. Uh, out there into uh, into the Dampier uh, Dampier Port, uh, so you know, our only role would obviously be to consider opportunity cost. We've got this deal that uh, ha is there. It's up to them to do all of the work uh, that is involved, that is necessary to get them into the position where they have got the finance. Now, all that we've said, and I think quite reasonably in light of COVID, and obviously, uh, and I know COVID is uh, used by many people as, uh, as an excuse where it's not possible to see the connection with COVID, but in this case, it's pretty tangible. I mean, the inability to, uh, to travel um, and uh, to uh, cement those uh, finance arrangements, I think, is... Um, is pretty clear that uh, these sorts of things, uh, these sorts of arrangements are, are complex, that uh, not, uh, don't lend themselves profitably to uh, Zoom negotiations always. So um, we've given them the extension. We're not micromanaging how they operate their uh, business. Now, there are ASX requirements uh, around disclosure, and one needs to make statements to ASX. Um, uh, to ensure that, the, uh, that all parties, that there's no um, improper trading uh, or no uh, uh, unduly advantageous market positions uh, taken by people in the know. So it's not our business and we're not, uh, you know, we're leaving this company to do this. We've negotiated an extension of time for them to bring this whole thing together. Um, if they can't do it, they can't do it. Now, whether or not we decide uh, that it's worth extending this again, or whether you know this is uh, this um, horse is not going to race, 
uh, you know, will be a decision that will be made at that time. But it, it would be a, a completely, you know, there's nothing in that announcement or any of these other issues that have arisen uh, that tell us that we're dealing with entities that um, uh, are not of uh, commercial merit. Uh, we do note um, that uh, there has been a, a statement made by Todd Corporation that in relation to the, uh, the final decisions by Flinders, uh, that the, uh, the Todd directors will not um, be present, will not participate in that board decision, so they're clearly um, being very mindful of the um, uh, very mindful of the uh, concerns of the uh, minority shareholders. But you know, if you're if you're a minority shareholder in Flinders, what's going to be your best option for getting that ore out? There isn't anyone else there, and there's no one there with a zeppelin, you know, ready to take it over. Uh, into uh, in, into Carafa, so uh, into Dampier. Um, well, that's right. Well, you know, without a rail, that's a bit even with our fabulous um, uh, Red Dog Highway. It's um, going to be a challenge without a without a railway. Um, so, uh, you know, we we are dealing with a uh, a, a sophisticated entity here. Um, they will have their uh, their travails. Um, and we have given them uh, an opportunity in extension, and uh, time will tell if they are able in this environment to secure funding. But I would, uh, I would suggest that if you can't secure funding in this environment, it might be difficult ever to get funding to get those, uh, those assets uh, railed out of, uh, of that region. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I might just make this make my final contribution, uh, and perhaps in lieu of the third reading speech that we may not need then at that point. Um, so I actually agree with lots of the minister, uh, what the minister has said. Uh, obviously, we don't we don't want um, the government is not responsible ultimately for those financial decisions and shouldn't be. Um, we've seen that go wrong before. We don't want another petrochemical plant um, issue. Uh, uh, Carnegie Energy, so we, we don't want we don't we don't want any we don't want more of those um, coming back. So um, it's, ab it's absolutely the case that uh, government should be government should be uh, at hands at some distance to this. So so that's quite right. Uh, I do have some sympathy for the uh, smaller shareholders uh, in that they hold a share of an asset that that the world has wanted for some period of time. I do know. Chair, that there was an interesting article in the West Australia today where uh, another expert is predicting the decline of iron ore prices back to its long-term normal run. I don't call it a crash. That would make you happy. You've been in happiness for the last, oh, last oh, four years I've because been, we've been I've concerned. Been with you. I've, been, I've been asking you what you've been doing with the iron ore, iron ore boom that you've, you've inherited. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's what I've been doing. I've been doing it regularly, and I, I make no apologies for that. In fact, let's, it's, it's a Thursday, Chair, today, so let's, 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 it being a Thursday fun question day, let's see, let's see what questions come out today. Might, might be interesting. But, um, look, it is absolutely the case that uh, for those, whether, whether you're the major shareholder or the minor, minor shareholders of that own uh, a component of that iron ore, as the Minister has just told us, there are limited options on how you can get those out. Uh, I think we've done a pretty good job today of, of, of identifying precisely who is needed to make those decisions and what those decisions look like. Uh, it is there aren't, as the minister herself has said, um, there aren't people necessarily lining up with alternatives for this. So, uh, if if that iron ore is going to be got out, uh, it'll need to be railed out, and it'll be it'll this project will need to proceed. I do have sympathy for the, both the minority and majority shareholders in that it is a difficult environment to operate. I'm, I'm saddened that I guess they weren't able to take advantage of the 220 US dollar a tonne iron ore prices that uh, have been experienced now for some period of time. Even the uh, you know above 90 US dollars a tonne that started in February 2019. Um, my prediction is still that there's some money to be made in the next year or two in terms of iron ore before we see that correction, although uh, I'm beginning to look like an optimist compared to some of the others uh, in the iron ore sector who are thinking that it might 
uh, progress back to its more normal long-term run uh, much more quickly. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that it will be at the sort of 130 to 150 US dollars a tonne at the end of this year, uh, and back to under 100 US dollars a tonne the end of next year. And by the time we get to um, the next elect or the year after that, we'll be back to that. Uh, we may well back to the long-term run of 70, 75 US dollars a tonne. Um, I know banks that are saying it'll be 100 US dollars a ton the end of this year, and we'll go under 70 US dollars a ton in a, in a year after that. So the opportunity, unfortunately, hasn't hasn't been grabbed at the most uh, fortuitous and opportune time. And that's as much as I'd love to blame the government for that. That's not the government's fault. Um, so I fully accept that the government is supportive of this project. Um, hopefully, they're on top of it as much as they can be. Uh, we like to think that the uh, Department of State Development in particular is right across these things. I'm not, having, having been around a while now, I'm not convinced that it's always the case, um, but hopefully they will be, they'll be watching this carefully. And uh, obviously, I don't think there's a person in the House that doesn't think that this is a project worthy of support, that it should not proceed. Uh, and so I just go on to finish with the opposition obviously uh, supports the bill. Uh, it supports the project. Uh, we hope dearly that the proponents, ultimately somewhat unified, as we've discovered, can find the funds available to them, uh, whether it be from China or elsewhere, uh, can get that done. Uh, otherwise, if they can't, they, both they and the minor shareholders are sitting on a stranded asset which will do nobody any good in the long term. So we support the bill. I thank the minister. It's been a fairly tortuous examination to find out who owns what, um, but uh, I appreciate the goodwill in which the debate's been conducted, uh, and I, as you do, commend the bill to the House. Uh, Honourable Member, do you or any members of the opposition intend to ask any questions in relation to any of the other clauses of this bill? Uh, sorry, Chair, I gave an indication I'll try and deal with all these issues in the clause one debate, because in the interest of time, the opposition is, as always, here to help. Thank you. Uh, the question is that clauses one through seven just one. Clause one, just clause one. stands as printed. Yep. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against, no. And I think the ayes have it. I'll do two to seven. Two to oh, seven. Okay. Uh, the question is that um, that clause two through seven stand as printed. All of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against, no. And I think the ayes have it. Schedule two. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh no, just insert. Just seven clauses. Okay. Uh, will this be the title of the bill? Sorry? The question is that this, that this be the title of the bill. Uh, the question is that this be the title of the bill. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Any against say no. And I think the ayes have it. Okay. Minister. Minister. I you report. The bill to the House. A report the bill to the House. Uh, the question is uh, now uh, report the bill uh, to the House. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. And I think the ayes have it. I move the report be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those to contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those to the contrary say no. 
think the ayes have it. Railway BBI Rail Oz Pity Limited Agreement Amendment Bill 2021, third reading. Is that fine? I have received from the um, Deputy Chair of Committees a certificate in writing that this is a true copy of the bill as agreed to in the Committee of the Whole of the House and reported. And the question is that the bill. That's the volume. Oh, we're in that. Sorry. <laughs> so we move to orders of the day, number. Oh, so we move to orders of the day, um, number 20. All of those of that opinion say, do no. I have to do that? No. Nope. Uh, the move to orders of the day 20, Financial Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. I'm, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Acting President. It's obvious that the members today haven't heard enough of my dulcet tones um, and, need, and, and need, require another dose. So let's um, move on to a particularly important piece of legislation, the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. And it might seem like the, uh, only, only the economic tragics uh, and the financially uh, focused would take much interest in this bill. But can I say at the outset that, is that that's you, is it? Uh, yeah, we won't divide on that, Member. We might, might be the first time you lose. Um, the, um, the, uh, the importance of this bill can't really be under, under, overstated, Acting President. And the reason for that is this. I mean, there's a very good report that came down uh, last year in the last parliament uh, talking about uh, procurement processes uh, and the need to make sure that procurement is done well. And it was a, a report, I think, of the previous uh, Joint Standing Committee on Triple C. Uh, but there are also other reports that have come down uh, that suggests that financial management needs to be improved. Now, it's always the case that you can improve financial management, but there have been a number of significant warnings, in my view, over the last uh, year or two in particular. Now, I know they're not popular necessarily, but uh, I would recommend to all members that uh, attending briefings from the Auditor General's office is a very useful tool. Uh, and I go to as many of them as I can, uh, and I'm one of those tragics. And it's not just, uh, as my friend the Honourable Yorn Shipman might suggest, for the sausage rolls and free orange juice. Um, it's actually because that they are they are very useful tools, and the Auditor General's office uh, does excellent work. And over the last 12 months, it has come up with a number of reports that have called for the tightening of procedures around things like procurement. About IT, around IT safety, and if you and um, and other management of government departments, uh, the most recent one I think was the one on uh, exiting of public servants and whether the processes around exiting were safe and secure, whether they were had their passes divested and passwords and access to computer systems removed, and in almost all of those reports. There have been highlighted deficiencies, and this is this is a very long-term trend, in my view, of government that uh, we need to have far better oversight of the finances of Western Australia because we manage them on behalf of the taxpayers of Western Australia, the people of Western Australia, and the community. And there is there is significant room for improvement, as highlighted uh, by the Auditor General. Uh, to the point that if you don't take a strong and, and significant view of that sort of oversight, uh, you find yourself in the situation, as we did, where a member of one department uh, by the name of uh, Patrick White managed to squirrel away $25 million of taxpayers' money. Paul, sorry, Paul White. Sorry, not Patrick White. Paul White. So $25 million across, it, it, it will no doubt be said, uh, a number of governments. Acting President. So, um, you know, as much as again, I'd like to say that everything with the situation we find ourselves in is entirely the fault of the the current incumbent government. This is a this is a very long-term issue in which improvement is required. When a, when a public servant manages to to pick up 25 million dollars, apparently, allegedly, 
uh, of, of state money, there is, there is obviously uh, significant issues around oversight. And the bill before the House today is a first step towards picking up some of that oversight, Acting President. It is obviously not the be all and end all. It doesn't contain all of the answers. Uh, in this circumstance, it may not have um, prevented Mr White from the activities that he's accused of, but it, it, it is an acknowledgement that things can be made better. Uh, and some of the things in this bill are things that would seem obvious. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it would be obvious you would think that government departments would be restricted to their budgets. If you ask the average person in the street how a government department would work, you, I think you would get the answer that the, uh, the government uh, seeks from the parliament funding, it, it appoints an expenditure level and departments stick to that level. So for those who are avid readers of this bill, they're probably surprised to understand that we're now introducing a piece of legislation after so many years of government in Western Australia to require departments to do precisely that. I, I would have thought it might have been obvious that that was a requirement. Now, um, the bill before the House is, is a reflection of two reviews. Uh, one, I think, in 2012 and one later on in 2017 that made very similar recommendations. Uh, so there's, there's um, you know, nearly a decade's worth of history in, in this recognition that improvement should be made. Uh, and I'm sure that somebody might like to cast aspersions that the previous government uh, didn't, didn't get their bill in place. Uh, I'm sure they were working along those lines and I suspect um, that the current government is using some of the work of the 2012 review as much as it's using some of the work of the 2017 review uh, in the bill that, for which we're presented. So the bill is focused, I guess, on what the government calls it, uh, the, those two separate areas uh, that it wants to focus on. Uh, so um, greater accountability uh, and then sort of greater efficiency. And the bill, I think, goes some way certainly towards greater accountability uh, and has the potential to deliver some significant efficiencies depending on its own impl implementation. So uh, I, I, I start today by uh, telling the House that the opposition will be supporting the bill because it is a good first step in greater accountability in the Government of Western Australia. Uh, and I think it will manage, it will manage some of those things. Um, now, uh, some of the key themes of the, uh, 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 the bill uh, address issues that have been brought to, brought to light by um, a series of reviews. So service priority review, um, uh, the review that I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Red Flags, Red Faces report on public procurement, which was an excellent report uh, released under the previous parliament. And it um, will hopefully provide increased responsibility and accountability uh, in government departments in particular. And as I say, I would have thought that most people, most members of Western Australia, uh, would have thought that that already existed. So, you know, it's, it's, it surprises most people to think that it doesn't. Uh, but let's look at some of the uh, more important parts of the bill. Um, and I'll probably get into a, a little bit more detail uh, when we resume uh, after, a, after a short break. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Minister, so I, did, I did indicate that the opposition will be supporting the bill. Um, oh, excellent. Oh, hopefully, word for word. I hope she does shorthand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. See. Uh, yeah. Do you make any reference to the Honourable Dr. C. Thomas in a complimentary sense in that? No, just. Members. I'll, 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 I'll take the fact to use my first name as well as the surname as a compliment. Members, noting the time, I'll leave the chair until the ringing of the bells. Thank you. Members, the Acting President.
Uh, Honourable Members, the question is that the bill be read a second time. I give the call to the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Acting President. Uh, we were we just begun our foray into this very important piece of legislation, the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill uh, 2021. So uh, we've done sort of a brief overview thus far of, of some of the things in the bill, and it's uh, time, I think, to get into uh, some of the issues of substance um, that we need to address. Now, uh, I'll start in the, the original area in terms of um, what the government are calling governance and accountability. Uh, and it's both in the explanatory memorandum and I think in the second reading speech um, that some of the things the department will, once the, on the passing of this legislation, be required to do that uh, rather astoundingly they don't do at the moment. Uh, for, one of the, for one of those things, um, uh, this legislation will make it uh, le a legality that an agency or a department uh, must operate with their, within their approved expense limit. Now, if you if you ask the public generally whether that would, was happening in government, you'd make the assumption that, of course, uh, as I said earlier, government uh, sets a budget through the budget process, parliament approves it, and government departments and entities are therefore restricted by that. Uh, but I can tell you I've had some experience where that is not necessarily the case. And... Um, well, I, just, well I, I can't tell you what, Minister. I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I can't tell you what happened under Mr. Barnett as a Minister or Premier because I wasn't in Parliament for any of those periods of time. So I'll have to take your word. Um, well, perhaps I'll. Perhaps, you, perhaps you're expecting me to take your word on that, but I, um, I, I'm not necessarily going to accept it as uh, as, as uh, LAW law. But um, it is absolutely the case that. Uh, departments and even sections within departments have long had a principle uh, of spend first and apologise second. In fact, you could probably apply in some cases that old principle of uh, it, it's, it, it's better to apologise afterwards than seek permission in advance. Uh, and there have been, absolutely been departments and parts of departments in the past that have pre previously op operated under those circumstances. And I, I will. Uh, in my role as uh, involved in health planning throughout the South West in the 1990s, uh, I knew this to be the case uh, effectively rubber stamped by a department. So we had a, we had an, a, a unit, and in those days, uh, Acting President, we had uh, health boards installed by uh, the previous court government, uh, the Richard Court government, and there were hospitals within that health system in the 1990s that I dealt with that took the view that they would expend whatever amount of money they thought was appropriate to expend, and if their budget was uh, exhausted before the end of the financial year, well, that would be the problem of the health department uh, to increase their budget. Now, uh, I would have said it's also the case that I think the health department at the time fully understood the principles in place uh, at the unit and would go forward and, and effectively rubber stamp it and then take it to the government to say, well, you know, you, your choice as a government is therefore that you will increase the expenditure uh, and reward the behaviour or you will uh, uh, face the political backlash of suddenly, for example, a, a regional hospital closing down its surgery for the last six weeks of a financial year and blame the government because it ran out of money. So um, those things did exist. So it's astounding to think that a government department could effectively hold a government and a minister to ransom, but that's exactly what used to happen on occasions. Uh, and um, you would, the argument would be that a strong minister would not allow that to happen. And I, I would have thought if you were a strong minister under those circumstances, uh, you might be asking your director general to seek alternative employment. Uh, and we know it's not easy to get rid of a director general, and perhaps, perhaps we should do it a bit more often just to keep everybody on their toes. Um, I'll see if I'll make it to my car at the end of the night, having said that, uh, Acting President. But, um, you know, I, it's, sometimes I think that uh, uh, we are a little complacent around the performance of the senior executive service of the public service of this state. So uh, it, was, it has absolutely been the case for a long period of time that some areas of government, some areas of the public service have viewed their budget as... Um, 
uh, as sacrosanct and something over which they themselves exert control and can use it a pressure point as uh, uh, on, on Parliament. And you know, for those for those who use the uh, the Bible of, of politics, um, which is not the practice, but yes, Minister. Um, they, they probably remember Sir Humphrey at some point describing the fact that the role of a minister um, is to publicly defend the department and fight and fight for its budget. Um, and uh, that, you know, some, sometimes there is truth in fiction, acting president. And, and I'm sure that there are some sections of the uh, of the public service, both in in that country uh, and this, to think that that is the role. So it's rather astounding to think that there would be departments out there that would not uh, stay within its budget. Uh, and in leading on from that, it is also remarkably astounding to think that there might be um, heads of department uh, as a part of that process who, if their expenditure levels were likely or, or almost certainly going to exceed the amount given to it by government, would not notify the minister of an impending shortfall. Now, I don't know personally whether this is this has happened, so I, I can't say that I'm aware of a minister who was facing an impending shortfall that was not notified. I would have thought um, that 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 act by a senior public servant might perhaps uh, go past um, the the level of, of of being asked to find alternative employment, um, and would be something you'd you'd probably want to refer to a prosecution, perhaps. Uh, I, I think that's a significantly uh, higher offence. But it's also the case that the current Financial Management Act does not require, as it doesn't require um, the department and the head of the department to live within its means, uh, it does not require specifically the head of the department to notify the minister and therefore the government that it's not doing so. Uh, and again, I would have thought if you asked most people in the street in Western Australia, whether they thought that was a reasonable outcome or if they would be surprised if it existed, I think they'd be astounded. Uh, that uh, we, the, that we, we the, the government uh, and the parliament don't have the level of authority and control that, that um, people think that we do. So th these are good changes. I mean, I, I, and I say they, they were no doubt recommended in 2012 and 2017. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's absolutely about time. It's, it's astounding to think um, that they're not already in place. Uh, and how, how, can we, how can we suggest, I mean, we, we will, some of us think obviously that governments should live within their means. If we don't apply that rule uh, within government to government departments, I, I think we, we have a huge double standard. So uh, th those are a couple of particularly important parts that, I mean, I, in my view, shouldn't, shouldn't need <laughs> shouldn't necessarily need legislation because it should have been in place from day one. Um, but those are good bits that I think are absolutely worthy of support. Because it's absolutely the case. I mean, I, I've, I'm not aware of a, a senior public servant um, who has uh, been shuffled out for, for budgetary controls, but it's certainly the case that ministers uh, are held to account. Now, perhaps the argument might be that uh, we've, we've, we've lost a degree of ministerial responsibility, uh, and I think that's probably true. I think the standard that we as my members of parliament, and ministers in particular, have been held to uh, was higher when I first got involved in the political system 20 years ago than it is now, uh, and I think that's sad. Uh, I think that we need to be demonstrating the, the highest of integrity uh, and I think we need to be held to that standard. And I think, therefore, that gives us the capacity to hold uh, the senior public service to the same high and exacting standards. I, I think that has slipped, unfortunately. But this is, a, this is absolutely um, a step in the right direction, because at that point, therefore, uh, first off, you're required to stay within your budget. Uh, if you see something impending that says that your ability to stay within your budget has, has, has diminished or gone, you obviously should be notifying your minister. Your minister will have a conversation uh, with, with Treasury and perhaps and, and or Cabinet, well definitely the Treasurer, perhaps also Cabinet, uh, and uh, steps will therefore be taken. And uh, I think we, sh we, we should have seen that um, a long time ago. Uh, it will also, and this might be perhaps uh, one of the more contentious issues, uh, the bill will require, require the accountable authorities, generally 
uh, in this case referring to government departments, um, to ensure that they comply with state government policies in relation to financial management. Now, again, uh, there's a separate set of rules for most government trading enterprises in that their legislation tends to require them to be uh, compliant. Uh, and that legislation sometimes is tested uh, when ministers give directions to government trading enterprises. Uh, governments, as I understand, and we will do this when we get to the, to the committee stage of the bill, uh, can give directions to... Yeah, sorry, Minister. Um, I'll get your hopes up there for a minute. Um, but, uh, you know, government ministers can ultimately give directions to departmental heads, but it's a very long uh, and involved process. And, um, you know, what you need to remember the departmental heads have generally got to the heads of their department by being particularly good at the, uh, the public service system. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean, mean, mean that they are uh, particularly uh, compliant to, to the, uh, the policies of the government of the day. It means they're very good uh, at working through the public service system. So, and of course, you know, I, that doesn't, I don't see that changing very much because the people who've got to the top of the public service got there under the current system. I, I, just as an aside, uh, Acting President, um, we have always spoken about the need to bring in uh, good people from outside the public service on occasions. And I know previous governments, uh, particularly probably the Conservative side of politics, has always talked about, you know, let's, let's get the best and brightest from outside government and bring them in. Uh, and to be honest, uh, with all the best intent of the world, I've never actually seen that uh, happen in any significant way. And I suspect it doesn't happen because the, uh, the appointments process is managed by the public service, within the public service. Uh, and the, the people who have achieved the uh, top of the public service, I suspect, uh, have no vested interest in, in people from outside coming in. Uh, they have... Um, they don't want to have people from outside coming in who are, who are problematic, who can't do the job. But probably more importantly, they don't want to bring people from outside the public service in who can do the job and are efficient, uh, because that potentially doesn't reflect well on the public service. Uh, so, um, oh, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's probably, I'll take that. I'll take that, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, sorry. So I tracked with that. Um, so the, the capacity to, um, uh, for the government to hold the department to account to government policy, I think, is actually important. Now, the risk, of course, is that a government may be asking a department to uh, support and uphold policies with which they disagree and ultimately, more importantly, with which the community disagrees. Uh, and I do understand that. that. On occasions, government policy is bad, uh, in the same way that on occasions public service policy is bad as well. Uh, it's not always good. It's not always bad. Uh, it's generally, generally better than it is worse. But uh, the reality is that this applies simple uh, uh, control in that the accountable entity in the end will be government and the community has the capacity to hold government to account every four years. And, and for me, that, that, is, that reinforces that this is a, a clause and a part of the bill that is worthy of support. I mean, I don't, I don't know too many um, public servants who apply, reapply for their job every four years, um, whereas the members of the chamber, even, even one who has reached the lofty heights, uh, as the minister has, um, still, still has to reapply for his job uh, every four years and is at risk of having his job uh, shifted in the meantime. Um, so I must admit, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you did to get the, the current portfolios because they gave you some very tough ones. So you, you must have offended somebody in the... Well, OK, you go, they, gave you some, they gave you some toughies. Uh, so, yeah, not... Yeah, yeah, those, they've made it hard for him. They've given him some tough portfolios. I, he must have... It must, it, must be, it must be the fact that you work very hard to give the opposition uh, fulsome and accurate answers in Parliament, I suspect. Probably but, payback. Yeah, no. so it's probably payback. Always up for a challenge, honourable member. Yeah, uh, yes. You know, it's, it's a vicious game, politics, isn't it? Um, so it is, it is um, absolutely the case, uh, Acting President, that uh, government, government departments should be required to comply with government policy. Uh, and 
If that government policy is bad, then it's up to the opposition to point that out, hold the government to account uh, and convince the community at the next election that this government uh, and its policy should be removed, uh, an act that I'm doing my very best uh, to, to fulfil as soon as possible. Uh, well, I certainly do. I certainly do, Minister. Uh, OK. So that, that is another sound section, a good section of this particular bill, and I think one that is well overdue. Um, now, the next, the next part of the bill is also very important, and this reflects back on things I've said earlier around um, procurement in particular, and the report of the Joint Standing Committee on the Triple C on procurement, that is, uh, this bill will make sure that there are uh, more formalised and accountable uh, oversight of the expenditure of state government money. And again, I think that's a very good thing. The risk, the risk always in this, and again, we'll probably get to this in the, in the uh, committee stages of the bill, um, it gets hard at the end when you get oversight of oversight of oversight, and I understand that. You know, you, 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 who's watching the watchers who are watching the watchers is the hard part. But in this case, I think this bill strikes a reasonable balance, uh, and it has actually picked up on some of the recommendations of the Auditor-General, in my view, and particularly those of the la this year and last year, where the Auditor-General has raised concerns about the oversight of the expenditure of government money. So, uh, obviously, when you have the sort of examples that we've mentioned earlier uh, and significant risk factors, uh, some of those um, uh, improvements in the, in the framework of delegations and authorisations are particularly important. I mean, even things as simple as not having the same person uh, approve an expenditure and review an expenditure uh, would seem a very simple thing. Um, but my understanding is that that's how many uh, people who misuse the public purse get away with what they get away with. They find themselves as the purchaser as a service, and then because of the, the, the position they find themselves in, they're also um, the, the, the head of the audit or the review of that particular purchase. And that's how, that's how you get away with significant fraud uh, against the people of Western Australia. So I think, again, that will be a, um, uh, a, a significant improvement. Um, uh, it will also improve, in theory, internal audit functions, uh, and I think that uh, will have to be... It's, it's, it's one of those suck-and-see situations where um, it will be in the implementation of the internal audit processes. What we see in the bill is the broad head of powers that'll, that will allow that to occur. Um, and it will also, as I understand, uh, give a greater role uh, f to the Department of Finance in, in assisting with that process, and I think that is also important. I mean, we don't necessarily want to get back to a centralisation argument, but um, having the best and the brightest in the public service, spreading that expertise around, I think, is also a very important process. So, uh, I, th I think that is, um, I think that is very good. Um, uh, some of the other things that the bill also uh, will do. The first is that it will change uh, the system of appropriations to allow for auto an increase in automatic appropriations. So we've gone to a, a, uh, a set election period, a fixed date election. Uh, now, generally, members will know that uh, the budget process, interestingly, starts for the next year, starts pretty quickly after the first budget's released in May, usually. Um, by, by this time of the year, in August, you're generally already in negotiations for departmental budgets for the next year. Uh, it's a fairly long involved process and it doesn't generally get finalised until about a month out from the next budget. So, um, for example, I would assume, and I don't imagine the Minister will tell us, but I would assume that Cabinet will be, will, will, if they haven't ticked off the budget, uh, the September budget in the last Cabinet meeting, I would well imagine they'll be ticking it off for the next Cabinet meeting, with an allowance for a small amount of change for emergencies um, going forward, you know, a quick fill-up in the mental health budget or something, for example. Um, so, uh, but as we go then to uh, fixed-term budgets, in a normal year it's not an issue. We have a May budget because it's a budget for the upcoming financial year, 1st of July to the, to the 30th of June. Uh, we have about a month period where Parliament goes through the process, uh, examines the budget, goes through the budget estimates process in both houses and approves the budget. Now, um, in theory, uh, if you don't have control of both houses, you can block the budget. It's, it's been used very rarely in the history of Australia. Um, 
Uh, there's a couple of notable exceptions to that, I think, somewhere in 1974-75, but um, outside of that, it's not a tool that you really want to use too much. But obviously then, when you shift to fixed elections and you, you have a March date, uh, a May budget becomes um, a little more problematic. I would imagine uh, in a year that you're... And I'm interested to see what the minister sort of thinks about... In a year that a government is retained, um, I would have thought that the capacity to bring that budget in faster than it seems to happen would be reasonable. So, uh, obviously, in the, the 2021 election, the Labor government was retained. I would have thought that budget work around departments would have still started at that same period of time, so it should have been really going on since August last year. Um, be interested to know, and you may not be in a position to tell us, but um, it would be interesting to know if government says at that stage, says to, says to departments, well, it's an election year next year, so we're not even going to start the budget process um, uh, um, not even, not even going to start the budget process and that, until that period of time. So uh, that, that would be interesting just to know that just the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a financial technical issue. But um, Acting President, before I continue, um, can I just acknowledge uh, some visitors we have here today, uh, the students, staff and parents of Bainton West Primary School upstairs. Uh, welcome, welcome to the Parliament of Western Australia. Uh, you're, in the, uh, you're in the Legislative Council, uh, which is the, 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 the less reported but far more important house uh, in the Parliament of Western Australia. And so um, we, we hope you enjoy your day here today. And I hope I pronounced the name right. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. Uh, sorry, that sidetracked me just a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, so, Minister, you may not be in a position to let us know, but if you could let us know whether in, in, a, in an upcoming election year, whether the, the departmental budgetary preparations still start back in August, or um, is it the case that you go, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen at the next election, we won't st actually start it until the, that decision is made. I would have thought you would have got prepared a bit earlier. And it's important for, and it's important for this reason, I guess, because... Um, we have, we've had a couple of late budgets. So this one will be in September, and I know Treasury in particular have a little heart failure. The later the budget goes, the more stressed they get. Um, last year's one was October. Uh, it was the COVID budget, and so it was back in October, and I know there was, um, you know, I, I think there was a, must have been a bit of stress leave having to be taken out of the, uh, the Department of Treasury. Um, so I would have thought the work might have started earlier, and then obviously if there's a change of government, you've actually got to then potentially start over but uh, I would have thought that Treasury in particular would have tried to get that budget back as early as possible. And in a retained government, you might decide that you can do it an August budget, for example. Uh, you know, the, election, the election's in uh, March, second Saturday in March. So you've got, you know, to April, May, June, July, August, September. It does it really take... It, it, is it deferred for that six-month period, basically, would be an interesting point to make up. Um, have, having said that, the opposition agrees that um, changing the legislation so that you don't have quite as many emergency appropriation bills uh, is a useful tool. Now, Acting President, I, I myself am very fond of a, an, an urgent appropriations bill. Uh, I have been known to make those speeches last uh, perhaps a little longer than the, uh, the new timeframes will allow. Only, only ever with good, with good intent and good purpose, though. Um, so, you know, op oppositions love appropriations bills. It's the opportunity to uh, digress far and wide on money the government is expending, uh, sometimes well and sometimes not so well. Uh, but I, I think we can uh, dispense with the number of appropriation bills uh, and do those things in other ways. So the opposition will support uh, the automatic extension of, uh, let's say, credit the capacity for the government to expend money prior to the approval of an appropriations bill. Because obviously, members, the Constitution requires expenditure of Parliament uh, to be approved. Uh, so we will be supporting that, and I will just have to uh, adapt and live with my restricted, my restricted opportunities to harangue the government, uh, as, sad, as sad as that might be. Uh, now, uh, Minister... Um, 
another significant section of the, the bill before us, uh, which is Division 4, which is the, the preparation of um, draft annual estimates uh, and it's Division 5 resource agreements. And I'm sure that we will spend a little bit of time in the committee stages because I'm interested to know uh, how the government envisages those, those particular uh, processes, particularly interacting. Uh, so obviously the, 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 the budget process, members, is that the, uh, the department will start looking at what it expended last year, what it's been committed to, start a negotiation through its minister and with Treasury and Finance uh, to work out what its budget should look like um, going forward. Uh, and then it's, um, uh, so it, it will de develop up a set of estimates and then it goes into a bun fight and a battle to try and work out whether uh, the ambit claims of various ministers should be supported or rejected. Um, Experience would tell us that not too many are supported, and re you know you, you normally expect a few rejection letters before you get an approval, um, uh, unless you, unless you're uh, probably on the expenditure review committee yourself, and then you might get a bit better run than everybody else. But uh, no, no, oh, that's a pity. <laughs> there you go. Sorry about that. Um, so. Uh, you'll have the process, and it will be far more formalised uh, than it would um, otherwise be. Um, so you will have the preparation of draft annual estimates, and in Division 4, when we get to that, um, you will see that there is a, a, a specific system that will be put in place uh, for that um, section. So uh, uh, Clause 10 of the bill goes through a new Division 4 um, that will formalise the draft annual estimates processes. Uh, and um, you then got clause 11, where you have a new resource agreements uh, uh, section. So we'll, we'll probably spend a little bit of time, Minister, in the in the committee stage of the bill, just looking at uh, the comparison between the two. How this, both how the new system of um, budget estimates and resource agreements differs from the previous, uh, and then how those two. Because basically, I would have thought one would lead almost directly into another. So the resources agreement's the one that the department signs off, and it's the one that one would assume it would be held to account to. It will send an expenditure limit. Um, it, will, it, it will be the one which will, will claim the head of a department if, if they don't do the things that are now introduced in the bill. But um, I would have thought that putting together the, the, the budget estimates would almost immediately you know, lead you to the, to the the look of the resource agreement. Um, any variation in that I'd be particularly interested in in the negotiating process uh, between the two, uh, because I suspect that um, you know they should they should look they should look remarkably similar. They should look like uh, I suspect that the uh, the estimates start with the the uh, ambit claim of the department, temp tempered by the oversight of the minister plus a few of the minister's ambit claims, um, that then goes through the, the, the ERC and um, Treasury process, paired, paired back to the bare minimum, and if you're unlucky, paired back a little bit further, um, which would then end up in a, a set of uh, budget estimates that would then be converted, presumably, almost directly into a resource agreement. Um, I'm also interested, Minister, in how much of that process might be made public. So um, some of those things will be um, uh, released. So the level to which resource agreements and um, uh, budget estimates, um, you know, much of which is confidential, but some of which might be ultimately become public, particularly the resource agreements, how much of those things become public would be, would be interesting to know. Um, <clears throat> Um, okay. Now there are a few other things that this uh, piece of legislation uh, will also do. Um, in relation to resource agreements, obviously this area is about modifying it, uh, which 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 would be completely normal. Um, uh, we've talked about the need to notify in terms of um, financial difficulty. Um, and my understanding is that most government trading enterprises already have clauses within their um, validating legislation that effectively apply that. Uh, so it is a completely appropriate 
uh, to, um, to allow that to happen. Um, okay. Uh, the next section that I wanted to have a, uh, a, um, uh, a discussion on, and again, we'll get to it in the committee stages, uh, it, this, this bill will uh, modify, allow the Treasurer uh, to modify what goes into um, key performance indicators that are ultimately reported in uh, annual reports and in the budget, in the budget process. Now, um, I am of the view, Minister, that the vast majority of KPIs applied to departments, whether it's in uh, their budget papers or within their annual reports, uh, are meaningless drivel. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how we got to the meaningless drivel level. Um, but for those tragics who read annual reports regularly, um, you know, they're, they're full of things that say, you know, of the what percentage of, of complaints did we get, did we process within seven working days or 14 working days, or, or almost nothing that reflects the efficiency of the department, uh, almost nothing that reflects the outcomes, certainly nothing that reflects generally negative outcomes. And we get to budget estimates processes, um, and I've been doing this for a lot of years now, both in, in both houses, here in the, the house that shall not be named. Um, and it makes no difference which house you're in. The, 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 you're dealing with the same set of meaningless KPIs for the most part. Uh, there is an absolute need to review how departments report their efficiencies and processes. And the KPIs that we get to examine... Um, I, I've sat there, Acting President, and asked, I remember asking questions of ministers, why, why, why has your KPI uh, of um, uh, the amount of time with which you restock the tea cabinet decreased from, from, from three days to 2.7 days? Uh, you know, ridiculous bits of information uh, sometimes end up getting ridiculous questions asked on them. Peter Collier has raised uh, in terms of KPIs, but I think you have. And certainly, the Honourable uh, Diane Evers, formerly the Honourable Diane Evers, constantly was a bugbear of hers. Sometimes the KPIs have, have borne little relevance to, to much, and it was a cumbersome process to actually change the KPI process. So, anyway, I think. Uh, no, no, I absolutely agree, Minister. Um, and I'm sure current ministers and former ministers would probably also agree that. Um, you know, all, all it, it, I've yet to see, I think, a KPI deliver a relevant debate um, in the estimates. Maybe, maybe there's one or two that I've missed. I've been in every every estimates process. Yeah, I'm sure probably have been. There, there possibly have been, and the ones that we missed that we weren't awake for. But you know, the the. Well, the, I think some of those ones where you've got approval processes and you have. Uh, target pr approvals to be done within a certain time frame. They're, they they're the better ones. Well, and, uh, but even those. So, so um, you get a KPI that says, all right, so you go, KPI, environmental approvals um, achieved within the, the, uh, the set government time frame. W what does a 5% variance on that mean? I mean, really, it, does, it doesn't tell you that the average time frame in approvals were X and um, you know, one, one, there was one very long one because this didn't work, or it, do, it and even to dig, and you get to the estimates, and often the full information's not there because because it's a, it's an estimate that that is meaningless and nobody nobody can be bothered researching it. So it, it it absolutely needs an overhaul. So the 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 head of power that exists, well, sorry, that exists in the bill that will that will exist in the act because both. The opposition and the and the government support the bill. Um, it's only that though. It's only a head of power, so it's only something that allows the treasurer to try and fix the problem. It doesn't require the treasurer to fix the problem. So we we are um, uh, in the hands of the treasurer to uh, to try and make sure that government department um, KPIs uh, become more meaningful. Uh, and I know it's hard to do in government because you don't necessarily want to give opposition uh, any more any more ammunition to use, um, and no minister ultimately wants um, to be to be held to account. But acting president, I go back to the Bible that I mentioned previously. Um, yes, minister, when I go, um, 
<laughs> the, op the opposition is not the opposition, they're just the opposition in waiting. It's the civil service that's the opposition in residence. Uh, and, and sometimes we just need to remember that um, eventually you swap sides and <coughs> ultimately um, it, it may always seem like we're opposing each other, but if you listen to the conversations around the chamber, uh, we're not, this is the second bill today where the opposition is in furious agreement with the, with the government. Um, and I think people would be surprised how often that actually occurs. Uh, but in this case, um, it's absolutely the case that the gov governments of both persuasions need to be better uh, at being, hold, being able to hold departments to account. So I'd be interested, Minister, you might be able to tell us how... I mean, I know generally government tries to set KPIs for departments. I'd be interested to know how often KPIs are set by departments for themselves or for other departments. Um, because obviously, if that's a part of the system as well, then that needs to be addressed. Uh, so, but it is absolutely the case that the the treasurer should have, must have, uh, a far greater capacity to make those KPIs far more meaningful. Um, it, it drives me absolutely mad. The, the two things that that I hate about annual reports are the fact that they've all turned into glossy covered brochures. There, there is much advertisement. I try to flick past all the advertising to get to the actual financial reports, uh, and the fact that the KPIs <laughs> it's aren't to keep an ordinary person interested. Though you need a bit of colour and movement in there to keep, you know. Oh, okay. I, I don't know how many. I like the uh, well, yeah, well, <laughs> that's probably all. Some, that's, that's probably all. That's probably all some people remember. I don't remember. That's probably all some people can, can actually understand. Um, but you know. I don't know how many members of the public are picking up annual reports, to be honest. Uh, but, um, you know, holy mackerel, they have, they, they have lost their relevancy. Well, yeah, it might be too. Well, look, it's, they, they have lost... Perhaps if we made annual reports uh, shorter, less glossy and to the point, um, then perhaps more people would take an interest in them. But we've, we've turned them into... You know, we're, they're, they're tabloid, not broadsheet, let me say that. Uh, and um, my view is that something needs to give on that because they are... They are they, and I know it's, it's, it's easy to go in government, we don't mind them being meaningless because we don't want to empower the opposition, but really, you know, one day you'll be back over here going, holy mackerel, that's driving you mad as well. So um, that, that potentially is a good thing depending on how the, uh, the treasurer of the day uh, deals with that. Um, but I'm very keen to see that particular, um, that particular part of this, partic this bit of legislation uh, amended. So that, that will be an excellent uh, process. Uh, now, there are a few other things in the, in the very limited time these days I have available uh, to, uh, to go through in the bill. Uh, and again, we'll go through in, in, in more detail when we get to the committee stages. But, um, <coughs> A couple of other things. Uh, it makes sense to me uh, that the government would be able to, or the Treasurer in particular, would be able to make um, movements in uh, various government accounts without necessarily impacting on debt. Now, there's also some risks involved in this, uh, that if a Treasurer was uh, of the mind uh, to, be, to manipulate uh, uh, economic outcomes, for example, and to shift money around, that this might make that, uh, him, that the Treasurer more able to do so. But I, uh, I, uh, I still think it's, a, it, it's worthy of support. So this section really uh, will allow to the Treasurer to shift money in and out of uh, debt accounts in particular. Um, I don't see... Th this might be different if interest rates were... official interest rate was 7 per cent, uh, and we're talking about getting uh, income back in uh, at a significantly higher level. But, um, I don't see the official interest rate shifting off 0.1 per cent for some period of time, uh, Acting President. I think that will take uh, some years. Uh, it makes sense in this circumstance to allow the Treasurer to, to take money off debt automatically without necessarily uh, going through a, a, an, a, an onerous process and then have an accounting mechanism that has to be written up effectively as debt anyway. So I, um, I, think that, I think that is a worthy component, although uh, we will need to watch that carefully. Uh, and, and again, we'll do it in committee, but Minister, um, the reporting process around that, you might, you might feel uh, moved to make some comments about the reporting process 
around that freedom that we will allow the Treasurer um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to engage in. Uh, now, another area, uh, Minister, that you will, will get to, um, uh, then there's a couple of these, um, and that is the, uh, uh, the schedule around uh, reporting, uh, where, we're, where we're reporting um, uh, um, the annual reports uh, and, um, uh, and also other, other bits that we're reporting uh, those to both Houses of Parliament. Now, I happen to note uh, one of the changes uh, that occurred in this, uh, where we delete the delivery of copies plural, and we now deliver copy singular. Um, so, um, now I'm not sure why somebody felt the, the, the need to um, restrict, potentially, the number of hard copies that might be delivered. I mean, is this is this a shift to um, the online environment where members will be asked to download those bits of information they want? I mean, I must admit, um, I'm getting on a bit now, and I'm a bit old-fashioned, and I like having a, a book in front of me where I can flick through the pages and read the read, read the pieces of data that I want to get to. But um, I, I just I was intrigued to know why we were switching from the delivery of copies plural to copies singular. Um, uh, yeah, so um, uh, I mean, I know, I know, I know, budgets are a bit tight, but I, I can't imagine that um, the printing out of a few annual reports is, is going to bust the bank, um, particularly not with the iron ore price where it is. <laughs> oh well, it, it might well be. Save a no, tree, sorry. perhaps. Could yeah, well, be. possibly, possibly. Yeah, you might get, you know. Make it out of hemp paper, then you're not, you know, you're probably okay. So there you go. Um, At least some of our honourable members would be happy with that. Well, well, yeah, I presume so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I presume, I presume so. Uh, but that, that's a different plant, a plant of a different character. Uh, so yeah, I'd be interested to know uh, specifically why, um, in a couple of places where, you know, we're delivering. Um, for example, a, a singular copy of an annual report. Uh, I mean, is that cost shifting? Where we assume that the, I mean, we know that the parliamentary budget um, is not all that huge. Um, if we uh, if we take some of the the maintenance issues around the place, for example, the roof. Um, so cost shifting the production of a few books. I mean, in the old days, um, honourable members, the state printer's office was just about a 24-hour event. Where you know so many so many booklets and papers and things and hansards and all the rest of it were, were pumped out consistently, and everybody got a hard copy of everything basically. And I know we've cut back significantly from that. We all get a hard copy of the budget, but gee, there's not many things where there's one one copy for every member um, anymore. So <coughs> I'm going to tell you, I knew someone that worked in the old um, uh, state printer's office, and they they were it was it was full on. So, but yeah, I'm interested to know why we're. We're down to a single copy, and you know, is it like a library? You just get a stamp, and you get it one at a time. Um, in which case, I put dibs on going first. Uh, okay, so um, uh, acting president, those are probably uh, most of the of the interesting things that I think are in the current piece of legislation. They. Uh, uh, there will be some. There will absolutely be uh, some improvements uh, in the way things operate. Some of the things we expect, you know, you, we, we take government on trust, um, but the um, uh, that's just. I think. I think that the the democratic process uh, pulls that back out. Um, there, now there is. Um, a proposal to extend the statutory review process of the Financial Management Act from five to ten years. Um, at one level, you'd think, what would you? What, why are we frightened of more frequent reviews of the Act? Um, I guess the reverse argument to that is that we've done two since the last changes to the Financial Management Act, and it's taken ten years anyway. Um, I, you know, we could we could have a look at the uh, what we now uh, on this side of the House respectfully call the Mission Amendment. Um, but I suspect that uh, there won't be anything in this bill that won't be proclaimed and acted upon in the next year. So I suspect we, we would be wasting our time 
uh, if we if we went with that. This is not one that I suspect is going to uh, languish languish on the shelves uh, before it's extended. Um, so, so in summary, Acting President, uh, as I say, the opposition will support the bill. Um, at this stage, I'm not intending to move any amendments. I don't know if the government's uh, got any at this point. Uh, this is a bill that is remarkably similar to the bill that was presented to the previous parliament. Uh, I did look through as a comparison, uh, uh, and I found, apart from the changing of a few dates, I found no difference effectively between the previous bill, which the opposition said it would support, uh, and the current bill. I, uh, to be honest, I don't remember whether the previous bill got through the lower house in the last <coughs> parliament. It may have done, but um, I know that I was, I was prepared and waiting for it in the upper house before we were diverted by other weighty matters that we, we had to address. Um, so it's not significantly different from the bill uh, that was presented to the previous parliament. It does reflect uh, the outcomes of the review of both a uh, 2012 review and a 2017 review. Uh, it gives the government more freedom to hold the public service to account. It did pass the lower house, thank you. Um, I knew I was, I was getting ready for it. I prepared for that speech much as I prepared for this speech. Um, it gives the government the opportunity for greater accountability uh, and greater oversight. But it will be up to the government in the implementation process to, to demonstrate that it's going to do precisely that. Um, we are happy to give the government the opportunity to demonstrate some strengths in this areas in these areas uh, greater oversight of departmental budgets um, to some degree greater control of the public service uh, in importantly in an open and accountable manner um, so the minister might like to address uh, the sort of disclosure that would occur in relation to a, a department that was going to exceed its budget, um, disclosures over uh, information um, that the government receives. Uh, it shouldn't be the case that oppositions have to wait until there's a disaster to know that there's a problem. So those disclosure mechanisms, I think, would also be useful if the minister could give us some indication, along with the disclosures around what will happen in both the uh, the budget, the uh, budget estimates um, processes, and the resource agreements processes. All of that would be useful information to have. But we give, you know, this this is a bill that's let's face it, perhaps a little overdue. Uh, most of the things in it appear to be very well intended. Uh, it will be the delivery that will be the question mark, uh, and we will watch carefully as opposition to, to make sure that that delivery uh, is done to a standard that we think is fitting. Uh, but we will, uh, at this stage, unamended, acting president, support the bill. Uh, thank you, honourable members. We are dealing with the financial legislation amendment bill 2021, and the question is: the bill be read a second time? And I give the floor to the Honourable Nick Garan. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill of 2021, uh, which I note uh, seeks to amend uh, three of the uh, statutes of Western Australia. The Financial Management Act of 2006, the Government Financial Responsibility Act of 2000 and the Loan Act of 2017. Now, it's claimed, Mr Acting President, by this government uh, that this bill will enhance governance and accountability. And in my view, judging on a number of reports from the Auditor-General, this is absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary. But there is such great potential for reform in this area, and yet this McGowan Labor government continues just to tinker around the edges. I'm appalled. I'm appalled, Acting President, that after the government have had effectively another two years to improve reforms, all they've done, as the Leader of the Opposition has just recounted to the House, is reintroduce a bill in essentially identical terms to the last parliament. Now, by my reckoning, 
This bill, or its predecessor in the 40th Parliament, was introduced on the 19th of March 2020. Now, inevitably, what's going to happen, as sure as night follows day, we're going to have a response from the government to say that since March last year we've been very busy with COVID-19. You can be sure of it. And whilst that is indeed true, the government, like every other government around the globe, has been busy dealing with COVID-19. You cannot tell me that the people responsible for the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill of 2020 were somehow seconded into dealing with contact tracing, breaches of the Safe WA app, data and the like, or somehow dealing with uh, uh, protective equipment for the uh, pandemic. The people that were responsible for this particular reform have had almost two years, two years, to enhance those reforms. And it would have been good if there had been some form of consultation with the Auditor-General. Now, that'll be the first question that gets asked, uh, Minister, in the event that you're unable to deal with it in your reply, is the extent to which the Auditor-General has been consulted with about this bill. Now, what I'm not asking is, have you consulted with the Auditor-General? I'm asking the extent to which the Auditor-General has been <coughs> consulted with regard to this bill, because there has been stacks and stacks of time. Now, I want to take members to some of the comments, some of the awkward comments for the government, for the McGowan Labor government, that come from the Auditor-General's reports. In particular, one of the more recent reports, the Audit Results Reports, Annual 2019-20 Financial Audits of State Government Entities. This is report number seven and it's dated the 11th of November last year. Here are some of the things that the Auditor-General says, and I'll quote from page seven. We issued qualified audit opinions to seven entities for reasons of inaccuracies or deficiencies in their financial statements or KPIs or due to control weaknesses, an increase from three in the prior year. Well, who was in government in the pre previous year? Also the McGowan Labor government. So they went from bad to worse, according to the Auditor-General. Turn to page 21. We reported 133 expenditure, expenditure control weaknesses to 49 entities in 2019-20. 34 were rated as significant, and 39 weaknesses were unresolved from the prior year. Turn to page 22. During our audits, we identified 79 accounting procedures issues at 39 entities, 18 rated as significant, and 11 were unresolved, were unresolved from the previous year. Further on that same page, we reported 69 payroll and human resource control weaknesses to 27 entities, 17 rated as significant, and 16 were unresolved from the previous year. Turn to page 23. During our audits, we identified 61 governance and legal compliance issues at 45 entities, 11 rated as significant, and 21 were unresolved from the previous year. Later on that same page, information systems underpin most aspects of entity and government operations and services. It is therefore important that entities implement appropriate controls to maintain reliable, secure and resilient information systems. In 2019-20, we identified 423 weaknesses across 49 entities where our information system audits have been completed. 41 per cent of these were unresolved issued from the previous year. I repeat that. 41 per cent of these were unresolved issued from the previous year. Last year, we reported 434 findings at 41 entities. 5 per cent of the issues were rated as significant and 71 per cent were rated as moderate, requiring action as soon as possible. Turn to page 24. 
In 2019-20, we reported 26 KPI weaknesses to management at 19 entities. The number of qualified KPI audit opinions was one. Almost all of the 26 weaknesses need prompt or urgent attention by entities. Turn to page 25. We reported 18 control weaknesses relating to data integrity and collection to 13 entities, seven rated as significant. These are the comments of the Auditor General of Western Australia in respect to the performance of the McGowan Labor Government in the report tabled in November of last year. Now, Acting President, if members turn to clause 16 of the bill, the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill of 2021, they'll see that the government are asking us to amend section 80. And if they turn then to clause 17, they'll see that the government are asking us to amend clause 85. In my view, it is telling it is telling that this government have deliberately decided to leap over section 82 of the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill of 2021. There plainly should be a clause 16 capital A inserted into this bill to address the fundamental deficiencies in section 82 of the Financial Legislation of Financial Management Act of 2006. So the question I have, Minister, is why are we not dealing? Why has the government deliberately decided not to implement any reforms in this legislation with regard to Section 82 when it is plainly available to them? Now, I suspect that one of the reasons that the government have deliberately gone out of their way to make sure that there will be no reform to Section 82 is because the current system suits this secrecy-obsessed government. It absolutely suits them, and the track record over the last four-plus years demonstrates that. Now, I draw to members' attention that as recently as 2019, two years ago, I asked, I asked the uh, Minister for Child Protection via her then, then representative, the Leader of the House, this was on the 14th of March 2019, some important questions with regard to whether the Department of Communities is monitoring cases where a young person has been charged or convicted of a sexual offence and attends a private school. Now, in response to this serious matter, I asked the Minister for Child Protection via her then representative, the Leader of the House, <coughs> whether the Minister would undertake to comply with Section 82 of the Financial Management Act of 2006. The response from the Minister via the Leader of the House was this, I will comply with any obligations imposed on me by Section 82 of the Financial Management Act 2006, but I am of the view that my answer to Part 3 does not give rise to any obligation to give further notice under Section 82, as the information requested is not information concerning any conduct or operation of an agency within the meaning of Section 82. This arrogant, arrogant government, this arrogant minister, says to the Parliament of Western Australia, I will not be providing any information to the Parliament because it is my view, and I might insert there my arrogant view, that I'm not required to comply with Section 82 in this instance. Well, did the Minister of, for Child Protection or the Leader of the House think to maybe consult with the Auditor General of Western Australia? It is no wonder, Acting President, that this government does not want to change Section 82 of the Financial Management Act when it can continue to hide, hide 
in their secrecy-obsessed fashion by answers like this in 2019. Now, interestingly, this same minister had obviously uh, learnt a thing or two from the previous year in 2018. Because on the 11th of September 2018, Hansard records that I asked the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Child Protection, a question with respect to uh, uh, matters that had been uh, addressed by the Auditor General. And I specifically asked if contact, that is the contact that had been made between uh, the Minister and the Office of the Auditor General, whether that contact was written or whether the contact was verbal. And if it was written, I asked the Minister to table that document. And if it was verbal, I asked the Minister to table any documents that were created which made a record of that verbal contact. The answer that was provided by the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Child Protection, on or around the 11th of September 2018, was the Office of the Auditor General made telephone contact with the Minister's office on the 13th of June 2018 to inquire if the Minister was going to give notice of a Section 82 of Financial Management Act 2006. Following the phone call, the Minister's office made contact with the Office of the Auditor General to advise that the office did not submit a Section 82 as they believe it is not required in this particular circumstance. Such is the arrogance of this Minister and the McGowan Labor Government that when the Auditor General of Western Australia, an independent statutory office holder, picks up the phone, speaks to the Minister's office, says, are you going to file a Section 82 notice? The arrogant minister and the arrogant Labor government say, well, we've thought about it, we've decided we're not going to do that because we don't think we have to. That's the level of accountability, acting president, that exists in this arrogant government. So it is no wonder, it is no wonder that the bill before us expressly does not look to address these fundamental problems which are conveniently being abused by the Labor Ministers. Now, plainly, I would think, Acting President, that after all of this time, it has now been recognised that the Section 82 process should be complaint-driven. It should be complaint-driven. It shouldn't be left to arrogant McGowan Labor government ministers to decide when and when they will not comply with Section 82. But that's how the situation sits at the moment. Now, when we look at some of the reports, particularly in the, in, as recent as this year, this is what the uh, Auditor General has had to say. Now, this report, Acting President, as uncomfortable as it is for the government, uh, was tabled just before the winter recess on the 23rd of June this year. In the Auditor General's overview in Report 32, she says this, Recently, I have reiterated how the principles of transparency and accountability are fundamental to good public governance in a parliamentary democracy. In our Western, Westminster system, responsible government is open and accountable to the people. This is reliant on the government providing information to Parliament wherever possible. Sections 81 and 82 of the Financial Management Act 2006 support this principle, and it is the long-held position of my office that, by default, ministers should disclose information to Parliament whenever it is not contrary to the public interest. When a minister provides a Section 82 notice, it triggers my duty under the Auditor General Act of 2006 to provide Parliament with an impartial and independent review of whether a minister's decision to not provide information was reasonable and appropriate. My role acts as a safeguard for Parliament. To do this, my office views the information requested by Parliament and considers the reasonableness of the minister's decision. In the current case, the document requested by Parliament was a briefing note related to the Bushfire Centre of Excellence. 
The briefing note was the subject of a Section 82 notice from the former Minister, Francis Logan, and was therefore central to our inquiry. Following initial inquiries with the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, the Minister's office provided us access to a heavily redacted copy of the briefing note. However, we were not permitted to view an unredacted copy and could not determine what had been redacted. My office made it clear to Minister Logan's office that without the ability to view all of the document, I could not provide an opinion on whether it is reasonably covered by the public interest immunity of Cabinet confidentiality. It is regrettable that I need to issue a disclaimer of opinion for this Section 82 inquiry. However, such outcomes are likely when I cannot access all the information I need to carry out my statutory responsibility. While ministers have generally provided access to such information, this is the fourth time since 2007 where a disclaimer of opinion by the Auditor General for a Section 82 notice has been necessary. 23rd of June 2021, the Auditor General issues that information to the Parliament via Report 32. Disclaimer of opinion on ministerial notification, Bushfire Centre of Excellence. Now, Acting President, less members think that this is an isolated incident when it comes to the McGowan Labor government, this secrecy obsessed, arrogant administration. Then let us turn, let us turn to the year 2019. Report 27, Auditor General, 20th of June 2019. Disclaimer of opinion says, the inability of an auditor to access the information they need to meet their obligation is a serious matter for the auditor and for those who rely on their opinion. In the event that an auditor is unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, auditors have few options. One of these is to issue a disclaimer of opinion. This is the third occasion where my office has been placed in this position for an opinion on a section 82 notice. These people, Acting President, have form. They have form. And what is clear is that they are not ashamed of their secrecy-obsessed conduct. This is despite the fact that their leader, their leader promised the people of Western Australia that his government would adhere to a gold standard of transparency. And yet they are exposed time and time again, not by a political appointee, by an independent statutory office holder who continues to expose that this government is obsessed by secrecy. So of course this government's going to maintain that regime, that statutory structure that suits their purposes. They're not going to change Section 82. Why would they? Now wait till one day, Acting President, that they are in opposition again and they'll be railing about Section 82. I hope I'm there that day, Acting President. I, ho I hope that I'll be there that day. I'll be reminding them, I'll be reminding them of all of these secrecy-obsessed episodes by many, many of their ministers, some who will be quoted from momentarily. Now, Acting President, Acting President, when it comes to opinions of ministerial uh, uh, notifications, uh, it's worth, it is worth noting that in the annual report from the Office of the Auditor General, this is the 2019-2020 annual report from the Office of the Auditor General, where there are not too many pictures, so the Honourable Darren West most probably has not read this particular uh, report. The Auditor General says, when a minister decides not to provide certain information to parliament concerning the conduct or operation of a state government, it goes on to say, essentially, the minister is required to notify the Auditor General of their decision not to provide information and the Auditor General is then required to form an opinion and report to parliament on the reasonableness and appropriateness of the minister's decision. 
Now, they then go on to say on the uh, page 118, Acting President, that the often complex, lengthy and unplanned nature of reviews required for these notifications are a legislative obligation and use the same resources as planned performance audit reports, causing the unfavourable results compared to targets in other report categories. Further, a variation between actual and target can arise given the Auditor General's decision to choose audit topics that, in our view, at the time would better inform Parliament and the community. Now, it would seem, Acting President, that this would ensure a much more targeted approach and a better use of the time and resources of the Office of the Auditor General. That is, if this government would actually adhere to their own much promise yet to be delivered standard, gold standard supposedly, of transparency. Now, I continue to be concerned when time after time, report after report, we receive findings from the Office of the Auditor General stating that ministers are not providing or seeking to provide reasonable information to Parliament or not providing sufficient appropriate audit evidence to the Auditor General. Now, in the recent report that I quoted from on the 23rd of June 2021, that's report 32, it was a decision by the former Minister for Emergency Services, Corrective Services, the Honourable Francis Logan MLA, not to provide Parliament with a briefing note on the Bushfire Centre for Excellence. And in that instance, the Auditor General couldn't tell us whether it was reasonable or not what the, the, the former Minister had done and instead had to say an opinion cannot be formed on whether the former minister's decision not to provide information to parliament was reasonable and therefore appropriate, as the Office of the Auditor-General has been unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence. So really what you have here is situation acting president where the arrogant Labor government and their ministers, not only do they not provide information to parliament, but then they don't provide information to the umpire. The independent umpire, whose job it is, paid by the taxpayer of Western Australia to assess whether it was reasonable what has been done, isn't even being provided information by the secrecy-obsessed government. And they wonder why commentators refer to them as W.O. Inc. Mark II, with this kind of behaviour. Now, earlier this year, there was another decision that was made by the uh, Auditor-General. It's in Report 15, the 26th of February 2021. This was in respect to a ministerial decision not to answer how much point of consumption tax was paid by Racing and Wagering WA to other jurisdictions for 2019-2020. Now, Racing and Wagering WA, they got their hands full at the moment. But this is their report, 15 from the Auditor General with regard to the conduct of the McGowan government. The decision by the Minister for Racing and Gaming, the Honourable Paul Papalier, MLA, not to provide Parliament with information about how much point of consumption tax was paid by Racing and Wagering WA to other jurisdictions for 2019-20 was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate. Now, this particular minister has got spectacular form because two days earlier in Report 14, the Auditor-General had to deal with another decision by the Minister for Tourism, the Honourable Paul Papalier, MLA, not to provide Parliament with five post-campaign performance reports in full and certain performance information regarding the Hotel Perth campaign. And this is what the Auditor-General had to say. The decision by the Minister for Tourism, the Honourable Paul Papalier, MLA, not to provide Parliament with five post-campaign performance reports in full and the number of people booking travel as a result of the Hotel Perth campaign was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate. Now, I think that minister now is the Minister for Police, as I understand it. His predecessor is not immune from this either. 30th of October 2019, 
this time dealing with a ministerial decision not to provide Parliament with information about operating hours and costs and maintenance costs for rotary wing aircraft to use by the Western Australian Police Force. This is what the Auditor General had to say. The decision by the Minister for Police, the Hon. Michelle Roberts, MLA, not to provide Parliament with information about operating hours and costs and maintenance costs for rotary wing aircraft in use by the WA Police Force was not reasonable and was therefore not appropriate. The information requested was factual, operational information and was not prepared expressly for, nor would reveal the delibera deliberations and decisions of Cabinet, any discrete information in relation to operational costs that may compromise the commercial affairs of the state could have been redacted. Now, this is a very important lesson uh, for members, particularly non-government members. Whenever you have a government minister who puts up a shield and says, sorry, I can't tell you about that, cabinet in confidence, well, the Auditor General of Western Australia has a different view. You can't just simply use that shield every single time. You might utter the words, it doesn't mean that it's true, it doesn't mean it is genuinely cabinet in confidence. Now, the Leader of this House, the Honourable Sue Ellery is also not immune from all of this. On the 18th of September 2019, in Report 6, the Auditor General had to deal with that Minister's decision not to provide documents previously released under the FOI Act. Such is the obsession of secrecy that if there's material that has been previously released under the FOI Act, the Minister wasn't willing to provide it. The Auditor General says this, the decision by the Minister for Education and Training, the Honourable Sue Ellery, MLC, not to provide Parliament with two documents previously released under the FOI Act was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate, as most of the information in these documents was publicly available. Then we have the, the Attorney General, 20th of June 2019. This report deals with a decision by the Attorney General, the Honourable John Quigley, MLA, not to provide information to Parliament about an email from the Executive Director. Now, in this instance, the Auditor General once again couldn't provide an opinion. Why is that? The Auditor General says, I have been unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence on the Attorney General's decision not to provide requested information to Parliament. Accordingly, I am unable to form an opinion on whether his decision was reasonable and therefore appropriate. The Department of Justice and the State Solicitor's Office have both declined my requests to view a copy of the email requested in the parliamentary question, and I therefore have insufficient information on which to base an opinion. The email requested in the parliamentary question was crucial evidence to our inquiry. My inability to view it meant that I was unable to form an independent opinion about the claim of public interest immunity. The Auditor-General goes on to say the inability of an auditor to access the information they need to meet their obligation is a serious matter for the auditor and for those who rely on their opinion. That would be members of parliament and the people of Western Australia. But this arrogant Labor government, this arrogant Labor administration continue year after year after year to thumb their nose at the independent Auditor General. They show no remorse for their systemic conduct, their systemic obsession with secrecy. And now we have a bill before us where there is actually an opportunity to do what they claim, enhance governance and accountability. And they deliberately choose not to do so. On the 5th of June 2019, Acting President, we have Report 22. The Auditor General is being asked in this instance to make a determination with regard to a ministerial decision not to provide information about whether revenue from the naming rights agreement, Perth Arena, was contained within the 2018-19 state budget and forward estimates. 
And the Auditor General says that the decision by the Minister, now in this instance the Minister was the now former Minister, Mick Murray MLA, the decision by that Minister not to confirm whether revenue from the agreement was contained in the 2018-19 State Budget and Forward Estimates, Part 5, was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate. Now, the Minister for uh, Transport, certainly in the last parliament, I think she might still be the Minister for Transport, despite the fact that there was some contention as to uh, other portfolios that might have been of interest. Well, isn't it good to have people that are so talented that they can be considered for a range of portfolios? Well, they weren't considered. Oh, I this is what I find ridiculous about you, that you think if, if someone is capable With all due respect to the Minister, the odd... Uh, what is remarkable, Acting President, is that the Minister for Regional Development has once again decided to inject herself into a debate and rather than actually uh, dealing with the substance of, of this matter, has only opened the door, Minister, in the usual way for me to raise you in particular. Let's look at Report 13, the 23rd of January. 23rd of January is so predictable, so predictable that, as per usual, order. one of the lead min members, members order. who is arrogant... I'm sure hands are to have individual... I, I, did, uh, I may have misheard this. If I did, I'm prepared to be corrected. But if I heard correctly... I believe the Minister for Regional um, Development called the Honourable Nick Garan a misogynist. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely unparliamentary and I'd ask her to withdraw. Minister. I agree that it is unparliamentary and I'll withdraw. Honourable Nick Garan. Acting President. The Minister for Regional Development, I thank her for her contributions and I note the following with respect to what the independent Auditor General had to say about this Minister's conduct on the 23rd of January. This was in regards to a ministerial decision not to provide Parliament with any Schedule 7, the proposal of the FAA finance, financial assistance agreement between the state and Carnegie Clean Energy in relation to the Albany Wave Energy Technology Development Project. Now, we know that this minister, in particular, was very, very fond of the Carnegie Wave, End Wave Project. And we also know that this minister has a great, great keenness for Albany. And nobody's used the government jet to go to Albany more than this particular minister. What does the independent Auditor General... What does the independent... A member, do you realise that she actually used to be the me member for the North Metropolitan She's Region? Great minister, that's what My goodness, what a talented parliamentary secretary we have. Order. Now, acting president, this is what the auditor general had to say. I'd encourage the honourable member. I'd in encourage the honourable member. Order, if it, members. If he could just get off his phone and actually read the report from the uh, independent auditor general. He would realise that what she had to say was this. The decision by the Minister for Regional Development, Honourable Alana McTiernan, MLC, not to provide information, not to provide Parliament with any of Schedule 7, the proposal of the FAA, was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate. So, Minister, we're dealing with an issue here of transparency and accountability. So whilst, as per usual, you might like to try and target the, the individual who's, and you don't like the message that's being raised, it's your leader who promised the gold standard of transparency. And not once have we seen this government adhere to that standard. Not once. You're much more interested in trying to get on the jet as quickly as possible up and down to Albany, but when it actually comes to dealing with matters of substance, nowhere to be seen. Now, prior to the rude interjections by the Minister for Regional Development, I was dealing with the situation for the Minister for Transport, what the Auditor-General had to say with regard to the decision by that Minister not to provide the Taxi User Subsidy Scheme Review Report to Parliament. And what the Auditor-General had to say on that occasion was that the Honourable Rita Safiotti, MLA, the decision by her not to provide Parliament with the Taxi User Subsidy Scheme Review Report was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate as part of the parts of the report were not cabinet in confidence 
and could have been provided. All of this, Acting President, by a government that likes to beat its chest about its performance. It's very, very quick to issue the media releases within microseconds. They'll issue a media release boasting about their performance. But when will we get the media release that boasts about them actually adhering to their gold standard of transparency? Maybe the parliamentary secretary might like to go and have a chat with them about that, because we haven't seen it. There hasn't been a media release once with regard to it, and there's a reason for it, because the independent Auditor-General of Western Australia continues to expose this government for the sham that it is. It promised gold standard transparency, and it continues to deliver the exact opposite. Now, it may well be inconvenient for these members to continue to hear report after report, year after year, month after month, from the independent Auditor-General. Don't blame me. Go and take it up with the Auditor-General. I'm simply reading from her reports. I didn't author these things. And yet, you have these arrogant ministers who float in and out of the chambers trying to tell us when we can speak, when we can't speak. Well, we're fed up with it, Acting President. All we're asking on the part of the people of Western Australia is for this government to just once, just once, adhere to their much promised gold standard of transparency. Now, this Minister for Regional Devel uh, this Minister for Transport has been, has been found out on multiple occasions, uh, Acting President, multiple occasions. There was another incident, incident where the Minister had decided not to provide the 2018 Metronet Task Force minutes to Parliament. And what the Auditor General said on that occasion was that the decision by the Minister for Transport, the Honourable Rita Safiotti, MLA, not to provide Parliament with minutes on the Metronet Task Force meeting held on the 27th of February 2018 was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate, as part of the minutes were not cabinet in confidence and could have been provided. It's the same thing. Every time we pick up another report, we still get another damning indictment with respect to this government. Now, Acting President, the hapless health minister, the Honourable Roger Cook, he's also not immune with respect to these matters. Because if members turn to the report 10 on the 24th of May 2018, you'll find that he was, he was unwilling to provide information. Now, in this instance, it's on a sensitive issue. We've just been dealing with a piece of legislation touching in this area. He decided not to provide a report of 2015-16 on induced abortions. The decision by the Minister for Health, the Honourable Roger Cook, MLA, not to provide information with a copy, not to provide Parliament with a copy of the report, notification of induced abortions 2015-16 gestation 20 weeks or more was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate, as most of the information was not confidential and could have been provided. It doesn't matter what the topic is, it doesn't matter what the portfolio is, they are obsessed with secrecy. And here we have an opportunity in this bill to change the scheme so that it's complaint driven rather than allowing the, governments to, the government to continue to use this massive shield to deflect from any accountability and to continue to underperform when it comes to transparency. Now, the now retired former Treasurer, the Honourable uh, Ben Wyatt, MLA, he's also been caught up in this uh, debacle of the McGowan Labor government. And the Auditor General said that when it came to his ministerial decisions not to provide information about the overall cost of increasing the payroll tax threshold, that the decisions by the Treasurer, the Honourable Ben Wyatt, MLA, not to provide Parliament with the requested information were not reasonable and therefore not appropriate, as the information was already publicly known. These people, Acting President, are so obsessed with secrecy that when there's actually information that's already out in the public and a Member of Parliament dares to ask for it, they say, I'm not going to tell you. And then they pretend that they were going to adhere to a gold standard of, of transparency. Now, Acting President, there are so many more examples. There are so many more examples. Um, it beggars belief. I'll return to the Honourable Paul Papalia, MLA. He's one of the prime culprits. 
On the 14th of December 2017, Report 26, Ministerial decision not to provide information about WATAB's wagering turnover figures. The Auditor General said this. The decision by the Minister for Racing and Gaming, Honourable Paul Papalia, MLA, not to provide the information requested by Parliament was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate, as most of the information was already publicly available. The Minister for Finance, now retired, Honourable Ben Wyatt, MLA, 21st of March 2018, report number three, ministerial decision not to provide information about a claim from John Holland, PTY LTD, to Parliament. The decision by the Minister for Finance, Honourable Ben Wyatt, MLA, not to provide Parliament with information about whether the state had received a claim from John Holland, PTY LTD, in relation to Perth Children's Hospital was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate because this information was already publicly available. Now, Acting President, one of the key issues that have been raised by providers of uh, services that seek to manage or reduce the incidences of family and domestic violence is the fact that service agreements are often not signed off on until the 30th of June. And so they often have staff waiting nervously to see if, whether they'll still have a job uh, after the 1st of July. Now, it's my hope, Acting President, that when we get to Clause 10, of this bill, which deals with section 40 of the Act, that it will provide an opportunity to rectify that matter. And I'm certainly looking forward to addressing that with the Minister when we get to the uh, Committee of the Whole stage as we explore the bill in greater detail. But in essence, what we have here, Acting President, is a missed opportunity, is a missed opportunity by the government. They could bring in meaningful, enhanced reforms, but in what has now become the, the standard for this government, they roll in bills from the previous parliament, largely unamended, and then expect, because of the weight of numbers, that, oh, well, it'll get passed. And they are right that that will happen. And in this incident, in, instance, as the Leader of the Opposition has said, we'll, we'll be supporting this bill. But it doesn't mean that the McGowan Labor government can simply get away with a lazy approach to law reform. There's been an opportunity here because of the government's deliberate decision after the 19th of March last year, to never ever bring on this former bill on for debate, to enhance it, to improve it, to consult further with the Auditor General. Indeed, I'd be fascinated to know if there's been any conversation between the government and the Auditor General about this bill since the 19th of March last year. Not the 19th of March this year, 19th of March last year. Has anyone consulted with the Auditor General? Is it because of what the Auditor General's been doing that this matter's been held up in any way? We'd like to have answers to those questions. That's the job of the opposition, Acting President, to continue to hold this government to account. My word, they might well have the numbers to be able to pass any legislation at any time. But equally, the rest of us have a responsibility to ask the questions that need to be asked. And the prime question I'm asking the minister to address is why has the government deliberately decided not to introduce any reforms with regard to section 82 of the Financial Management Act when they have this opportunity at the moment? And if it has been for any particular reason, will they now consider it? And if not, what do they propose to do with respect to section 82 so that they can adhere to a gold standard of transparency? Members, the question is that the bill now be read a second time. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, uh, uh, Acting President. Uh, look, I just arise to say a few words. I'd like to endorse what uh, the Honourable Nick Goran has said about 
the, a lazy approach to financial accountability. I don't think there's anything in here that we are going to oppose, because, uh, and we will be looking at it in consideration of detail. But the, 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 there is so much that needs to be considered in relation to uh, the accountability in the financial system. And accountability starts at the top. It starts at the very top. And, and one of the observations I've made uh, in, in recent years under this government is the incredible politicisation of the budget process. I think it's a, an appalling indictment on the Labor Party that when the state, uh, WA state budget documents come out that the constant referral to the McGowan Labor government, uh, the use of... And that has not happened before. It, I, 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 I have, I've, I've, I've seen... Have I, I can go, go in here. I, I can Order. go to the document in 2016. Order. Go to the faction. Go to Order. the faction. Go, go to the fact sheet. Members. Go to the fact sheet. The fact sheet, if you look at the fact sheet, of the 2016-17, it is simply a fact sheet. You go into the WA state budget and it's all about the McGowan Labor government did this, the McGowan Labor government did that. Because they did. And that's what your government did. My, point, my point is this. My point, is, in this my, my point will be this. My point is this. That if, if, if this is a document produced by our public sector, and I ask the question, what is the culture in the public sector, if this is how it, it operates. Treasury, and I have been a member of Treasury, I've been involved in the, in the creation of budgets, but I can assure you it was always done in a very uh, academic way, presenting of documents. Present, it was. Lugan. It was always done that way. Lugan. And it was never done in the way Lugan. that is. Members. <laughs> I must be um, on to something. Very touch and earth. Members. Because I could go through. I started counting how many times was the McGowan Labor government mentioned in WA state budget 2020-21, WA economy and WA jobs. You, you might say, oh, it's great, it's the McGowan Labor government. What I'm saying to you is that that is the politicisation of the public sector and the pressure it puts on public servants I'm to actually be... I'm looking at you and not me. He remember. When he was a the, obviously, it's touched the nerve. To suggest this has changed is outrageous. The, it's touched the nerve. Members, I think Hansard are having difficulty my point recording is, the conversation. I Member. believe. My, sorry, sorry, President. And I just President. ask that we keep the side conversations to a minimum so that Hansard can hear what is going on. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Because the lack of transparency, and I can assure you I have read the budget papers at length, trying to understand in my region what's going on in the budget papers, the lack of transparency starts at the top. This is a propaganda piece. It's not an open and transparent budget process. And I'll be enjoying, at, at budget estimates, inquiring of the, of the public servants of their views on, on, this, on their budget, because with these super agencies that have been established, it's very difficult to actually compare and contrast the impact of budgets. And I can uh, give many examples, but uh, for example, in my region, we had funding. Uh, we had funding for the Duncan Road, which was put in the budget in, in the 2018-19 uh, uh, budget, I believe, it was almost $40 million. Uh, then the local governments uh, were able to identify, identify um, the, the uh, 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 or have committed to them another $75 million from the Commonwealth. Well, sleight of hand, everything changed because these budget papers have been drafted probably by some spin doctors in the, in the Premier's office now, I, I assume, or the Treasurer's office, rather than by the... Well, what, fewer one now. What, rather, than by, rather than by the Treasury Department. I don't know what the drafts look like when they come out of the Treasury Department. I'm sure they're all you know, signing up to the Labor Party if they want to keep their jobs. But the point is, the, the next, the next uh, round comes and we have... We have merged all the funding together uh, in relation to the Tanami and Duncan Road, and we have a figure of closer to uh, $90 million, uh, automatically allowing for the, 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 the transfer of funds across from one, one project to the other, so disappearing into the state coffers uh, $40 odd million, dollars, as far as I can tell. Now, I'm just giving an example because I believe these budget papers uh, don't have this level of integrity that 
they have had in the past, and I believe it's vital that integrity starts at the top. The other piece I'd like to say in relation to the, the matters uh, in, in, in uh, I think it's clause five of this, um, this, this uh, bill in relation to the resource agreements, I think there could be a lot more done. I think there could be a lot more done. Uh, the issue in relation to the uh, accountability, and I hope, I hope that there's some consideration of this, and uh, I'll be interested in, in the detailed uh, discussions. Uh, but the, the accountability of our directors general, because there has to be more consequences put in place uh, for our directors general in relation to overspending, and, and I think that is a vital thing, and that comes from my experience at a senior level in the public sector. I, I, I believe that would be important. I believe that would help uh, drive accountability on budget control. And, uh, and, and I would like to see the performance agreements, if it's not already occurring, uh, linking to uh, the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill or the Financial Management Act, uh, so that when a, a, a Director General exceeds their, their uh, expense limit, that they would actually uh, have there be some form of consequence to that. Uh, and so what I'm saying is there's so much more that can happen. I am not confident. I'm not confident that. Uh, the accountability is appropriate at the moment because we have these large agencies which have been created. A lot of the detail has been buried, and the level of transparency in these budget papers that I've seen over the last couple of years has been uh, of the lowest standard that I have noted in my long years uh, examining budget papers. And I believe there needs to be greater transparency, uh, greater consideration. So I endorse the comments that have been made by the Honourable Nick Doran and my other colleagues in this place today. Members, the question is that the bill now be read a second time. All of those of that opinion say aye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Try moving on. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Acting Chair. Uh, Acting President, I do appreciate you trying to move the, uh, trying to move the debate on this <laughs> afternoon. Can I, at the outset, thank the Honourable Steve Thomas, Doc, Honourable Dr. Steve Thomas, uh, for his contribution and his indication that the Alliance will support the legislation before us this afternoon. Can I thank, to a lesser degree, the Honourable oh, Nick Goran oh, and acknowledge his contribution this afternoon? And can I acknowledge a lot less the comments made by the Honourable Neil Thompson, who has just spoken now? And indeed, I might start off with the, the comments made by the Honourable Member. First of all, now I want to place on the record this afternoon because I do think there is a collective cloud of amnesia uh, on the benches uh, facing me, at least from cer certain members who are sitting in the chamber this afternoon. But I might remind members in relation to previous findings of Auditor Generals in Western Australia. Now, up until the end of 2016-17, the Auditor General had ruled that more than 40% of the ministerial decisions made not to release information to Parliament were not justified. 40 per cent. This was you. This was your government. Absolutely. 60. Absolutely. And I'll quote one. So I'll quote one. There was one, one then. One, it was the government. Of, it was the Liberal National Government. It was the, I said it was a Liberal National Government. And absolutely, I recognise you were only a, a parliamentary secretary then, and so you couldn't be blamed for, uh, for giving answers to questions. You couldn't be, you couldn't be blamed. You couldn't be blamed. You gave, you gave answers on Members. behalf of others. Let's proceed, Minister. But I will remind us, there was, there was one, uh, the 11th of August 2016, Report 18. Uh, on the 15th of October 2015, the Honourable Sue Ellery asked the then Education Minister, I refer to the strategic asset plan referred to in the 2014-15 annual report. Will the Minister table a copy and if not, why not? The, minister, the then Minister replied, the strategic asset plan is considered as part of the annual budget deliberation process and is therefore cabinet in confidence. What did the Auditor General find? The Auditor General found that the Minister's decision was not reasonable and therefore not appropriate. I form this opinion as information contained within the SAP was not prepared solely for consideration by Cabinet, and some of the information it contains is publicly available. Now, I do, I do remember a few minutes ago one of the honourable members over the far side talking about or having a go at ministers because they didn't answer a question because information was publicly available. Well, guess what? Guess what your own side did when you were in government? Did the very same thing. 
Now the, now, the minister did not consider, for instance, I'm going on. The minister did not consider, for instance, if he could provide a redacted version of the SAP. While we acknowledge the short time frame's consideration in response to questions without notice, the minister could have requested additional time if needed. I might touch on the Langalong report for a moment in relation to transparency. Now, the Langalong report findings, uh, the special inquirer said of the previous Liberal National Government, a quote. A general lack of transparency and default response of commercial and confidence to questions about projects has led to a re reduction in accountability. Page 16, that was a quote. A further quote from page 84. Throughout the examination of the programmes and project that forms the terms of reference for the special inquiry, evidence of overuse of commercial and confidence and lack of transparency about project decision making and progress reporting was uncovered. Up to the end of 2016-17, the Auditor-General had ruled that more than 40 per cent of the ministerial decisions made not to release information to Parliament were not justified. Again, a quote from the report. For the Western Australian Government report card on transparency, this must surely constitute an un unacceptably low mark. Information about estimated and actual project costs and disclosure about ongoing costs, changing timeframes, contract variations, project scope creep and emerging project risks are withheld from the public. Page 84 again. And finally, there is a lack of transparency around the commercial negotiations involving major projects and large contracts, even where there would be no disadvantage to any party. Page 89. I could go on. I could talk about numerous other decisions made by the Barnett government, a government where you were a senior public servant. I can show you the newspaper articles. I can give you the comments made by John Langelant. I can give you comments made by previous Auditor Generals. You were there. You've obviously got amnesia now because it happened. And for you to suggest it didn't happen is outrageous. Now, I might move on. I might move on. Now that that's out of my system, Honourable uh, Deputy Chair. Members, order. Minister. Thank you. I won't, I won't sit here, um, Madam uh, Acting President, and listen to people make stuff up as the Honourable Neil Thompson did this afternoon. I think it's highly appropriate for me and other members, Honourable Members, to point that out. And if, even if he's got dementia or amnesia, We'll certainly remind the House. If that, if that, if that indeed, if that indeed has, is what, if that indeed is what has gone on. Order. If that indeed is what was going on. Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, acting, uh, acting president. Now uh, back to the honourable Dr. Steve Thomas, who uh, did make some uh, good points this afternoon and put some uh, very good questions on the record, and so it's my intention to try and answer those now. Noting, of course, that we will go into Committee of the Whole at a later stage. Can I say at the outset, Western Australia already has a very good financial management framework and that this bill tightens the requirement for compliance with good financial management practice. Now, as highlighted by the Honourable Dr Steve Thomas, this bill addresses many of the recommendations of recent government reviews, particularly in the area of stronger governance, accountability and better oversight over public finances. This includes the Red Flags, Red Faces report, which stated that government agencies with strong governance and internal controls are much better placed to mitigate corruption risk. In addition, the special inquiry into government programs and projects highlighted the need for better governance and stronger accountability over budget management. Now, clauses 13 and 14 in particular place a stronger onus on accountable authorities to ensure that their, that their agencies' budget management practices and internal controls are robust. This includes ensuring the approved uh, expense limits are not breached and ensuring that their officers comply with financial management policies. Now, this does include complying with Treasurer's Instruction 304, which requires a certifying officer to make sure money is lawfully available before authorising a payment. I note that non-compliance with expense limits or financial management policies could conceivably allow the use uh, of disciplinary processes available in other legislation where warranted and depending on the severity, uh, including the Public Sector Management Act 1994 and the Corruption, Crime and uh, Misconduct Act 2003. The matter of non-compliance could also be addressed through the CEO Performance Agreement Framework. This bill also improves the efficiency of many financial management processes, including the provision of a standing appropriation in place of supplementary appropriation bills and increasing the automatic supply of monies uh, in an election year where a budget is handed down late. So I do thank the Honourable Dr Steve Thomas for his support and agree that the bill provides some workable solutions. 
Uh, with regard to KPIs, uh, I agree, and I, I did by interjection as well, and I think my colleague who was sitting beside me also, also agreed. Uh, yeah, I think any, any of us who've sat through budget estimates hearings over time would agree that certain KPIs in annual reports are, whether they're fanciful or just, they just don't, don't, um, don't meet uh, what's required. Um, so KPIs are not particularly useful. Uh, KPIs are a key component of the outcome-based management, OBM framework. And I can confirm that Treasury is embarking on a review of the OBM framework now. Uh, it is the responsibility of agencies to develop their KPIs, and these are audited by OAG. It is incumbent on agencies to ensure that their KPIs are useful and meaningful, and Treasury and the OAG regularly assist agencies in their revision of KPIs. Uh, I did, uh, I, and I did by way of interjection kind of comment on the, the, the process to change KPIs is from my perspective, a particularly laborious process. Um, and so I'm very pleased that Treasury is undertaking that, um, that review uh, at the moment. Um, now, in relation to the Honourable Nick Goran, uh, the extent to which the Auditor General has been consulted on the bill, now, I have been advised that the Auditor General has been consulted throughout the process. That's what my advice uh, that's what has been provided to me. Um, in terms of uh, changes to section uh, 82, uh, I have, it has been brought to my attention a recommendation from the Joint Standing Committee on Audit Committee, uh, Committee's second review of the FMA 2006 from May 2019, where I understand the committee supported Treasury's decision not to progress section 82 amendments as recommended in the section Treasury report. Um, uh, in relation to the Honourable Nick Goran's uh, comment about further changes to the bill, uh, can I advise that, that, that the bill, uh, the government has no intention at this time of making further changes to the bill that is before the House. Um, however, I, you know, obviously Honourable Members will have an opportunity to uh, to canvass their views and to ask me further questions about the piece of legislation that is before me uh, when we get into Committee of the Whole. So with those comments, uh, I will commend the bill to the House. Members, the question is the bill now be read a second time. All of those of that opinion say aye. 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 All of those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. Financial Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, second reading. We're in committee. In committee. We are in committee. Do I say that? There's no amendments, no supplementary notice paper. No. Sorry. Uh, members, there is no supplementary notice paper. Um, we are dealing with um, the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. Just read a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> Besides, I've already got your questions today and they're very challenging. Uh, members, the question is that clause one stand as printed. Leader of the opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, obviously. This is a reasonably significant change to the financial legislation. I, don't, I suspect it won't be the last of a, of a, as we go forward. But um, just in relation to the consultation process and the feedback, um, I assume the Department of Finance and Treasury sought feedback from government departments on that process. Can you give us an indication of what that feedback looks like and um, what, what you might make available to us in terms of what that feedback is? 
Minister. See that what I guess what engagement the Treasury had in relation to other government departments yes. in relation so, to the legislation. Yeah, yeah. what okay. feedback that, that okay. looked like, what that looked like. Minister. Thank you, uh, Thank you Deputy Chair. Uh, Honourable Member, I'm told that the, the, the process has been a very long one, and so the work initially commenced in 2014, uh, and it came out of the FMA review at that time. So, um, so there was consultation at that time, and there has been ongoing consultation in relation to that. Uh, I can, obviously, we're not going to finish this this afternoon, so uh, I can undertake to get a copy of, of, of that review from 2014 and list who was consulted in that time, and if I can provide an answer at a later stage about who else along the way uh, was consulted, bearing in mind, of course, that recommendations were made a long time ago to make these changes, and, and they've been in the, in the wings for a long time. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you might find that there might not be that many people left in the same position as they were when that process started, but um, let, let's see what we can back in. Okay, so the next, the next step on from that is obviously the oversight position then of the entirety of the changes. Um, the, I'm presuming the Department of um, Finance will be, I guess, to some degree, um, inserting itself more into the processes of various other departments. I presume it'll be finance, not treasury. Um, and um, I presume that there will be an assistance process in, in, in place to make sure that government departments are able to um, comply with the changes that we're putting in place on top of them. Maybe you could give us a quick briefing on what that looks like. Minister. Thank you, Stephanie, Treasury, um, Department of Treasury. Um, so I'm advised that there are uh, various uh, documents, forms of communication and training available. So there are community of, communities of practice, which are um, for C, so there are C, CFO forums that are run by Treasury at the moment, uh, and also um, communities of practice for finance teams uh, in the various agencies. Uh, Treasury has a, um, a website. Uh, which uh, is called the Financial, Ad Financial Administration Bookcase. That has it's a kind of central repository that has all the various documents. So it has um, it lists all the, the changes. It has the financial management frameworks and all of the treasurer's instructions, all available in one spot that are accessible. Uh, and there's also um, um, and, and of course, they will be updated as part of the, the legislation that's before us. And then there's also financial management training that is available. And I'm told that there are three modules of training currently available. And again, um, if they need to be updated as a result of, of, of the bill before us, um, they will be updated. So quite a comprehensive set of uh, kind of communication tools and training available. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, Minister, is that coming at a cost to Treasury is that is there budget uh, implications that are being addressed and can also, while I'm rolling questions into one, um, are any of that additional up upgrading and, and, and education compulsory in that 
because you get government departments who are too busy to engage, shall we say, or are there compulsory components to this that will be required? Minister. For extra, uh, extra resource or extra uh, allocation for this stuff, because Treasury are the functional leaders, um, they do it as a matter of course. In relation to the training, um, well, I'll make the point that changes to the framework and Treasurer's instructions are mandatory. So the training is put out there. Uh, the, the, the changes are mandatory, but of course the agencies get audited by the Office of the Auditor General. So it makes sense for them to participate because if they're doing something that doesn't comply or align with the Treasurer's instruction, for example, they'll get pinged on that by the Office of the Auditor General. So I'm, my advisors tell me there's no kind of reticence on behalf of agencies to engage in this stuff and actually people you know, genuinely participate because it's a requirement at the end of the day and if they don't do it and they don't do the right thing, well, the Auditor General at the end of the day can, you know, uh, can, can point that out. Nick the Chair, uh, Minister, since the uh, Act commenced in 2006, um, how many statutory reviews have there been? Minister. Uh, Honourable Member, there have been two, so one in 2012 and one in 2017. And, uh, Minister, both of those, have both of those statutory reviews been conducted by the uh, Standing Committee on Audit? Minister. Uh, yes, they have. Honourable Nick Graham. Now, this bill, uh, Minister, consists of some 23 uh, clauses. Which of the recommendations from the 2012 and 2017 reviews are being implemented by this bill?
Minister. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so there was a recommendation made in the 2012 review year in relation to expense limits and that, it, that amend existing provisions to resource agreements. Uh, that has, that's, in, that's before us, that's in the bill before us. There was a recommendation in 2017 on resource agreements, uh, amend existing provisions to improve effect effectiveness to accountability tool, um, providing clarity for agencies and government regard to the timing responding to changes occurring throughout the financial year. That's included. Uh, there's a recommendation in relation to financial commitment from 2012 to explicitly require approval of funding before an officer on behalf of their AG agency enters into a significant financial commitment. That's included. Um, there was a recommendation in 2012 in relation to controls over public expenditure, so the accountable authority should maintain a register that details the framework policies and underlying authority for approved delegations and authorisations that have been devolved to officers who have the ability to incur financial obligations on behalf of the agency. That's included. There was a recommendation in 2012 in relation to notices of financial difficulty. That's included. Uh, there was a recommendation made in 2012 again in relation to alternate tabling provisions. Um, Um, which didn't make it. Um, there was a recommendation from 2012 uh, in relation to KPIs, so amend existing provision to allow the Treasurer discretion to exempt agencies from reporting key performance indicators in the annual report where appropriate. Um, that's included. A recommendation in relation to annual estimates from 2017 uh, that talked about amending section 40 of the FMA to, approve, to improve effectiveness of annual estimates as an accountability tool and provide clarity for agencies and government with regard to the timing, application and approval processes of the annual estimates that's included. Recommendation from 2017 in relation to appropriation bills 3 and 4, supplementary appropriation bills, uh, that has been included. Recommendation from 2017 again in relation to the period of statutory reviews of the FMA and the Auditor General Act. Um, that has been included. A recommendation in relation to temporary re repayment and redraw of borrowings uh, and relates to the Loan Act 2017. That's from 2017. That was included. Uh, and a recommendation in relation to holding accounts uh, from 2017. That was to, enable, to amend section 26.3 to enable the Treasurer to direct all or part of the balance standing to the credit of the holding account to be paid or returned to the consolidated account. That's included. Payments before supply granted from 2017. That has been included. A recommendation in relation to the Treasurer's advance extraordinary and unforeseen matters. Um, that has been included. A recommendation from 2012 in relation to write-offs in excess of $250,000. That too has been included. And a further recommendation from 2012 in relation to active grace payments in excess of $250,000. And that too has been included. Honourable Nick Graham. So, Minister, by my count, there are uh, seven recommendations arising from 2012 uh, that have been included. Now, one of them, which you indicated it didn't make it, was the altern alternate tabling uh, recommendation. How many of those uh, type of recommendations didn't make the cut? Minister. Thanks. I haven't got that information on the member, so we'll have to come back to you on that. And, Nick Graham. and uh, Minister, in the same vein, then looking at the 2017 recommendations, uh, it looks like, by my count, there's eight of the 2017 recommendations. Uh, that are being uh, included in this bill, and I, I assume that uh, you don't have this information readily available, but could you come back to us with regard to uh, the number of recommendations from 2017 uh, that are not being addressed by this bill? Minister. Thank you. Uh, my figure is seven from 2017. Uh, I don't have that information with me, uh, and in the same vein as the previous commitment, uh, we will um, seek that information and come back to the House with it. Honourable Nick With regard to the 2017, uh, I've got the resource agreements, the annual estimates, the appropriation bills, the statutory review, uh, the temporary repayment, the holding accounts, uh, the payment before supply, and the Treasurer's advance. So I had eight, but one of them might have been a 12. Uh, the Treasurer's advance was 2012. 12, okay, all right. So, just, um, so in which case uh, there should be eight from 2012 then? Eight. 
Yeah. Eight from 2012 and seven from uh, 2017. And the ones that aren't being implemented, uh, you'll let us know in, in the fullness of time. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, uh, I assume a second reading speech that my understanding is that uh, GTEs, government trading enterprises, are generally uh, won't be captured by much of this because they'll have uh, their enabling legislation effectively covers most of those things. But um, can you just confirm that that's the case? Uh, are there any GTEs? Are all GTEs that we have, um, including Treasury Corp and, and the more commonly known ones, all all basically obliged to do the equivalent uh, activity by their enabling legislation? Uh, and whilst you're at it, maybe you could find out whether there are any uh, other departments or entities that might be excluded somehow through having alternative legislation like, like the GTEs. Are there, are, does this apply effectively, I'm asking, to every government department or are there exclusions? Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, so uh, it applies to every government department, to all FMA agencies, um, and they are listed in Schedule 1 of the Financial Management Act 2006. So it's got, I won't read them out, Honourable Member. One. No, no. Um, it's, and it's, it, it's an expansive list, it's, you know, three pages long. In terms of, I won't ask you to read the whole one. <laughs> um, who it doesn't apply to, though, it doesn't apply to the electricity generators, um, water corporation, the port authorities, and the WA Land Authority. Um, Treasury is working with those various agencies, though, to make sure. The Treasury Corp. Do we know where the Treasury Corp is captured? Treasury Corp is on the list. Is on the list. You can't talk. You're not, you're not allowed to talk. Okay. Um, Treasury Corp is an FMA. <laughs> Uh, listed agents. There's an echo in the room. Two, yeah. two, one, two. It's a, it's a very, it's a very high rate. Leader of the opposition. I've always said there were too many echoes in this place. Chair, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, okay. So, was any thought? Uh, I guess the obvious question from that is that during the process, is there any thought given to unifying the entirety of all government enterprises? Or, I mean, you know, there might be a government trading enterprise in the future. Do we? Do we? Is there any advantage in capturing GTEs as a part of this process? Well, it doesn't necessarily make sense to have two different versions of, of, of oversight, really. So, um, uh, was any thought given to capturing everything and making it universal? Minister. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Uh, so, Honourable Member, there is some GTE reform legislation uh, that is being worked on across government at the moment. Um, and as part of that, um, that process, the intention is to to line up those GTEs with the requirements yeah, for us. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, sorry, that, that does make sense. So I think that would be an obvious thing. Any in giving us any advance notice of what else is in the GTE <laughs> review? We might, you know, limitations on government um, mm. uh, uh, government benefits and bonuses coming out of GTEs, for example. That might be yeah, nothing. Minister. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, as the Honourable Nicola knows, I do try to be helpful where I can from, from this Very part good. of the chamber. Uh, however, while the GTE refor le um, reform legislation, the fact that there is GTE reform legislation being worked on is public, uh, public knowledge. Uh, I'm not in a position to disclose what might be in there because, of course, it hasn't gone to cabinet well, you yet. You kind of just have because you've told us that hasn't the review process might, uh, might be But I've, I've told that no, the, 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 there's public knowledge of the, the process that's being undergone by government because it's been said before. But in terms of what's in there, I don't know what's in there, but of course it hasn't gone to cabinet yet. Okay. 
Uh, members noting the time, I will leave the chair until the ringing of the bells. All right. Honourable members, the President. Members, are there any questions? The, thank you. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education and Training. I refer to the Minister's joint media statement on 5 August on the Government Skills Summit and the Government's Apprenticeship and Training Policy, and I ask for each of the following financial years A 2016-17, B 17-18, 18-19, 19-20 and 2021. 1. How many apprenticeships were commenced in Western Australia? 2. How many apprenticeships were completed in Western Australia? 3. How many people were in apprenticeships in Western Australia? 4. How many traineeships were commenced in Western Australia? 5. How many traineeships were completed in Western Australia? And 6. How many people were in traineeships in Western Australia? The Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Um, uh, President, the Honourable Member is asking for a series of, uh, obviously, numbers um, over a series of years. So can I ask to have that part of the answer incorporated into Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thank you. And then there is a note down the bottom. In December 2017, the state government removed the payroll tax exemption for existing worker trainees due to rorting of the exemption to minimise tax obligations by some businesses. This resulted in existing worker traineeships declining by around 80 per cent over the next two years. New entrant traineeships remained steady over the same time frame. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my uh, question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Treasurer. I refer to the 2019 to 2021 boom of iron ore prices, and I ask: one, what is the current spot price of iron ore as measured by Treasury? Two, what was the iron ore royalty revenue received in the 2021 financial year? Three, what is the actual dollar and percentage decline in the iron ore price since I last asked this question on the 24th of June this year? Four, does Treasury expect this decline to continue, and if so, to what extent? And five, what is the McGowan government's economic plan for the end of the current mining boom? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President. Thursday afternoon, I love them. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notes of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Treasurer. Uh, one, US $162 per tonne. Two, the audited iron ore royalty revenue collections for the 2021 financial year will be disclosed in the annual report and state finances released in September. Three, the iron ore price has declined by $54.20, uh, or 25 per cent, since the honourable member's question. Legislative Council question without notice 359 on the 24th of June 2021, highlighting the volatility in the iron ore price and the need to budget accordingly. Four, Treasury's commentary of the iron ore market will be provided in the 2021-22 budget. Five, the McGowan government has committed around $8 billion as part of the WA recovery plan and in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This has provided resourcing for our frontline services, support for businesses and households, and significant investments to drive our state's economic recovery and create jobs. The McGowan, McGowan government continues to make record investments in infrastructure to boost employment and opportunities for local businesses and to improve services and support growth over the long term. The Hon. Yorn Sidmer. Thank you, President. My question without notice, for which some notice is provided, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. And I refer to your recent comments that the government might possibly enact the net zero emissions by 2050 target in law. And I ask one, do your comments ruling in the possibility of a legislative net zero target represent an official change in policy that your government took to the last election, including assurances provided previously to stakeholders? Two, were your cabinet colleagues, including the Minister for Energy, aware that you would put out a legislated target on the public agenda prior to you making those remarks? Three, at what point will you make the decision to legislate for a target and upon what information will you rely on forming this position? And four, should you decide to legislate a 2050 target, what consultation process will you initiate prior to drafting a bill? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. It's not in my file, Honourable Member, and I don't actually recall signing off on it. But if it does come in before the end of question time, I'll give you the answer. The Honourable Nick Guerin. President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to your answer to the question without notice number 106 on 12 May 2021, in which you advised the review of amendments introduced by the Criminal Appeals Amendment Double Jeopardy Act 2012. 
was nearing completion, and I ask one, on what date did this review commence? Two, on what date is this review scheduled to be completed? And three, when will the report on this review be tabled? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney General. One, the review commenced in April 2018. Two, the review is scheduled to be completed in September 2021. Three, the report will be tabled as soon as practicable after the completion of the review. The Honourable Donna Farragher. <laughs> And President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the answer given to question without notice 468 asked yesterday. As the Minister chose not to provide a specific response to my question regarding child health nurses, I ask again, one, can the Minister confirm whether any community child health nurses have been redeployed to COVID-19 vaccination clinics, and if so, how many? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. One, it is not possible to provide the requested information in the time required because the regions will need to manually review this data. I therefore ask the Honourable Member to place this question on notice. The Honourable Peter Collier. Thank you, President. My question without notice, which some has given, is to the Minister for Mental Health. I refer the Minister to question C488, asked on Wednesday, the 11th of August, to the Minister for Police, and to the announcement on Sunday to inject $4 billion to reboot Western Australia's health system. And I ask one, will the Minister commit to fund the ongoing services of the Soldiers and Sirens program, which provides essential mental health services and support for WA Police, other first responders and veterans, and if not, why not? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, uh, President, and thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, I was disappointed to hear that the federal government funding for soldiers and sirens has not been continued, and I do call on the federal minister to reconsider this decision. As you would appreciate, Honourable Member, uh, there is a requirement to adhere to the WA State Government procurement rules when undertaking any community services procurement activity to ensure a competitive open market pro procurement process is undertaken. The Mental Health Commission has an unsolicited funding proposal process, and soldiers and sirens have been provided with information to enable them to submit an application for assessment under this process. Uh, the Honourable Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister of Housing, C532. I refer to the public housing wait list and I ask how many people were on the public housing wait list at the end of June and July, respectively? Two, of the people in one, how many received a disability support pension? Three, how many people were on the public housing priority wait list at the end of June and July, respectively? And four, of the people in three, how many receive the disability support pension? Thank you. The Leader of the House. Thanks, <clears throat> President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Um, one to two, as at the 30th of June 2021, there were 16,194 applications on the public housing wait list. Of this, 3,293 applications had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. As at 31 uh, July 2021, there were 17,320 applications on the public housing wait list. Um, of this, 3,312 3, had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. Three to four. As at 30th of June 2021, there were 3,354 applications on the public housing priority wait list. Of this, 826 applications had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. As at 31 July 2021, there were 3,478 applications on the priority public housing wait list. Of this, 857 applications had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. These wait list figures are well below the numbers seen under the previous Barnett Liberal National Government, which peaked at 24,136 in 2009-10. The Honourable Sophia Mamons. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer the Minister to the harm minimisation strategies, priority substances and priority populations outlined in the Australian Government's National Drug Strategy 2017 and 2026, and I ask one, how many West Australians are currently incarcerated for cannabis-related crimes? Um, are female Indigenous adults, are male Indigenous adults, or are Indigenous minors? 
Thank you. Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. It is not possible to provide the member with a response within the time available, and I ask the member to place this question on notice. More generally, requests for statistical information may require the agency to manually search through individual records or files which may or may not be held off-site before the agency is able to comply with an answer. Every effort is made to answer questions without notice in the limited time available. However, it is for the above reasons that I have previously asked the member to place such questions on notice and do so again today. The Hon. Brian Walker. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Local Government. I refer the Minister to his response to my earlier question, number 194, of the 1st of June 2021, on the review of the Cemeteries Act, and I ask, which key stakeholders were invited to contribute to the early targeted stakeholder consultation? And two, given their vocal and consistent public protests around renewal over the past five years, why was the Saving Family Headstones at Karakata Group not included in that initial contact? The Leader of the House. President, thank you, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, as part of the Cemeteries and Cremation Act review, the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries, DLGSC, has invited contributions to early targeted consultation from various relevant stakeholders. As this consultation is ongoing, a list of key stakeholders contacted thus far is provided. And, President, there is a list which I seek to have incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thank you. Two, as part of this consultation, the DLGSC sent email correspondence to representatives of the Saving Family Headstones at Karakata Group during May of this year, inviting contributions from the group. The Minister for Local Government also encouraged the Saving Family Headstones at Karakata Group to make a submission to the review in correspondence dated 20 July 2021. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. Uh, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the Government's Health Workforce Recruitment Strategy announced on 10 August and noting recent reports of the midwife from South Australia with a contract to work at Calgary Health Campus has consistently been denied entry to WA, while an influx of over 200 health workers from high-risk jurisdictions, including the United Kingdom and Ireland, are set to arrive in WA and ask one. Will the state government consider providing incentives, including supporting the cost of quarantine requirements, for interstate healthcare workers wishing to relocate to WA? Two, is your department aware of any other contracts being accepted by interstate healthcare workers willing to relocate to WA but unable to obtain a G2G pass for entry? Three, what are you and your department doing to assist those healthcare workers identified in two? And four, have you raised concerns regarding G2G applications from key healthcare workers directly with the Minister for Police? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. Uh, the following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, I am advised that the Department of Health is not able to provide the requested information in the time required, and I therefore ask the Honourable Member to place this question on notice. Honourable Member, I've just seen this now for the first time. There are some parts of it that I think could be answered next week, so I undertake to uh, see, at the very least, if I can have parts of it answered next week and to provide to you. The Hon. James Hayward. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the practical driving assessments and answers to question 399, uh, C435, and I ask, one, does the Department of Transport allow video recordings of heavy vehicle driving tests? Uh, uh, two, if yes to one, uh, why? Uh, is video recording of driving tests allowed for heavy vehicle licences and not for C-class licences? Three, in response to question 339, the Minister advised third-party cameras were not allowed to be used during driving tests due to technical, privacy and liability issues. Can the Minister please outline what the justification for their response in more detail? And four, would the use of, um, would the use of non third party cameras address technical privacy and liability issues? And if so, does the Minister support using department owned video technology to record driving tests? Leader of the House. President, thank you. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question one to two. The Department of Transport has a contract with heavy vehicle assessors to conduct assessments on behalf of the department. Cameras were rolled out following recommendations from a previous 
Triple uh, C investigation that found a number of heavy vehicle drivers were being licensed without having their competence adequately assessed at a former truck driving school in 2015. This footage is only accessible if a significant breach of assessment is identified as part of the Department of Transport's audit regime. This is not the case with C-class licence assessments. Three to four, the answer to question without notice 399 stated that the use of private or third party cameras would raise technical privacy and liability issues. This is because C-class assessments are undertaken in privately owned vehicles. There are adequate audit regimes in place to ensure the consistency of assessments conducted and to assist with providing feedback to candidates. Uh, the Hon. Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. My question without notice, uh, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. And I refer to the response to uh, LCQWN 475 asked yesterday related to the practice of transfer of foreign seafarers to shore and onto outbound aircraft in Port Hedland International Airport. And I asked by way of clarification if the Minister says, referring to a 14 day quarantine period, that it is not a WA health requirement for international seafarers to undertake a two-week quarantine period on board a vessel prior to transfer off the vessel, as this would not guarantee that, not, uh, uh, that there is not a COVID-19 outbreak on board the vessel. How does the minister guarantee there is no infection of COVID-19 among seafarers when they are being transferred through the community of Port Hedland? And two, as the minister says, uh, seafarers are not required to be tested prior to disembarkation if the vessel has been granted critique and the crews on board are well, when are the seafarers tested? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. <laughs> One, WA Health managed COVID-19 risks of international seafarers by mandating the use of infection prevention and control measures for both seafarers and transport workers through the maritime crew directions and the transport and accommodation services exposure maritime worker directions. These directions stipulate various requirements, including that travel must occur via a dedicated conveyance for international seafarers and strict infection prevention and control measures are applied. Two, testing is arranged by the Department of Health for international seafarers where there is concern of COVID-19 illness on a vessel. Uh, the Hon. Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been provided, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to the Minister's comments on the public housing program in the Geraldton suburb of Spalding and I ask, one, when will the, pro uh, the program public housing in Spalding be announced? Two, how many, homes, sorry, how many houses in the program is expected to deliver? And three, when is the program expected to be completed? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable uh, member for some notice of the question. One to three, the McGowan government is acutely aware of the issues regarding uh, the Geraldton suburb of Spalding and visited the area recently. The minister is actively progressing a range of options to return social housing stock across the state, including in Spalding. In progressing these options, the minister continues to work with a range of stakeholders, including the city of Greater Geraldton. The Honourable Steve Thomas. I'm uh, sorry, the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, I've, I've answered anything just about, President. Um, thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to the Wave Energy Research Centre in Albany, which was announced in 2017 at the same time as the failed $15.75 million Carnegie Energy Project, opened on the November, in November 2019 and was funded by $3.7 million Royalties for Regions grant. And I ask one, how much of the $3.5 million has now been acquitted? Two, how much of the $3.5 million is unspent? Three, what research papers or other outcomes has, has the Wave Energy Research Centre delivered? Four, how will the government measure the success or failure of this project and has that turnover been made? And five, apologies for the spelling mistake, based on the research of the centre, will the government invest in Wave Energy projects in Albany in the future? Minister for Regional Development. Well, I, I thank the member for this question, but I just want to uh, uh, set the context because uh, some people could be led into error by the uh, uh, by the some of the provocative uh, uh, features of the uh, of the question. So, just to set the record straight, uh, we uh, we had a common user infrastructure project with Carnegie when Carnegie went into temporary uh, administration. We terminated that contract. We uh, paid a total of uh, $1.4 million 
um, in respect of the early work that was done on that project and that information, all of the data and studies that were paid for um, in that $1.4 million are now a public resource and provide uh, useful uh, information for energy and shipping industries. Uh, so our government's support for the marine energy sector, and in particular our $3.5 million investment in the UWA uh, Energy Research Centre, has been actually a great success story. The centre currently employs more than 30 researchers, supports a knowledge hub for wave, tidal and offshore energy industries, as well as a research facility to support large-scale commercial deployments of off offshore renewable energy. The centre also supports research for local marine-based industries. The project is still active and funding won't be acquitted until the completion of the project. And I understand there is only around um, uh, $3,000 yet to be, uh, to be granted. But the member will be incredibly pleased to know that to date there has been 43 peer-reviewed research papers that have been published by the members of the centre. Uh, and of note, three common user resource data sets related to the wave energy resource and coastal conditions at the Torbay site are available to the public and wave energy developers at the centre's website. And uh, just last year, researchers from the centre were selected to join the newly established Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre, a federal government initiative investigating the sustainable use of uh, ocean resources to drive economic uh, growth. Um, there has the FAA agreement that was signed between the state government and UWA for the uh, centre specifies that there will be um, key performance indicators, a report on key performance indicators, looking at scientific research, community outreach, industry engagement and regional uh, impact when the project is fully completed. Uh, and all indications to date, as I said, 43 peer-reviewed research papers plus numerous um, uh, community engagement exercises, I have no doubt it will be judged a success. And five, the research is telling us that there is a potential for wave and other offshore energy systems to play a role in decarbonising our economy, and we remain open to all opportunities. The Honourable Jorn Sibmer. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice is provided, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health, uh, question C480. And I refer to your April 14 media statement, uh, quote, important staffing boost for WA hospitals, and I ask, one, how many of the 1,000 newly qualified nurses committed to in the release have been employed to date? Two, of those, how many have been offered and accepted either A, permanent full-time contracts or B, short-term contracts? Three, how many reside in Western Australia? And four, how many have relocated from either A, interstate or B, overseas? The Minister for Mental Health. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, 949 newly qualified nurses and midwives, NQNM. 2A Neil are still in their transition to practice program, TPP. 2B, 949, all NQNM are offered fixed term contracts. They, these are usually 12 months that range from 0 0.6 FTE minimum to full time while they complete their TPP. 3, 949, uh, 4A, five midwives, Queensland and Northern Territory, B Neil. The Honourable Nick Guerin. That notice of which some notice has been given this to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Child Protection. I refer to the Government's announcement on 6 January 2021, committing $37.2 million to the Home Stretch program. And I ask one, how much of this funding has been allocated to date? Two, which organisations are recipients of this funding? Three, how many young people left care in 2020-2021? in the, that reporting period. Four, how many of the young people identified in three are supported by the Home Stretch Program? And five, how many young people are supported by the Home Stretch Program in total? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. And I thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Child Protection. 
One to two, the announcement in January 2021 was an election commitment. Funding of election commitments is being considered through the 2021-22 state budget process, which is currently underway. Details regarding funding allocation will be available after the release of the 2021-22 state budget. The Department of Communities will undertake a procurement process to determine the most appropriate recipients across the funding period. Three, 897, four, five, supported through the current home stretch trial. Five, there are 15 places available for allocation to young people in the communities funded home stretch trial in the Fremantle district. In 2020-2021, two young people turned 21 and aged out of the trial. As at the 30th of June, 2021, there were 13 active participants. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, President. President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Education. I refer to question without notice 173, asked on the 27th of May 2021, regarding the trial of a new $1.2 million culturally and linguistically diverse early years link program. And I ask one, can the minister confirm whether this funding has been approved by the department? has been provided sorry, by the Department of Education, and two, if no to one, which department has provided the funding? The Leader of the House. Member for some notice of the question, one yes, two not applicable. The Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice, notice which some notice is given is being redirected to the Minister for Mental Health. Um, I refer the Minister to the media statement of 7 May 2019, titled McGowan Government Takes Action on Methamphetamine Issues, and asks one, has a 10-bed crisis centre been established in Midland? If not, why not? Two, if yes to one, uh, what was the total cost of the crisis centre? Three, has a $9.2 million comprehensive alcohol and other drugs youth service been established in the Kimberley? If not, why not? And two, if yes to three, what was the total cost of the youth service? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Honourable Member, the question that was submitted to me did have uh, 7 May 2021, but of course my, off my office went back and found the 2019 press release, and so I've answered it with that date in mind. Okay. Um, so, one, uh, a six bed facility was opened in April 2021. Ten beds were not possible due to the physical limitations of the existing building that was renovated to accommodate the Midland Withdrawal and Intervention Centre. Two, $759,000 for capital and $4.8 million recurrent, $0.2 million in 2019-20, uh, $1.53 million in 2020-21, $1.546 million in 2021-22, and $1.562 million in 2022-23. Uh, three, no, the Mental Health Commission has undertaken in a comprehensive co-design process with local stakeholders in the development of the service model, which was significantly delayed due to travel restrictions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Mental Health Commission is currently developing the procurement plan for the service. For the total cost of the service is yet to be established. However, the allocated budget for the Kimberley Youth Alcohol and Drug Service is $21 million. Uh, $3.264 million in 2021-22, $5.954 million in 2022-23, $5.954 million in 2023-24, 20, and $5.954 million in 2024-25. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. Notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Emergency Services. I refer to the media statement issued on July 7, 2021, titled Boost for Emergency Services in Local Communities, which states, and I quote, McGowan Government delivers on election commitments for emergency services, end quote, and I ask one, how has this $310,000 election commitment been funded? Two, was any component of the $310,000 in funding provided through the emergency services levy? And three, if yes to two, please detail which projects were funded and the amount of emergency service levy allocated to each project. Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. <clears throat> One, this was funded through consolidated appropriation. Two, no. Three, not applicable. The honourable James Hayward. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to support services for the ageing in Collie uh, and the community resource centres. And I ask: One, has the minister received a request to establish a community resource centre in Collie? If yes, to one, uh, was the request approved? If no, to two, why not? Uh, how many new uh, community resource centres have been established since April 2017, and where were they established? The Minister uh, I for thank Regional the, Development. Uh, I thank the member for the question. Um, I have not received a submission. Um, I am aware that uh, there has been a, uh, a, 
uh, a constituent of Collie who has uh, contacted the local member uh, and written to a minister about um, the problems that aged people are having with IT uh, in Collie, um, including interactions with Telstra. Um, and the letter that I've seen certainly wasn't a, a request for a CRC. Uh, there was a request for a CRC uh, in inquiry made by um, a, a, a service provider, a, a, a commercial service provider that tends to use CRCs in the southwest, as to whether uh, there was one in Collie, so they could uh, use that CRC to deliver their services um, that they are uh, paid to deliver by the uh, Commonwealth. But we, uh, uh, there isn't a, uh, a CRC um, application being considered for Collie. Collie is um, uh, considerably larger than any other town that, uh, aside from Broome, which is special circumstances, that has a, uh, has a CRC. Uh, the only new uh, application that we uh, are looking at is for one in um, uh, mining and pastoral region. The vast majority of the uh, CRCs are uh, in the southwest, so there is quite a disproportionate arrangement. So we're not at this point considering that. Um, but we are talking to um, uh, uh, Minister Don Punch, who's Minister for Seniors and for IT, about what services might be available or programs to enhance IT skills for seniors. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister Epson and the Minister for Planning, and I refer to concerns raised by residents of Subiaco, including previous four mayors of Subiaco, about plans for the property development for up to 6,000 new residents at the Subi East redevelopment. And I ask, how does the Minister for Planning propose to ensure there is adequate playing fields facilities for the Bob Hawke College on the site adjoining the sites, noting the requirements of the state planning policy? Two, is the minister aware of the concerns of the residents, parents and the PNC Association about the safety of children due to the proximity and intensity of apartment and commercial developments and what measures have been taken to address these concerns? Three, has Development WA undertaken traffic modelling as a result of the proposed development, including at peak times during school pickup? And if yes, can the minister table that modelling? And four, what is the most recent estimate? Uh, estimated net value of this to, to the state of the proposed Subi East development dollars and over what time frame? The Leader of the House. President, thank you, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, Bobport College has priority access to use Subiaco Oval for student recreation uh, during school hours. In addition, the Department of Education recently constructed eight basketball courts on land between Subiaco Oval and the college. Two to three, following the strong advocacy of the Member for Nedlands, the Member for Perth and the Member for Churchlands, the Government has committed to install two new pedestrian crossings in the area to improve pedestrian safety. Four, Subi East is expected to attract some $1 billion in private sector investment over the next 20 years. President, I ask the business of the House be resumed. The business of the House is resumed. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Yes, President. Leader of the House. President, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 170, asked by the Honourable Donna Farragher to me, the Minister for Education and Training. Further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Uh, Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Jorn Sidmer's question without notice 478, which was asked on the 11th of August 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into hand. So. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thanks, President. Uh, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 153, asked by the Honourable uh, Brad, Dr Brad Pettit, to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, that document is tabled. Um, and, President, pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I inform the House that the answer to question on Notice 156 asked by the Honourable Martin Aldridge on 16 June 2021 to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health, will be provided on 7 September 2021. Pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I inform the House that the answers to questions on Notice 155 and 160 asked by the Honourable Martin Aldridge on 16 June 2021 to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health, will be provided on 16 September 2021. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? The Minister for Regional Development. Um, President, I would like to provide an updated answer to the Honourable Steve Thomas's question without notice 464 asked uh, of me 
uh, in my capacity representing the Minister for Energy on 10 August 2021. An error, albeit of less than 1 per cent, has been identified in some of the information provided as part of the original response. Uh, the, answer to, the answer to one is unchanged from the re original response. For completeness, however, it is included in the revised answer below. Uh, the answer to two is slightly higher than was provided in the original response. The error is equal to less than one per cent of the uh, and the updated figures are attached. And I apologise to the House for the error. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Uh, members, we move to uh, back to order of the day number twenty number twenty financial legislation amendment bill and the question is the bill be read a second time oh, or in committee I should have asked the question Members, we're in committee of the whole dealing with the financial legislation amendment bill 2021. And the question is that clause one do stand as printed, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Minister, hard to get back into it at this point, but we'll give it a go. Uh, Minister, can I just assume then that the various changes to the Financial uh, Management Act uh, obviously aren't going to apply to the budget that we'll see in a few weeks' time. But is it going to be in place in sufficient time frame to apply to what is presumably the uh, the May 2022 budget process? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, Honourable Member, uh, you are correct. It won't be in place for this year's budget. It does reflect a number of the practices already in operation, though. However, the intention is to have it um, in effect for, for next budget. Thank you. The Thank you. So, I mean, that would make sense, I guess. Um, so, the expectation is that it will apply. So. You know, you will go, I assume, almost immediately from this budget into the next budget process, given that they'll be, uh, well, September to May. Um, so you'd almost go in a normal year. I suspect you'd start in August. So where you'd be you'd be starting now um, in your negotiations. So um, is there is there is there a budget? And next year, yeah, no, I'm sure that's the case. So, is there sufficient time, particularly in relation to sort of proclamation and things, to apply this in, into that process for for next year, uh, particularly in terms of the new systems around budget um, uh, draft, budget estimates, etc. Yes. Minister. Oh, there is. So that's a yes. Okay. Well, leader of the opposition. Uh, thank you, chair. So we might we might have to hold you to account for that, just in case there's uh, any issue. Sorry to put stress on the staff present, but you know that's why they paid the big bucks. So uh, uh, thank you, minister. Um, so then, in relation to those those draft budget as a process, can you just give us a quick outline of the difference between well what currently exists and the new process that you've got in place? Because there's obviously Obviously, departments draw up draft budgets, etc. Um, they can't operate without that, and they go into those negotiations. So, what, what's, what's, the, what's the shift? In, we can do that in more detail when we get to the appropriate clause. But in general, what, what's the shift in the intent? Uh, 
space for stuff. Minister. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, so, currently requirements and processes for uh, resource agreements and annual estimates are not clear in the FMA, so a large part of clauses 10 and 11 provides that clarity in relation to timeframes for, for agency submission and the process for approval, and also provide clear pathways to resolution if agreement is unable to be reached within a specified timeframe in the budget. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we'll do that a bit more when we actually get to the clause, probably. Yeah, so that's fine. Uh, Minister, in relation to, um, and it's, it's one of those questions, just not, it's not in the bill, um, but perhaps it might be considered. So, um, debt, debt that's held by um, government entities, not so much GTEs because it's covered under its enabling legislation, but debt that is held by government departments. Was there any consideration given to including the management of departmental debts in the review of the Financial Management Act? Minister. Thank you. So I'm told because departments aren't legal entities, they can't have debts. So the debts are held centrally. Oh, just, just before I hand on to someone else to have a go, I might just um, have another look at that because my understanding is that um, uh, short-term debt by departments does occur. So we'll, yeah, yeah. So we'll 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 have a we'll have a bit through that at the process. Yeah. So Minister, thing as treasurer's repayable advances. Yeah. Perhaps that was that's what you may be talking okay. talking about. No, that's okay. I'll give, I'll give someone else a chance. The honourable Graham. Minister, uh, in your second reading reply, you mentioned that the Auditor General had been consulted throughout uh, this bill. Is that in regards to the uh, bill in the 40th Parliament or in regards to this bill in the 41st Parliament? Minister. Thank you. So I'm told the consultation happened in the previous parliament in relation to the, to the last bill. The Honourable Nick Graham. Oh, this, in, it, I'll start with a comment and then the, a question. I, th I think it's regrettable that there hasn't been a more recent uh, consultation with the Office of the Auditor General to see if there could be any further improvements made uh, in the bill. Uh, that said, with regard to the feedback that was provided in the uh, previous parliament, were there any concerns raised by the Auditor General with regard to any of the elements found in the bill? Minister. Thank you. come back on that. I'll remember. So the, the advisers here don't have that information, so we will take it on. look into it, take it on notice and come back. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. And um, while that process is being uh, undertaken between now and the next uh, sitting occasion, could you also um, uh, ascertain if the feedback from the Auditor General um, recommended that any matters be brought into this legislation which have not been brought in? Minister. We can take that on, on board as well and come back. Gentleman Grant. Now, um, Minister, in response to an earlier question to the Leader of the Opposition, you made reference to a, um, a 2014 uh, review. Wh which review is that one? Yes, so that 2012 review was finalised and went to Cabinet in 2014. Okay. Yep. So that, thank you, uh, Chairman. So, Minister, that is uh, the 2012 uh, statutory review of the Financial Management Act of 2006 that was undertaken by the Standing Committee on Audit. And as we identified earlier, uh, this bill implements uh, eight of the eight of the recommendations from that 2012 review. Uh, are there any recommendations in either the 2012 review or the 2017 review that are not being implemented by this legislation? And, and if so, it may well be the case that some of them are not being implemented because this is not the mechanism to do that or because they've already been uh, implemented. I'm interested particularly to know of anything that hasn't been implemented to date and is still not being implemented in this bill. Thank you. Uh, we don't have that information before us, honourable member, but um, you have uh, you've made your request and it will be recorded in Hansard, so we'll make sure we uh, look at the Hansard to, uh, to ascertain the information that, that has, you have requested. And, um, Minister, you, you mentioned that there are uh, eight of the 2012 recommendations, eight of the recommendations in the 2012 review that are being implemented in this bill. And you also said that there are seven of the recommendations from the 2017 review that are being brought in by this bill. And you helpfully set out what those things were. Are there other aspects of this bill? that are, uh, have been brought forward which do not flow from those two recommendations. So ancillary things that might have been brought up, by, for example, by the Auditor-General. Government themselves have decided that they want to, to implement certain things. Are there anything, is there anything in the bill that's been brought about outside of the review process? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. So rather than thinking on the run, as we're, we're trying to do at the moment, Honourable Member, uh, we will take that question away as well and just make sure we, uh, uh, we consider it properly and come back with a response next week. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question about uh, the accountability of um, Directors General. If a Director General, or should I say an accountable authority, um, breaches their resource agreement um, without authorisation, without going through the process outlined in the bill. Uh, are there any consequences for that directly? Minister. Thank you, Chairman. I, I do apologise, Honourable Member. Uh, 
having a conversation about Hansard and, and providing information to Hansard, so I didn't hear your question. Would you mind repeating it for me, please? Uh, on that note, members, I'm going to interrupt proceedings to report progress. Hopefully hands out have it. And so if it's there, I'll get you an answer. That's All right, that's it now. So if you guys have to get you out. President, the Committee of the Whole has considered the Financial Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 made progress and seeks to sit again. Minister. President, I move that the report be adopted. Minister, the question is the report be adopted. All those of our opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, members noting the time, we will now move to members' statements. Right, Are there any members' statements? The um, Honourable Matthew Swinburne. Thank you, um, I rise tonight to announce the formation of the Parliamentary Friends of People with Rare and Undiagnosed Diseases. I will convene this new group in conjunction with the Honourable Donna Farragher and the Honourable Stephen Pratt. And I'd like to thank them um, at the outset for their willing involvement and collaboration in this new uh, Parliamentary Friendship Group. As the majority of members in this place know, the issue of rare diseases is very close to my heart. Uh, I have spoken a number of occasions of my family's journey living with a rare disease, in fact, a multiple rare diseases. Rare, disease, rare and undiagnosed diseases are usually characterised by poorly managed pain, both intellectual and physical disabilities, mental health burdens on both the patient or the person suffering the disease and those close to them, and unfortunately premature death. While WA Health estimate there are five to 8,000 people suffering uh, rare diseases, rare diseases collectively are not uncommon, affecting between six and 8% of the population. This includes close to 200,000 Western Australians, of which 63, approximately 63,000 are children. It also affects their families and the broader community in terms of uh, the impact and, and the costs on our health system. My family's experience with rare diseases uh, has given me a personal and detailed insight into the fight many people have received, uh, have receiving correct diagnosis and appropriate care and treatment for their disease. One of the big issues regarding rare diseases, rare and undiagnosed diseases, is the lack of community and clinical awareness of the nature and depth of the issues associated with this disease. And many people uh, with rare diseases struggle for diagnosis, hence why we have included a group of rare and undiagnosed disease, because there is a large proportion of people out there that are still fighting for recognition of what they're suffering. The, rare, uh, the friendship group, we hope the friendship group will provide opportunities for members of parliament to learn about the needs of people with rare and undiagnosed diseases and the challenges and opportunities involved in providing care and services to them. Facilitate communication between people and organisations working with people with rare diseases uh, and members of parliament. Increase awareness and raise the profile of rare and undiagnosed diseases in the community generally raise awareness of the, op of the role and opportunity of innovation, data, research, policy and national and international partnerships in the rare disease space, promote an understanding of the work undertaken by health professionals, researchers and organisations who provide care and services to people who live with rare and undiagnosed diseases, and also to champion initiatives and that seek to deliver improved outcomes for people with rare and undiagnosed diseases and their families. We are working closely with a number of figures and groups uh, within the WA rare diseases community, including uh, Kane Blackman, the Deputy Chair of Rare Voices Australia, Dr Gareth Bainham, the Head of the West Australian Register of Developmental Anom Anomalies and the Combined Birth Defects and Cerebral Palsy Registers, and my friend Andrew Bannister, a wonderful and prominent rare disease campaigner uh, in Perth, who uh, many of you uh, may recall I spoke about before and has organised the lighting up of uh, significant sites around Perth. Uh, 
the state and internationally uh, for Rare Diseases Day. And Andrew is a tireless um, campaigner for raising awareness around rare disease and suffers for his own rare disease. So the group will be officially launched by the Premier and the Leader of the Opposition on Tuesday the 19th of October um, during the dinner break in the courtyard. And we'll be joined um, at Parliament by many of uh, figures within the rare diseases community. And I sincerely hope that members will take up the opportunity to meet them and to learn about how important it is we continue working to address rare and undiagnosed disease. Thank you. President, this keeps running. President. Um, before I make my statement, I want to just congratulate uh, the Honourable uh, Matt Swinburne for that. I look forward very much to interacting with that new friends group. Um, this also is, uh, refers to uh, medical issues. In fact, uh, earlier on we had a question from the Honourable uh, Martin Aldridge regarding that Adelaide nurse who was attempting to seek employment, and had been granted employment in Kalgoorlie, uh, but had been denied entry because of the G2G uh, issues. Now, bearing in mind, I'm very familiar with the need for uh, adequate protection uh, uh, to all residents of Western Australia, and that I thoroughly approve of what is happening uh, with, under the care of uh, both our Health Minister and our Premier. I'm noticing here that she has been denied entry and um, at the same time, uh, we note that there is a need in regional areas for uh, adequate qualified healthcare personnel. And she is willing to come and she is recognised and able to come, but not permitted to come. And she says here, bearing in mind that we're also saying we're lacking these people, let's bring them in from abroad, let's pay for their flights, let's pay for their accommodation. And she then says, and I quote here, to see that they had claimed that there were not enough people willing to work in rural Western Australia, so they were outsourcing, it just made me really angry because that's completely untrue, Ms John said. And I then go on to, um, that was not my, my, my constituent, of course. I do, however, uh, have correspondence from uh, someone from abroad, a PhD student who has been granted a research position as a PhD student at Curtin University. Now, this is not going to be researching the benefits of uh, some particular mollusk. It's not about um, uh, researching economic theory. This actually is medical research, and he's specialising uh, in uh, research which would, uh, quote this here, facilitating the research into untreatable cancers, like pancreatic cancer. Now, this is of significance to all of our patients who are suffering from cancers, because if we can unlock yet another key in managing cancer, this would be of benefit to every Australian, not just West Australian. And the only thing stopping him from coming in, he has approval from the university, letters of support from the university. He has a full um, um, uh, stipendium. He is not going to be a burden on our state. He has accommodation paid for. He is a valued and respected international researcher. But what we can't get is a G2G. So we have, hopefully, nurses coming in to work in Kalgoorlie from abroad, and that's nice. It's certainly needed. We're not allowing our homegrown nurses to enter our state. And by the same token, another international researcher is not allowed to come into our state. Now, I see here there is uh, inconsistency. I appreciate the policy, I welcome the policy of keeping us safe, but we must have a consistent application of these policies. We either apply it to everybody in that category or to none. And I would beg that the government reconsider allowing this student in as he is going to be of service to all Australians. The Honourable Pierre Yang. Then I wish to draw the House attention to a situation in uh, the University of Western Australia. Uh, there is a proposed job cuts at that university, uh, um, and uh, especially the uh, end result would be the trashing of the School of Social Science um, and uh, the discipline of uh, political science and international relations and the discipline of anthropology and sociology will be particularly um, um, targeted. Now, um, President, just with a bit of background, the discipline of school, um, sorry, the discipline of political science and international relations <clears throat> currently have 
four high-level uh, research and teaching positions uh, according to the UWA categorization. That's category, sorry, levels uh, D and level E. And uh, if the proposal uh, is going ahead, only one of the four positions will be retained. And it's even worse for the discipline of uh, anthropology and sociology. The entire uh, discipline will disappear. Uh, all eight positions, research and teaching positions, will go at the end of the process. The um, management of the university cited the drop in enrollment uh, was uh, one of the major reasons for the cut. And the other one is the need to balance its books. Now, the, um, the, um, um, the, the university has later retracted of the alleged 70% drop in enrollment and uh, claimed it to be 40% drop. Um, I, I find these uh, reasons to be very, very shaky. I have a particular interest in this matter because I have had a long association with the University of Western Australia. I uh, attended the uni as a full-time student uh, at the, the law school and also the School of Political Science between 2002 and 2007, and also continued on as a part-time student between 2007 and 2009 as a political science uh, honours degree student uh, part-time, and I've started a uh, PhD course in 2018 uh, part-time at this university. Um, I, I want to provide this for the purpose of full disclosure. UWA has a proud history, and it has been not only uh, the uh, premier university for the state of Western Australia, but also for Australasia and the Asia Pacific. To see that, um, uh, and um, its, its, its achievement excellence and excellence uh, is built on its combined quality in teaching and also research. Uh, in a vast number of fields. To dismantle its own research capability, um, President, um, by cutting so many um, renowned academics and uh, world-leading researchers is just unbelievable, just unbelievable. UWA is doing itself an incredible disservice, President. The management, uh, as I mentioned, claimed 70%, rather, it's actually 77% drop in enrollment. Um, and this was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was refuted. And then the university management claims this to be 40% drop. As a matter of fact, when I had a conversation with a number of academics at the university, including uh, Professor Mark Beeson, uh, the university staff has, have suggested uh, and uh, advised that there is actually a 4% increase in enrollment over the past uh, uh, year. And let's not forget, um, this was achieved with the backdrop of the word COVID-19 pandemic. The School of Political Science, uh, the School of Social Science, and all of its academic and uh, um, um, research and teaching staff should be congratulated and applauded for their achievement and yet they are facing the real possibility of being chopped from their job. This is not acceptable. This is not good enough. President, um, the, the Western Australian community is now facing a real prospect that this university, a world-leading research university, is now fastly becoming a degree factory, and it is not good enough for the people of Western Australia. UWA has had a $55 million operating surplus last year. And yet, through some creative accounting system, there is an item called underlying result, which was a negative $2.4 million. And as cited, this is not an accounting, uh, a statutory accounting statement, uh, and it is not used. As reported in uh, WA Today by journalist Asia Stiles, uh, quoting Murdoch University professor James Guthrie, um, it's, 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 um, it's, uh, it's not an account, a statutory accounting statement. I think that carries some weight. President, any management is understandably trying to balance their books, and it needs to do that. But creative accounting to manufacture an operating loss, uh, of, well, a, a loss of some kind, um, so there is a need to balance, balance its books, should be stopped and called out. Um, there is one more irony here, members. There is one more irony. 
uh, the school of um, 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 uh, uh, the discipline of uh, political science actually made a $4.3 million um, gross margin, uh, which, represented, uh, which re represents 23.4 per cent of the entire school's gross margin. For those like myself who don't have an uh, accounting or finance background, um, gross margin is defined as the operating um, 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 uh, the net uh, sale uh, revenue minus uh, the cost of goods sold. So to me, that's a, a pretty handsome profit um, um, for, for the school to achieve and for the discipline to achieve. President, it is beyond me why the management is um, unfairly targeting the School of Social Science, and in particular the, the discipline of anthropology and sociology, and uh, the discipline of um, uh, political science and uh, international relations. The University of Western Australia has $1 billion in cash or cash equivalent uh, investments. It is bizarre, President, it is bizarre why UWA management is trying to um, at the same time, build up a 15 per cent cash margin by 2025 uh, while well targeting a school that is well run, well liked by the staff and students, and then popular among prospective students and current students. It's just beyond me. Uh, President, I think the U University of Western Australia management has some serious answers, uh, some quest serious questions to answer, some serious questions to answer. President, um, I think the impact of this draft proposal, if achieved by the university management, management is going to be devastating, far-reaching and long-lasting. Uh, as uh, Professor James Guthrie said, uh, and I quote, the cuts are done at the expense of ongoing academic and professional staff and employees who are the human capital which drives teaching research and student experience. Do we really want to have an institution that just provides um, a degree to students and we're going to forego our research capability that this state has been having in the University of Western Australia forever? Uh, President, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Education should not be just about the bottom line. And uh, if it was, so John Winthrop Hackett would not have, um, um, would not have bequeathed uh, £425,000 back in the early to, uh, 20th century. Um, I, I also note that uh, um, the, the Honourable uh, John, uh, Sir John uh, Winthrop Hackett was also a member of this place, served between 1890 and 1916. He, his his, um, his um, um, legacy to the University of Western Australia enabled the university to build a number of uh, facilities, as we, we heard about, um, you know, for, for, um, for those who attend the university, the Winthrop Hall and also the Hacker Hall. And uh, the university retained um, um, 20,000 pounds for uh, uh, scholarship and, and future expenditures. And that total amount, uh, I did a quick calculation, is around 50 million Australian dollars today's, in, today's, in today's money. President, the University of Western Australia does not belong to the Vice Chancellor or the management of the university. It belongs to the people of Western Australia. If the management of the University of Western Australia cannot answer those questions, the unjustified, unfair cards simply should not go ahead. The Honourable Lorna Harper. Thank you, President and Honourable Members. Um, I got up to talk today because I wanted to reflect on some of the things that have been happening this week. Um, I've been thinking about it overnight. I went home, stewed about it, thought about it. Then this morning I received an email. And this email fired up my belly just slightly. Titled, Oz Christian Lobby says God wants men to master over women. Not really the person to send that to. <laughs> yep, so hi Lorna. We are supporters of the Australian Christian Lobby. We just want to let you know that God doesn't want women to master over men. Women are supposed to prioritise motherhood over other pursuits in life. 
Please watch the 30-second YouTube video to see our leader, Martin Lies, talking about this important issue. We will pray for you. God bless you. Obviously, <laughs> Well, I want to say thank you, but no thank you. I take care of my own well-being. I take care of my family's well-being along with my family. I do not need a bunch of people who I find to be hypocritical in the least trying to put their views onto me. We've had enough of that this week. I have found comments to be more than hypocritical. I found them to be highly offensive. To stand and actually say that people are demonstrating or protesting out of compassion is the biggest load of tripe I've heard in such a long time. How dare any man stand here and anywhere and tell a woman what she can and cannot do with her body? How dare anyone put their views on other people? If we, like Sophia said, Honourable Sophia said, if you don't have a uterus, keep quiet. If you're not pregnant, shush. If you are pregnant, it's none of your goddamn business. As a person who was pregnant during the whole debate about whether abortions were legal or not, I made a decision to have my daughter. That was my decision. I made it. Was it an easy decision? Yeah, it was. She's beautiful, she's sassy, she's 22, and she can kick butt. But she is horrified, absolutely horrified, at what some of the things these people who say they are Christians make judgment about other people, tell them, and I read, by the way, I read some of the stuff on the um, websites that were uh, um, reported today. What was it? Pregnancy Matters and Pregnancy Assistance House. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I, I honestly, I didn't look at them. For anybody not knowing, they would think there actually is a place to go and get a lot of help. Well, I was a sole parent. I had Christians telling me I was a terrible person because I had my daughter out of wedlock. And to that, it was none of your business. I've had people tell me that I shouldn't be standing here as a woman, I should be at home prioritizing my husband and my daughter. My, do my husband will be sitting laughing his head off because he says, you're a strong, independent, mouthy woman, get out there and make sure they know. So for all the strong, independent and mouthy women that are in this place, I'll say to the men, stop trying to interfere with our bodies. Stop trying to put your views on top of what we do with our bodies. And it's not just an abortion clinic. These clinics offer other services as well, including vasectomies. In my head, I'm saying we could offer that service right now to a few people quite happily. There's also counselling available. There's a lot of things put in these services. And if they actually were available in the Midland area, in the public hospital that we have there, that the Barnett government gave to a Christian, Catholic, charitable association, where people can't actually go and have those procedures, where women who have a C-section can't have the tubes tied because it's not a procedure they do. You're already in there, for goodness sake. It's a wee snip, it's not that much. But no, this hospital can't provide that. Keep out of our uteruses, keep out of our body. We decide what we do, not you, not Christians, and not any other religion, we do. And standing outside harassing people who are trying to make an informed decision is not protesting, it's bullying. And I'm ashamed, and I apologise to all those women that have had to go through that, that's had to actually be bullied and harassed and made to feel bad because they are taking charge of what they have to say in their bodies. Now, I'm really sad that some of our honourable colleagues had to go away and... What's it? Absolutely. Urgent parliamentary business. Thank you. Business. Absent on urgent parliamentary business. I am still new to this. I'm still practising. Um, I am sad that they're not here, but I'm sure at some point they will hear it. And if they want, I can repeat it all very clearly um, face to face. Thank you. The Honourable Brad Pettit. I rise again to speak about the need for climate action. And I wanted to start by um, acknowledging 
the words of the Minister for Agriculture and Food this morning um, in, in a statement that actually said that this week's IPCC report was yet another graphic reminder mm. that we need to move quickly on climate change mitigation. It was very heartening to hear that. Mm. Mr McTiernan was actually, sorry, the Honourable Minister was the only person in either house that I'm aware of that actually has spoken on this matter from either government or opposition this week. And that, I guess, I find much less heartening. Um, the Minister for Climate Action, how, however... There's been, there been, there's been some short comments in the, on the media. So the, um, for those, the, the, the Minister says, so the Premier has made some short comments in the media, but um, certainly no comments in the Parliament and no statement on this matter. In fact, even the Minister for Climate Action, and I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, the only comment I'm aware of from her making is a Facebook post. Um, which is a good one, and I actually congratulate her on that. But, and I'll read it to you here. It says, the alarming IPCC report confirms that Australia must do better. The federal government has no firm plan to get to net zero, and the, and the COP26 targets fell well short of those submitted, uh, submitted by other uh, resource light nations, including the US and Canada. It's simply not good enough, and the federal government must increase their ambitions. The McGowan government is committed to transitioning this state's economy to net zero, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 through important policies focused on sustainable industries, including hydrogen, carbon farming, batteries and electric vehicles. Now, that, that's a good statement, and I do commend her on that, and there's some good policies in train. But the point I want to, want to make, and I would be very happy to have this discussion in this House, is I don't, that those policies don't get us to where the science needs to go. Um, and I would happily have that dis discussion with you, with, with, with you, Minister, on, on that very point. In fact, the questions I've been asking this week in this chamber, I think, indicate some pretty nebulous answers to actually, does the plan actually match the science, su suggests that, 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 that it doesn't. Um, there was another, um, and the science, to be clear, just to remind people, would see that our emissions need to drop by 45 to 50% by 2030, and by 100% by 2050, and that should be a legislative target. For those of you who missed it, there was an opinion piece in, in the West today by, by, by Peter Law, which, which was titled, The ALP Can End Its Green Days, a Dramatic Urine Report on Climate Change Can Spur Rural Action. Um, and it described the, the government's climate policy as a vague document padded out with motherhood statements. I, I think that's probably a little bit harsh, but um, because I think there's actually some really good, 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 good policies in there. But I do think we need to remind ourselves that this policy, is, this plan, is not going to get us there. Um, the, the minister's Facebook post at, at the heart tries to put the blame of this inaction at the feet of the federal government, and that's actually a point I. Well, let's agree on something really strong here. The federal government must do more, and, um, and, and I think we've been all rather depressed by watching their inaction. But I will respond to that by saying this is actually where all levels of government must lead. I mean, and this starts at the local level. The city of Fremantle, which I led for a number of years, was the first carbon neutral government in WA, the second after the city of Sydney, and, um, and has a 100% renewable energy target by 2025. The city of Subiaco has actually just um, also got a 100% renewable energy target by 2025 and have, got, have, have been one of the first to get a certified um, carbon neutral status. Um, and, Really, congratulations to them for doing that really recently. And they've also got an operational greenhouse gas target of 45% by 2030, consistent with the science. The try of Market River has gone even further, net zero by 2030 for both their community and their corporate emissions. And it's not just local governments who, who are acting. We are seeing, and look, I could go through all the states. Let me just give you some examples, because every single state is doing more than us. Victoria is one of the first to legislate net, net, net zero. Um, they have got um, really good targets, 28 to 33 per cent reductions by 2025, 45 to 50 per cent reductions by 2030, and of course net zero by 2050. New South Wales, a Liberal state, have plans to reduce their, their emissions by 35 per cent by 2030 compared to 2005 levels. Again, a legislative, legislative net zero 2050 targets. Um, one of my favourite quotes, and I think, um, is that you need to judge an organisation or a state by its budget as much as by its policies. And I think, you know, and then I would say, you can look at New South Wales in this case as well, which has recently put aside $750 million to actually cut their carbon emissions. I think it's interesting coming from a conservative Liberal government. 
South Australia has been a leader in this space for a long time. Again, really good targets, 100 per cent renewables by 2030, uh, uh, and they're already at 55 per cent. They've already, re already actually recorded a 32 per cent reduction in, in carbon emissions from 2005 levels. I could go on and on. I, I'm not going to go through the rest of the states, even though I have them all in front of me here. But I do want, what I do want to say is um, I, I, just, I, I implore us to actually not keep saying this plan we've got is good enough. And I think the IPCC report before us shows us it's not good enough. Um, this is actually an opportunity to, to do more. We are the only state with rising emissions. Um, and I think that tells us something. Um, and we also are the only state without a clear plan for 2030 or a legislated target for 2050. So I, I can't make that case any more clearly than I am now. I'd also say that lots of the levers actually sit with us, be it energy, be it transport, be it buildings, be it planning, be it agriculture, as the Minister talked about this morning. We've got the levers sit with us as a state. We, we can actually make changes, even when there is a lack of leadership at a, a, at a federal level. So let's do that. Um, and I think it's a really fantastic ambition. I don't want us to be the laggard state or the laggard nation, but that's currently where we are sitting. So there is an amazing opportunity to turn this crisis into an opportunity, and I think, uh, and again, I'll, I turn to some of the things that uh, the Honourable Minister McTiernan is doing. There is some in this space; it's fantastic. We just need to see more of this across all of the portfolios in a, into a coordinated plan. Um, and it's going to require leadership on both sides of the house, and this is actually really important because I know that every time we do get leadership on one side, we hear the other side pushing back and actually not backing it in, it makes it really hard. So I actually employing both sides of the house and the cross bench, all of us to work together on this because this is actually what it needs. The enemy around climate is no longer denial. No one who is is of sound mind. Thank you. Can deny. The, the enemy is actually around delay and silence and, and inaction. So that's the space I think we're in now. And I just want to finish by saying, actually, looking forward to working with you all on this. And um, I feel greatly encouraged by actually the sense of what we can do. So thank you very much. The Honourable Peter Foster. I rise tonight to talk about young Kobe Barrow, who attends St Cecilia's, St. Cecilia's Primary School in Port Hedland. Kobe is on a mission to tackle bullying in our regional schools and is extremely passionate about keeping kids safe both in the playground and online. I had the privilege to meet Kobe, his mum Anne-Marie and the rest of his family a few weeks ago when I was in Port Hedland at the Spin Effect Spree. Kobe is raising awareness of the tackling, raisins of, sorry, and tackling bullying through his coffee lid project. Kobe has designed stickers for the coffee lids with the assistance of Sign West, a local business based in Wedgefield. Kobe's stickers say, be kind, be the change, don't be the bully. Kobe's fundraising initiative recently took place on August 7, where 14 cents from every coffee sold at participating cafes over a 96 minute period were collected. Cafes which participated in Kobe Lid's coffee project included High's Coffee in Port Hedland, Soak in Dampier and the Crave Juice Bar in the Pickle Bean in Tom Price. Kobe, who I should note to you all, is only 11 years of age and he took his inspiration from the Dolly's Dream initiative. Kobe chose 7 of August in recognition of the seven signs of bullying that you can read about on Dolly's Dream website. 14 cents because Dolly was only 14 years of age when she took her own life. And 96 minutes to represent the 96 children who unfortunately took their lives in 2019. In my first speech, I talked about some of my own personal experiences of bullying when growing up, and I was saddened to learn that Kobe as well has experienced bullying at school. As quoted in the Pilbara News on 22nd July, Kobe says, I'm committed to raising awareness of how bullying needs to stop. I just want everyone to get along and for kids to be together as one in schools. The funds raised through Kobe's Coffee Lid project are to be donated to Dolly's Dream. For those who aren't aware, Dolly's Dream raises awareness about the serious issues of bullying and its devastating effects, provides help and supports young people affected by bullying educates about bullying issues and advocates for bullying laws and regulations, delivers information on ways to prevent bullying and cyberbullying, 
works to change cultures and prevent bullying through a variety of educational approaches. Dolly's Dream recently launched their own Dolly's Dream telephone support line for teenagers and their parents to get free and confidential advice. Kobe's generosity doesn't stop there. He has also researched, written and delivered speeches for the Are You OK Day at FMG and Rio Tinto Mine sites, keeping in mind he is only 11, and has also fundraised locally for the Headland Cancer Support Group. Kobe was a finalist in the recent Pilbara for Purpose Community Service Awards Young Achiever category and also in the Seven News Young Achiever Awards in the Regional Services category. Kobe was also recently successful in being awarded an Ed Start grant of $1,500 in their social impact category for school aged children who are passionate about certain issues and are creatively looking at ways to address it. Kobe plans to use the grant to raise further awareness of bullying and the mental health effects by further expanding his coffee lid project, initially further around the Pilbara and northwest, and he has plans to tackle the east coast. Kobe has currently raised $220 of his $250 fundraising goal, and I encourage all members to consider contributing a few dollars. I am humbled by the efforts of Kobe and I congratulate him and his mum, Anne-Marie, for their many hours of volunteering to raise awareness of and to tackle bullying in our regional schools as well as fundraise for Dolly's Dream. The Honourable Darren West. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, brief, uh, sorry, thank you, President. Um, and very briefly, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that tomorrow is Friday the 13th of August is Red Nose Day and an issue, as you would know, uh, close to my family's heart. Uh, and I'll just quote from the Red Nose Day website, and I do encourage everyone to get behind this very important day each year. Every Friday on the second Friday, every year on the second Friday in August, we invite Australians everywhere to get silly for a serious cause to raise much needed funds to help stop little lives being cut short and supporting grieving families. Funds raised on Red Nose Day over the last 30 years have resulted in an incredible 85% reduction in sudden infant deaths. That's 10,857 babies saved and counting. Red Nose Day sparked a global movement and catalysed research into the reasons why babies die suddenly in their sleep. And because of that, we now have six evidence-based steps all parents can take to reduce the risks of their baby dying in their sleep. None of this would have been possible without the incredible public support for Red Nose Day. But the fight must continue and we still need your help because more than 3,000 babies still die suddenly and unexpectedly each year in Australia. We are losing them to stillbirth, SIDS, among other things. 3,000 little lives taken before they had the chance to grow up. That's nine little lives taken every single day and nine Australian families devastated every single day. <clears throat> Incredible gains have been made to reduce sudden infant deaths since the first Red Nose Day in 1988. But the latest research tells us that more than a third of new parents don't know how to safely sleep their baby and that many expectant parents don't know that there are steps that they can take to reduce their risk of stillbirth. With, with 300,000 babies born each year and 180,000 of those to first-time parents, it's vital we keep the pressure on because we know what happens when the messages stop getting through. While we know that not all deaths are preventable, there are many things parents can do to reduce the risk of it happening, and that's why Red Nose Day is still so important. So, members, tomorrow could you please take the time to donate a small amount to Red Nose Day? It all counts. It's, a, it's one area of medicine where we're still not winning the fight, and I just encourage everybody, because our family has been through it, and as this um, Red Nose Day um, promotional material says that there are nine families every day that go through what we've been through. Please support Red Nose Day tomorrow. The Honourable Shelley Payne. Uh, hi. Thank you. Um, I rise tonight to talk about an event that's happening tomorrow night, albeit not as important as uh, what uh, Honourable Darren West has just mentioned. but. 
worth a mention as well. Uh, anyway, um, tomorrow night is the Western Australian Fishing Industry Council Seafood Awards, which is um, an amazing event, which actually showcases the WA seafood industry and its value to the state economy and communities, uh, and recognises the positive contribution made by businesses, government, and researchers towards improving the WA seafood industry. WA, as we all know, supplies some of the finest seafood caught in the world to local, national, and international markets. Uh, tomorrow, there's 12 categories of awards, which cover all the way from fishermen all the way through to the processors, the wholesalers, exporters, to the retailers and the restaurants as well. So there's awards for the sea best seafood restaurant, the best seafood producers, safety, research and development, young achievers, as well as leadership and environmental awards, as well as the people that work on the boat. There's a new deckhand award that started last night. And I'm mentioning this award not because it's an award, but it's actually one of the best events of the year. Um, it's actually an opportunity to showcase and try all the amazing seafood that we have in WA. It has some of the best chefs there tomorrow night from um, Don Hansey, who's the WA Food Ambas Ambassador and the WA Fishing Industry Council Seafood Ambassador, uh, Neil Forbes from the Black Pearl Oyster Shucking, Chris Howard, um, Stuart Luz, Peter... Uh, Peter Manifis and Lee Nash and heaps of our uh, amazing uh, chefs that we have here in WA who will be cooking up all our amazing range of seafood. So that's tomorrow night. And I just had to check, and there's still tickets left if anybody is a seafood buff or they want to come and support their local fishing businesses. And it's down at the Esplanade Hotel in Fremantle. And it's a fantastic night. So if you want to get um, to know your local fishing businesses, I encourage you to come along. <laughs> uh, members, are there any further member statements? Uh, members, I have a message. Message number 27. Honourable President, the Legislative Assembly, having this day passed the Children and Community Services Amendment Act Bill 2021, presents the same to the Legislative Council for its concurrence. read a first time. Members, the question is the bill be read a first time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2021, first reading. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. On behalf of the government, I'm pleased to introduce the Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2021 into the House today. The Children and Community Services Act 2004 provides Western Australia's legislative framework for the protection and care of children, the employment of children, the provision of social services, the provision of financial and other assistance, and other matters concerning the well-being of children, other individuals, families and communities. Today's bill represents the Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2019, which lapsed on 7 December last year with the proroguing of the Legislative Council. As then, the bill implements 40 recommendations of the statutory review of the Children and Community Services Act 2004 and now implements in full the expansion of mandatory reporter categories, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, abuse recommended to achieve minimum national consistency. This continues the government's progress towards implementing all 310 recommendations of the Royal Commission's final report, which have application to Western Australia. The government would like to acknowledge the work of the Legislative Council Standing Committee on Legislation last year, which inquired into the policy of the 2019 bill and tabled its report on 10 September 2020. The committee heard from a range of stakeholders and we have accepted all but one of the committee's recommended amendments in principle, which have been incorporated into the bill before the House today, making, making en enhancements to this important legislation as it affects children and families in contact with the child protection system. In 2017, the then Department of Child Protection and Family Support reviewed the Children and Community Services Act in 2017 with the assistance of two committees. The review received 37 written submissions in response to a consultation paper. During the four-month consultation period, regional consultations were held with Aboriginal community members, service providers and Aboriginal community-controlled organisations. The recommendations of a department consultation on out-of-home care legislative reform conducted in 2015 were also considered in the review. Mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse commenced in Western Australia in January 2009 under Part 4 of the Children and Community Services Act, 
Recommendation 7.3 of the Royal Commission's final report requires a significant broadening of WA's mandatory reporter groups to achieve minimum national consistency and support early identification and reporting of child sexual abuse. In addition to doctors, nurses, midwives, police officers, teachers and boarding supervisors, the following people will be required to report child sexual abuse to the Department of Communities. Early childhood workers, ministers of religion, out-of-home care workers, registered psychologists, school counsellors and youth justice workers. Further, the reporting requirements are being extended to assessors appointed under section 125A of the Children and Community Services Act and to staff of the Department of Communities. There will be a staged approach to expanding the WA scheme to enable a managed rollout of targeted training. Different groups will commence as reported as reporters at different times, starting with Ministers of Religion. Consistent with the Royal Commission's recommendation 7.4, there will be no excuse for failing to make a mandatory report because a minister's belief was based on information disclosed to the minister during a religious confession, or because making the report would otherwise be contrary to the tenets of the minister's faith of religion. The Royal Commission noted that many religious institutions had institutional cultures that discouraged reporting of child sexual abuse, and the mandatory reporting obligations may help persons in religious ministry to overcome cultural, scriptural, hierarchical and other barriers to reporting. While the government believes there is wide community support for this measure, it is acknowledged that there is some opposition to these amendments as they apply to religious confession that was, that was presented to the Legisla Legislation Committee last year. For adult survivors who share these concerns, it is important to remember that the duty to report child sexual abuse is to protect children from sexual abuse. The laws are not designed to address historical abuse. The government remains resolute in its commitment to this measure, which makes both the government's and the community's expectations crystal clear. Children's right to safety and protection from harm is absolutely paramount. Planning for stability and continuity in a child's living arrangements and relationships is a priority when a child enters care, whether through reunification with parents or long-term arrangements elsewhere. The amendments to the principles in part two of the Act reflect the importance of this and implement other recommendations of the review, including that a person, court or tribunal is to observe the principles when performing a function under the Act that the relationships a child in care has with family and others of significance to the child should be promoted so far, so far as is consistent with the child's best interests, that planning for children's long-term stability should be considered in accordance with an order of preference as appropriate and in the child's best interest, starting with reunification with the child's parents, long-term care with other members of the child's family or care with another appropriate person. That the principle in section 10 concerning children's participation in decision-making process should be strengthened and that the principle regarding the participation of family, community or a representative organisation of Aboriginal people in decision-making processes about a child should be strengthened. In two new principles in section 9, children are acknowledged as valued members of society, as is the need for interpreters or other supports if language barriers or disability mean a person has difficulty understanding or participating in decision-making processes under the Act. At 30 June this year, 5,344 children under 18 were in the care of the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of the Department. 57% of these children were Aboriginal, despite Aboriginal children forming only 6.7% of Western Australia's child population. This is the troubling reality facing Aboriginal families and their communities and government despite all the goodwill and efforts undertaken to reduce these disproportionate figures. The Royal Commission noted that empirical data supports the idea that connection to culture is associated with better emotional, social and physical health for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Positive cultural connection can also increase the pr protective factors available to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children by helping them to develop their identities and fostering high self-esteem emotional strength and resilience. Research commissioned by the Royal Commission also highlighted that positive cultural connection indirectly increases protective factors by supporting the social, social conditions necessary for all adults in a kinship placement to be available, responsive and protective of children in the community. The bill introduces a number of interrelated amendments intended to build stronger connection to family, culture and country for Aboriginal children in care, 
including through working more closely with Aboriginal people and Aboriginal community-controlled organisations to better implement the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principle. The amendments to sections 9, 12, 13, 14, 61, 81, 89, new 89A and 143 are particularly relevant. Together they promote implementation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principle in section 12 of the Act and a greater understanding of its intent, which in broad terms is to maintain a connection with family and culture for Aboriginal children in care. This amendment aligns with recommendation 12.20 of the Royal Commission and a 2017 Community Services Minister's commitment to uphold all five domains of the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle to recognise the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to be raised in their own culture and the importance and value of their family, extended family, kinship networks, culture and community. SNAKE, the national peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, identifies five cornerstone elements to the principle as being prevention, partnership, placement, participation and connection. Section 12.2 of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Placement Principle contains a hierarchy of preferred placements for an Aboriginal child in care. The review noted Western Australia's size and diversity of Aboriginal culture and the importance of keeping Aboriginal children in proximity to their communities wherever possible. This is particularly relevant to better supporting re reunification with parents where appropriate, as well as closer connections to family, culture and country. Some members may recall that the placement hierarchy was amended accordingly in the previous bill. Responding to feedback received through the Legislation Committee process that the amendments did not fully align with the placement principle, the bill now reflects that if an Aboriginal child's placement with family, an Aboriginal person in the child's community or an Aboriginal person in close proximity to the community is not possible, then subject to the child's best interests, placement with an Aboriginal person who may reside anywhere in the state, will be considered on the same level in the hierarchy as placement with a non-Aboriginal person in close proximity to the child's community. Under section 81, before making a placement arrangement for an Aboriginal child in care, the department must consult to help identify placement options at the higher end of the hierarchy. The bill significantly strengthens these requirements. Consultation must now occur with each of the following members of the child's Aboriginal family, an Aboriginal representative organisation approved by the CEO for this purpose, and an Aboriginal officer of the department who has relevant knowledge of the child, the child's family or the child's community. It is envisaged the improved Aboriginal representative organisations may be existing Aboriginal community controlled organisations recognised by the local community with knowledge of the child, the child's family or the child's community. Enhancements to these amendments reflect the committee's recommendation to clarify their intended operation. The department's cultural support planning is also being strengthened. Cultural support plans are already prepared in practice for Aboriginal children in care and those and those from culturally and linguistically diverse or cold backgrounds. However, under this bill, cultural support plans will become a legislative requirement and subject to regulations. The Aboriginal representative organisations previously referred to will be offered the opportunity to participate in cultural support planning for Aboriginal children. Cultural support plans will also need to be provided to the court as part of the written proposal the department must provide under section 143 when it applies for a protection order other than a special guardianship order. Written proposals outline proposed arrangements for the child's wellbeing under the order being sought. Other amendments regarding the content of proposals include requiring an outline of proposed arrangements. For working towards the child's reunification under a protection order, time limited, or an expl explanation of why reunification would be contrary to the child's best interests, for promoting, for promoting where appropriate the child's relationships with family or other people significant to the child and for an Aboriginal or cold child, the arrangement proposed for placing the child in accordance with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principle or placement guidelines for cold children. Amendments to special guardianship orders or STOs continue the theme of maintaining children's identity, cultural connections and family relationships where possible. Special guardians wishing to change the name of a child under an STO will need to seek permission from the children's court. Permission will depend on there being exceptional circumstances and if the child has sufficient maturity and understanding the child's consent. 
In its report to the court about a person's suitability to become a special guardian, the department will have to outline the arrangements proposed for encouraging and supporting the child to develop and maintain contact with the child's family, subject to decisions regarding the child's contact with family. For Aboriginal children or those from a cold background, the child's cultural support plan will need to be provided as well as information on the Aboriginal child placement principle or the guidelines for the placement of a cold child. And the court may include conditions in the order about matters that could be included in a cultural support plan. And finally, the court won't be able to make an STO for an Aboriginal child in favour of a sole or joint non-Aboriginal carers without first considering a written report from an Aboriginal person or agency. The government has made progress on the Aboriginal family-led decision-making pilot announced by the Minister for Child Protection on 10 August 2020 to further strengthen Aboriginal self-determination. Reducing the number of Aboriginal children in care and advancing Aboriginal self-determination are key drivers for the pilot. It brings together the Aboriginal community and key stock stakeholders to co-design and trial a new approach in partnership with the department. Mirabuka as the metropolitan site and Midwest Gascoigne as the regional site, as well as three cohorts, have been identified. Families undertaking pre-birth planning with the department to prevent the need for infants coming into care, families involved with intensive family support teams with children at risk of coming into care, and families with children in care who are working to be safely returned home. Aboriginal family-led decision-making is able to operate within the current framework of the Act and consistent with the amendments in this bill. The 2017 review considered that amendments to legislate for Aboriginal family-led decision-making could be re-examined following implementation and evaluation of family-led decision-making, and the Legislation Committee shared this view. The bill now requires the next review of the Act to consider including Aboriginal family-led decision-making in legislation. In addition, the bill requires the next review to consider including a statutory definition of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Placement Principle, including all five elements. Other amendments in the bill clarify and strengthen the already comprehensive leaving care provisions in the Act. Amendments include that a leaving care plan is to become part of a child's care plan once the child turns 15 and children or young people are to be provided with social services the CEO considers appropriate having regard to their needs, regardless of whether they are specified in the child's last care plan. These changes will better support young people who have been in care, given evidence they are at risk of experiencing poorer life outcomes, including inadequate housing or homelessness, poor education outcomes, long-term unemployment, difficulty with basic life skills, mental health issues and drug and alcohol use. These amendments will support implementation of the Royal Commission's recommendation 12.22 that the assistance available to care leavers to safely and successfully transition to independent living and to access general post-care supports should include assistance for those who were sexually abused while in out-of-home care. The bill also strengthens provisions regarding the shared responsibility of government agencies for addressing the needs of children who are or were in care. Public authorities prescribed in regulations will need to prioritise requests for assistance to children in care and young people who qualify for leaving care assistance until they turn 20 by 25, provided doing so is consistent with and does not unduly prejudice their functions. In a new Part 10A of the Act, the bill increases the powers of authorised officers of the department and industrial inspectors to investigate in offences related to the employment of children in Part 7 of the Act. In addition, authorised officers of the department will be able to exercise those powers in relation to all the offences in the Act. The additional powers are consistent with those provided to licensing officers under the Child Care Services Act 2007 and do not limit the powers provided to industrial inspectors under the Industrial Relations Act 1979. A number of other amendments address oversights, clarify provisions or remedy concerns in relation to the operation of the Act. These include providing a defence to a charge of failing to protect a child from harm in circumstances involving the exposure of a child to family violence if the accused can prove she or he was a victim of that family violence. Amending the grounds for a child being found in need of protection to address situations in which parents are found to be able but unwilling to care for their child. Limiting the court's ability to adjourn proceedings for an interim order, secure care, 
or the continuation of a secure care arrangement unless there are exceptional reasons for doing so and then only for two working days, and addressing the legal status of a child following the death of a sole or joint special guardian. In closing, the government looks forward to the implementation of the amendments in this bill to achieve better outcomes for children, families and communities in contact with the child protection system, particularly for Aboriginal people. The government would also like to acknowledge the work carried out under the Children and Community Services Act by Department of Communities front, child, front line child protection workers, which is among the most difficult and challenging in the community. This extends to the tireless work of the foster carers and family carers who care for these vulnerable children and of service providers in the community services sector and Aboriginal community controlled organisations who remain united in their drive to improve the safety and well-being of children and families in Western Australia. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 1261, I confirm that this is not a uniform legislation bill as it does not ratify or give effect to any intergovernmental inter or multilateral agreements to which the government of the state is a party. No uniform schemes or uniform laws throughout the Commonwealth are introduced through this bill. I commend the bill to the House and I table the explanatory memorandum. Uh, that explanatory memorandum is table and, and uh, debate stands adjourned. Members, I have a message. Message number 28, Honourable President, the Legislative Assembly, having this day passed the Family Court Amendment Bill 2021, presents the same to the Legislative Council for its concurrence, signed Margaret Quirk, Acting Speaker. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. President, I move that the bill contained in Legislative Assembly message number 28 be now read a first time. Members, the question is the bill be read a first time. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Family Court Amendment Bill 2021, first reading. Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. I move that the bill be now read a second time. On the 5th of December 2018, the Family Law Amendment Family Violence oh, Cross-Examination of Parties Act 2018 was passed by both Houses of Federal Parliament amending the Family Law Act of 1975 to provide better protections for victims of family violence during the cross-examination process in family law proceedings. The new provisions apply to cross-examinations occurring in the Commonwealth jurisdiction effective from 10 September 2019. It is the usual custom for Western Australia to amend the Family Court Act of 1997 to mirror any amendments made to the Family Law Act of 1975. This ensures the same legislative position applies to parents of ex-nuptial children and people who were in a de facto relationship as to what applies to married people under the Commonwealth legislation. This bill will therefore amend the Family Court Act of 1997 to also provide protection in relation to the cross-examination of parties who are parents of ex-nuptial children or who were in a de facto relationship. In cases where there is an allegation of family violence between the parties to a family court proceeding, they will be prohibited from directly cross-examining examining each other in any of the following circumstances. One, where either party has been convicted of or is charged with an offence involving violence or a threat of violence to the other party. Two, where a violent family violence restraining order other than an interim order applies to both parties. Three, where an injunction made under the Family Court Act for the personal protection of uh, uh, for of either party is directed against the other party, or for if the above circumstances do not apply, the court, in its discretion, makes an order that the parties cannot cross-examine each other. The court may, may make such an order on its own initiative or upon application from either party or an independent children's lawyer. The cross, must be, cross examination must be conducted by a legal practitioner if they ban uh, on direct if the ban on direct cross-examination applies. In cases where none of these circumstances apply but an allegation of family violence has been made, the court must ensure that appropriate protections are taken for the alleged victim of the family violence. For example, the court may consider appropriate to direct that the cross-examination be conducted by way of video or audio link and or allow the alleged victim to have a support person with them. The provisions in this bill will apply to both parenting and property hearings. The Council of Australian Government's National Summit on Reducing Violence Against Women and Their Children in October 2016 recommended that a ban should be placed on the personal cross-examination of victims by the perpetrator in family violence and family law proceedings. 
Victims being personally cross-examined by the perpetrator or being placed in a situation where they must cross-examine the perpetrator can be a re-traumatising and highly distressing experience for victims. The measures in this bill aim to reduce this trauma and distress. There are also a number of other benefits that will stem from this legislation. The cross-examination process is an integral part of having evidence tested in a proceeding and allowing the court to make evidence-based findings. Putting an end to victims being cross-examined by perpetrators will improve their ability to give clear and cogent evidence. Furthermore, the cross-examination of perpetrators by legal practitioners will ensure their evidence is appropriately tested and therefore more reliable. This in turn will enable judicial officers to make more informed decisions and judgments. Being personally cross-examined by a perpetrator can be so daunting that it can lead to some victims prematurely settling their matter on terms that are less favourable to them or not in the best interests of the children. Their personal safety and care can be put at risk. For example, children may have to spend more time living with a perpetrator of family violence. This bill aims to reduce those situations from occurring. The provisions in this bill equally apply to perpetrators, so their rights to procedural fairness and a fair hearing will not be unduly impinged. Having a per professional legal practitioner to represent them during cross-examination process should also assist with the better presentation of their case. Women are usually the victims of family violence. A woman who is subject to family violence is three times more likely to receive a minority share of relationship assets than, a woman who, than women who are not subject to family violence. These new laws will help to lessen the discrimination against women by encouraging them to be fully involved in presenting their case to the family court. Their right to a fair hearing and access to justice will be enhanced. This bill, through the mandatory requirement to obtain legal representation in certain circumstances, has resource implications. If a party is unrepresented, they will be advised to obtain representation and will be referred to Legal Aid WA, who are administering the Commonwealth Family Violence and Cross-Examination of Parties scheme. In November 2018, the Commonwealth Government announced the establishment of the scheme to provide $7 million funding over three years to legal aid commissions across Australia. Legal Aid WA has uh, been receiving funding from the Commonwealth to administer the ban on personal cross-examinations for married persons, which commenced under the Family Law Act of 1975 in September 2019. Ongoing funding will also cater for the bans that will be applied under the Family Court Act of 1997 once the bill is passed. The Commonwealth Attorney-General's Department will be reviewing the cross-examination ban legislation and associated funding after the second anniversary of its commencement, which will be in September of this year. There will have been a considerable hiatus between the commencement of the bans under the Commonwealth legislation and those that will apply under this bill. The government did not attempt to address this issue earlier in the form of the Family Court the, sorry, the government did attempt to address this issue earlier in the form of the Family Court Amendment Bill 2019. However, that bill lapsed in the previous parliament due to other competing priorities. The bill also contains a number of amendments to section 243 of the Family Court Act so that it reads better and inserts a new subsection that allows information to be communicated to state or territory authorities responsible for the welfare of children and as prescribed in regulations for that purpose. Family violence has a significant impact on individuals families and the community. In Australia, one in six women and one in 16 men have been subjected since the age of 15 to physical and or sexual violence by a current or previous cohabitating uh, partner. The fallout and tragedy of family violence is often played out in the justice system. It is therefore important that the justice system, and in this case the Family Court of WA and legal AWA are appropriately equipped to effectively and compassionately deal with the victims of family violence. This bill will play a part in achieving that aim and ensuring that parent parties in Western Australia who commence proceedings under the Family Court Act are afforded the same protection as parties who commence proceedings under the Family Law Act in WA and the rest of Australia. Pursuant to Standing Order 126.1, I advise that this bill is not a uniform legislation bill. It does not ratify or give effect to a bilateral or multilateral intergovernmental agreement to which the government of the state is a party, nor does this bill, by reason of its subject matter, introduce a uniform scheme or uniform laws throughout the Commonwealth. I commend the bill to the House and table an explanatory memorandum. That explanatory memorandum is tabled and debate stands adjourned. Members, I have a message. Message number 29, Honourable President. The Legislative Assembly acquaints the Legislative Council 
that it has agreed to the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021 without amendment. Yeah. Members, the House is adjourned.